the best description of Russian's information that I know is this quote from Black Sabbath. Death and hatred to mankind, poisoning their brainwashed minds. Russia tries to find or even create breaking poets in societies. Putin do not need you to believe him. He wanna make you hate next guy. So divided we fall. And our only chance to stand is to act, not react. For people around the world today, the internet is a major source of information and news. This has only become more true in the era of social media and smartphones as young people and citizen journalists share content, articles and information directly with their audiences, often bypassing centralised or professional media outlets. But we cannot take access to the internet for granted. Recent years have seen either partial or complete shutdowns of public internet access in several countries, including Iran, Myanmar and India, which have inhibited access to information, stifled debate and curtailed people's abilities to protest or demonstrate. The question is, what can be done to ensure that ordinary people have free and open access to the internet, free from the fear of arbitrary or politically motivated shutdowns? The involvement of civil society is critical for tackling, tackling different propaganda narratives. Therefore, states have to look for different ways to engage civil society and, uh, and multiply their resources through people. We can all build resilience by keeping our generation informed and avoid a fake news toxicity. Because every activist and human rights fighter will tell you, knowing what is happening is the first line of defense against an authoritarian government. With a trilateral agreement signed between Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, the young people of these countries have become more aware and more sympathetic to each country's security issues the need of common values, freedoms, and how loud can voices against injustice and aggression sound together. Good day. Very happy to welcome everyone to this second day of the conference, Democracy in Action. And it's a great honor for me to inaugurate the second day and talk about the cities. This is my very favorite topic. It's so important for us. The Ukrainian cities compete with the global cities. It's a competition amongst the cities. But the Ukrainian cities face a lot of challenges. Cities close to the front line still are under threat and the question is how fast should they step up modernization how do they retain the youth and the talent facing the threat of aggression and uh, uh, other cities face their own challenges often internal challenges and corruption is amongst the top three and the others are migration um, talent drain economic uh, difficulties and it's very important for us to talk to the leaders of the Ukrainian cities to talk together to think together and find solutions on how to tackle the threats what are the available instruments so that the Ukrainian 
cities could thrive and compete globally. There's a global urbanization trend, and we know that a lot of American cities have become the powerful hubs of influence, and they grow stronger and can trigger change in the country. Kiev, as the Ukrainian capital, plays a major role on the global arena, so we'll talk about the challenges and solutions on how do we make our life safer, cleaner, and free of corruption. Today we have a chance to talk to the leader of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, and we have Yuri Bova joining us online, who is the mayor of Trostyanets, and we'll have Alexander Senkevich, who is the mayor of Mykolaiv city. Mr. Vikali, Kiev is a trendsetter, so you have the welcoming address to give us a good impetus of what we can do better. If I could stand up. Good day, dear friends. Let me start by saying that attending this high-level conference is a great honor for me, and the close scrutiny of the international community on the efforts to combat corruption and the involvement of so many participants is very heartwarming. And, uh, gives us hope that we can prevail in this fight. Later on, I will elaborate what I mean by prevailing in the fight. We hope that Ukraine and all of us will succeed. And some would say that corruption, which is the subject matter of our discussion today, only permits poor countries. I would put it differently. Corruption is the root cause. It's uh, the origin of poverty and an enemy of development. It starts with the mistrust of the people in a public official demanding a bribe. Then uh, this mistrust spreads to the government because of a thousand of public officials who take their graft. And then it spreads on to the country and people see injustice. And then people lose faith in the democracy itself. So we should ask ourselves the question. We are seeing this manifest in our country, but what do the Ukrainians do about it? The answer is straightforward. They leave Ukraine. And those who can't leave go into internal immigration. That's manifest by total depression, apathy, mistrust, with the government, mistrust uh, with politicians, mistrust with each other. The crisis of trust detriments Ukraine just as much as the economic crisis does. This year, Ukraine is celebrating 30 years of its independence and 30 years of combating corruption. Which is similar to fighting a windmill. The process for the process' sake, statistics for the sake of reporting. But the question is, is it a fight for justice? It's not fair when people delegated an MP to represent their rights and they vote for someone else. It's not fair when instead of prozoro procurement, the public procurement are offered uh, on an exclusive basis. It's not fair when costs from the budget are disclosed 
and not reported to the public. When does that happen? The corruption manifests itself where the system fails. So we can only prevent corruption by installing fair, equitable system. The municipal councils and mayors, unlike the central government, don't have the powers to reform the courts, to reform the law enforcement agencies. We, for our part in Kyiv, in the heart of Ukraine, in the Ukrainian capital, have started changes. We are beginning to irradiate changes. I hope my colleagues don't take offense, but at the level of Kyiv, we implemented systemic changes excluding the potential for corruption. If I may elucidate. One of the key safeguards against corruption is uh, the transparency. Kyiv was the first to implement the Prozoro procurement system. One hundred eight, one thousand eight hundred structural units of the Kiev administration make procurements through Prozoro procurement system exclusively. And in a few years, we have saved up for the budget of our community over nine million rimnia, four point five million just last year. Uh, preventing corruption. Udar, party that I've been leading since 2012, in 2012, was at the spearhead of the fight to make justice prevail in Parliament. If the people elect their MPs, they have to vote for themselves. Uh, voting, proxy voting should never happen. The first step I made when I joined the Kyiv government was about putting in a system where no proxy voting could happen. And so far, the Kyiv City Council remains the only agency, the only council, where proxy voting cannot happen because proxy voting is a variety of political corruption, and we hope other cities will follow us. Now the Verkhovna Rada is starting to implement a similar system and we hope in near future it will become operational. Accessibility. Overcoming petty corruption. Earlier, to place a child in a kindergarten, you would need to find a municipal councillor to help you out. Or you could uh, give a tip, pay a bribe. We have settled this problem by implementing the electronic registration queue to the kindergartens. It's already operating for a number of years. And uh, this year, we eliminated the problem altogether. There's no queue to the kindergartens. We reopened 33 kindergartens, and now 1,200 people no longer have to wait to place their child in a kindergarten. Openness, one of the key components. Now, Close to this place, there is a landscape alley. We inaugurated it uh, at a city day a week ago. All the costs from the budget for the renovations, all the budgetary expenses 
on expenses of the city administration, district administration, schools and kindergartens are made public. And every resident, every journalist can review the expenses. And that is a priority. And these are the ways we tackle corruption at a systemic level. But they need to be disseminated beyond Kyiv. Other cities have to embrace these practices too. Step by step, we need to be doing it decision after decision. But that's not all. But there's another interesting variety of corruption. So, when people cry out that they are combating corruption and instead they are pursuing their political agenda. You will know that recently the communal utility enterprises of Kyiv uh, experienced a uh, tsunami of searches. Uh, it's been covered in the mass media. To explain what's happening, we need to give you some background. Since 2015, the Department for Internal Audit and Control conducted inspections and audits of 385 entities. And all the findings of the audit were presented to the law enforcement agencies. The officials who were suspected of corruptions were dismissed. For years, these documents collected dust with the law enforcers and nothing happened. And all of a sudden, they were brought to the surface right now. And uh, the same cases were reopened based on the same evidence and findings we presented to the law enforcement agencies. And we are under charges based on the same evidence. We are very happy to cooperate with the law enforcement. We are very open with sharing all the information. But this is not true cooperation. It looks much more manipulative. This is not cooperation. I regard it as political pressure. Pursuing political agendas under the disguise of combating corruption is a form of corruption. It's political corruption. So what is political corruption? When in the high echelons of power, multi-hour meetings are conducted to come up with a plan on how to stage an attack on a mayor. And that is political corruption. When the head of the state fiscal service, which needs to be reformed and disbanded altogether, when he is offered the head or in the Bureau of Economic Security in exchange for massive searches of the local government institution, that is political corruption. When, despite the law, despite the will of the Kievans, despite the Constitution, appointments are attempted to replace the current Kyiv city administration had, that is corruption. That is um, the violation of the law. And I want to say it openly for everyone to understand. 
by implementing the anti-corruption laws, by setting up the anti-corruption agencies, we need to bear in mind that the key KPIs of combating corruption isn't the statistics, a position, or performances, or lofty launches that we've grown weary of. The key KPI of combating corruption is the level of trust people have with the government, level of trust with the country, the desire to live and work in their country. And that is a true KPI. And our key objective is to restore trust of the people. Indeed, all of us need to demonstrate that the Ukrainian country can thrive. The Poles have made it a success, so had the Czechs, and so shall we. And we do everything to that end. What does it mean for a country to be successful? A thriving country is one that is successful not just for the elite or for the top officials. A successful country is a country where people know that fairness will prevail, that law is above everything. We are now celebrating 30 years of independence of Ukraine. And 30 years is a good anniversary to look back and uh, to take stock of what's been done and uh, stop going round in circle. That never happens in a robust European country. The robust European countries enjoy rule of law and justice, where the government governments work for the people and not the other way around when people work for the governments. And one more important prerequisite. A successful country is one where corruption cannot take root. And that is precisely the country we are fighting for. Myself, as no one else, I know firsthand that we need to fight. We need to fight for our principles and values. We need to fight for our cities. We need to fight for our countries. I used to fight. I used to fight on the boxing ring in full sight, and I did so honestly. And I bring the same principles into politics. And above all, as every Ukrainian, I feel very strongly when I see injustice. I'm certain that we will step up the fight everywhere. We'll keep fighting for our country, for jobs for all, for fair pay, for rule of law, for justice. That is the country we are all fighting for. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions, and I'll be very happy to answer your questions and give you more examples of how the city of Kyiv is sparing no effort to make the processes clear and transparent and to leave no space for corruption.
про Прозоро, це, зокрема, той проект, який ми підтримали як фонд Western NAS Enterprise Fund, як один з перших донорів, так, і ми дуже раді, що Київ перший долучився. Можливість зареєструвати дитину в садочок випробою особисто, так, нам це вже стає актуально, я думаю, через півроку спробуємо. У мене дуже коротке запитання. I have a very short question to make sure we have time to engage the participants from the other cities and town. You mentioned that not everything can be tackled at the local level. What can a mayor do to fight even petty corruption? Where do you want the help for the government? To, where does the government need to step in? I think it's relevant for any Ukrainian city and town. Irina, I mentioned what the government has to do in my address. What needs to be done is to cooperate with the law enforcement, but not the way it's done in Kyiv. We relegated the documents and then nothing happened. Those who commit a crime have the impression that they could perpetuate it and they won't be punished. Ordinary people, though, have to ask the question, is there justice? at all in this world. Therefore, I'm convinced that robust cooperation with the law enforcement is a must, so that any individual who could even think about stealing from the budget or breaking the law needs to know for sure that this individual will be held accountable for their offenses. This is also one of the key prerequisites for combating corruption, for preventing it. Examples abound from the everyday life. However, it's about joint effort. I can give you so many examples from my work as a mayor where business people or ordinary people come to me and they say, someone is extorting a bribe from me to get some things addressed. And they go to me and they ask for help. Please, we want to record this. So the person involved in this misconduct needs to be held liable. And in 99%, the reply that they get was like, sorry, I need to get my problems addressed, not to become a, an avid anti-corruption fighter. So sometimes people give bribe and then they complain about corruption, but actually these people are complicit in corruption. They are helping corrupt officials. It takes more than one person. It's about changing the system, as I said. It's about changing the mindset. And we are trying to fight this outrageous practice for 30 years now. Vitaly, I hope that this platform and this pla conference will give voice to those who want to raise the issue so that all the central government and local government will do our best to make this country transparent and happy and free of corruption. Irina, I would like to extend my thanks to the international partners Thanks to the partners and the German company SAP, which is a leading IT company. So Kyiv City was the first city to introduce open budget. It's made available for any journalist or any individual. Transparency is a safeguard against corruption. We want to remove the official from decision-making mechanism. We want to create an algorithm for issuing documents based on the leading world practice and the best practices worldwide. We want to maximize the transparency of the processes. So I would like to thank the partners who assisted us in doing this. These mechanisms are being implemented. I mentioned the open budget, personal voting, Prozoro procurement system, and many more things are sadly still happening. 
But it's about transforming the system and transforming the mindset of the ordinary people. You know, we have this saying, you have to oil the wheels in order to, in order to get things done, i.e. to bribe people. But this is not something I want to see happening. And I talk to all of you. If you have encountered this, please go to us. We will legally try to address this. But you need to help us in fighting corruption as well. OK, it's time to talk to your colleagues and counterparts here. Uh, and I would like to ask the question about the cutting-edge technology. You mentioned that some tools are already in place in Ukraine. Does the open budget already operate in your cities? Uh, this is the question to uh, Alexander and Yuri, I believe. We know digitalized is in the vogue or do you think it's actually an actionable tool or do you think it's done for the sake of following some sort of fashion good morning dear audience good morning distinguished speakers and I'd like to start with the following Corruption requires mutual consent, so there are two parties willing to make some sort of an agreement, and that can result in corruption. What I mean is not the corruption regarding the decision-making, um, as far as the goods distribution is concerned, such as land or property, but I mean the sort of corruption where the local government does some sort of decision-making. In fact, if it takes a person to take this decision, one needs to think how can be the decision-maker limited, so to say. If a process does not require human participation, then utmost steps must be taken to exclude the individual and to leave it up to the technology. Once I was talking to school children and they asked me, what is the hardest thing of be about being a mayor? And that was back way back in 2016. I told them that the hardest thing was the day-to-day -day fight with the seductions, because you um, you face temptation every day, temptation of improving your own life or the life of your friends, and you have you don't have to be susceptible to that temptation. Also, back in 2016, and, and, and I'll, I'll take your question very soon, um, I uh, made this decision, and the previous local council wanted to privatize a lot of communal property, and I spoke up we organized public auctions and only then did we sell this property. We failed to do it in five years, but then Prozaro procurement system was launched. So in the nearest future, we will manage to sell what is still there, what was not needed, and we will sell that online soon. We are one of the four cities that are at the forefront of introducing geo-information systems. It's to do with land. Uh, you can look at all the decisions. You can look at the location of this land plot at the cadaster map. So we have the land cadaster, uh, and we want to um, create certain conditions for building certain objects. Therefore, we want to exclude corruption from the decision-making in this field. As regards the budget, in 2018, I think, it was the first time that we created a digital map of the budget, where all expenses are mapped on the city map, so that the citizens could see how the funds are allocated, whether it's proportionate or not. Sometimes the bit, some, when bids end, you can look at the outcome on, in Prozoro system. You can see what was sold, what was the price, etc. And by the way, I welcome the creation and establishment of Prozoro system because it gets in the way 
of facing someone's temptation. As regards the decision making on the budget, we strive to make it even more public today. There are public hearings and discussions on budgets held today. But as Mr. Klitschko mentioned, you're aware, uh, you're aware of the corruption that he brought up, but you know, it's all about how funds are distributed for the districts, for the local councillors. You know, it takes some sort of central government decisions on how funds are allocated per person, per square meter, or per community. Generally, as far all things digital are concerned, and once I was addressing an IT forum in the city of Lviv, that was, I think, way in 2016, too. I mentioned that in Ukraine there are many land cadastres and registries that should have been linked a long time ago, years ago, and that would prevent corruption in some way. And we are getting there today. We have an a smartphone app called DIA or Action where different registers are linked. In the future, I hope we will have some piece of software that would enable us to issue permits for construction works or to check the possibility to develop or not to develop certain area, etc. And finally, the Ministry of Digital Transformation needs to think about the following. Some things seem extremely similar. For example, the cities of Kiev, the city of Mykolaiv, and the city of Trostanet. There are some very similar processes happening there, such as the public services. And a piece of software should have been created years ago and handed out to all the cities and villages. And then you should just list the amount of services available. And updates would be for everyone. And Apple does not create a separate operating system for separate smartphones. Likewise, should be done as far as public services are concerned because they are uh, the very same for all of us. Alexander, thank you so much. Your remarks are very smart, but you have not answered my question. Do you think the citizens are actually using those services? And is there some sort of feedback? Do they actually check the budget? If they see some inconsistency, do they bring it up? Is it usable? Are they actually using it? Um, our dual portal with the budget map has seen 150,000 views. The population of the city of Mykolaiv is approximately 480,000. So I believe an ordinary citizen of Mykolaiv is not particularly interested in how budget is this funds are distributed. Ukrainians think as follows, well, all of them steal, they're regular people, you elect, you elect them, they do some stealing. It doesn't really matter if it's a mayor, a member of parliament, the president or the local councillor. As soon as they get, in, as soon as they come to power, they start stealing from us. Uh, and those are the tools mostly for the media, because the force is state consistently uncovers certain things, makes them public, and then the journalists start reporting on that. So the interested persons need to have the access. The other day we were talking about the civic budget. So an opportunity for an ordinary citizens to use the budget funds through the participatory democracy tool, such as participatory budget. Now, sometimes people look up if funds were allocated for the roads or the playgrounds, but I don't think that anybody is meticulously studying these tools, including the big data tools that we created. Alexander, thank you. And this makes a good segue to Trostinets. I have a different question for you. 
The International Republican Institute is doing an annual survey, and they show the discrepancy between the community priorities and what people believe the mayors are doing best. For example, for the last year, it was related to the level of health care services. Well, because there was an unexpected challenge in that field. And 37% believe it's a priority, but I believe that it was executed only at the level of 4%. It's true of the corruption, it's true of the environment. Uh, parks tend to be quite a low priority. I mean, it's high for urban life, but it's not a priority for this survey specifically. So, here's my question to the mayor of Trostanets. Why have you selected? Because uh, you have a healthcare success story uh, under your belt. But that was before coronavirus challenge broke out. So why would the local government address roads, because it's visible, as opposed to something less visible, such as fighting corruption? Why? Uh, is it just because it's more costly or more difficult or more effort taking? Yuri, we can't hear you. You need to unmute your microphone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ukraine. Good morning to our international partners attending this conference. Thank you for having me. To answer your question, I have to say the following. We started looking into the healthcare field a bit earlier than the rest of the country. Uh, there are 1,480s of amalgamated communities in Ukraine now, and they define the future. The best reform happening in Ukraine so far is the decentralization to transfer the administrative powers to the local communities and local self-government. Therefore, it is the local community now that has a say, that defines the future life, defines the priority, should it be the road renovation or park improvement or building a stadium or a hospital, etc. And frankly, um, I prepared some slides. I'm trying to put them on screen at the moment, if you don't mind. Please bear with me for a second. Yes, and I'm getting some help for the slides. You can see the slide, can you? Yes, we can. This slide demonstrates where we are right now. Our community is located basically on the Russian border, as mentioned at the beginning of the conference, and there's significant impact. So these are the challenges that conquest can happen any time, any minute. And it's a big challenge for the local government because the living standards should be so high so that people would really put their life on the line to fight for the independent. They have to know exactly what it is they are defending. And therefore, the next slide, please. The next slide, please. Therefore, it's critical that we put, do our budgeting properly. Here you can see the trends for the budget. This is how the community lived in the past. The population is almost 28,000. You see how it was in the past and how the situation transformed when we became an amalgamated community. The central government also delegated our funds for managing land resources. And I draw to your attention that our land budget is three times compared to the past, because now we can manage our own land. So small communities that have rural territories and have the powers now, not even the regional capitals, uh, 
But I mean that rural population will have resources to affect change. But what should be the direction of this change? I mentioned hospitals, and I'll come back to your questions, but I'll quickly cover other fields. We invest in the mindset and education. Because once the Polish people said, if you want to be a successful city or a successful community, you have to invest. Invest in the mindset of your children. Invest in your schools. And we are doing utmost to ensure that the level of education uh, of our communities is sublime. We invest uh, in equipment. The funding has been significantly stepped up. We have the best multimedia equipment um, in our schools. It's both for the junior school and for senior school, and we teach different subjects. And we have e-diaries that are missing in many cities of Ukraine, and they're, they best work in the city of Trostanets. It, this program originated in Lithuania and also reduces corruption risks in teachers. Inaudible. Inaudible. We're doing an utmost to improve the facilities of the schools in Audible. In Audible, interpretation impossible due to technical setbacks. The parents these days have to provide funds for the schools. They need to chip in for the equipment, chip in for the furniture, etc. It's endemic in Ukraine. But we rooted out this practice by having the ownership. Yuri, you only have four and a half minutes. Please address my question. Irina, I'll go very quickly. So we rooted out this corruption because we banned the schools to take the parents' money for whatever aim, for renovation, etc. We just budget funds to renovate the classrooms. You see the before and after the classrooms by using millions of grievances. Now, let me address the hospitals. This is a typical disproportionate district hospitals that is now our property. In the past, uh, uh, there were overblown personnel. Some people recruited way too many staff members than needed. Uh, and there was lack of funds to provide the energy su supply to fund the equipment to renovate the wards, etc. You see in the screen this was what happened in the past, and the local government banned to collect any funds from the patients. No charity, nothing. We had to do it ourselves, to leave these things in the past, in the Soviet Union, so that a new reality would enter our hospitals. So let me tell you, this all had it all, in, had consequences, so that people had no longer job in the insecurity. In the past, the citizen mistrusted the healthcare reform, and this is what we did. So we eradicated all sham offices to reduce the stuffing, rooted out corruption. We banned any sort of charitable contribution. We looked at the best practices internationally, how they renovated their hospitals. We provided computers and software to the hospitals. We provided e-appointments, rooted out any sort of lines or queues, because trying to jump the queues was an avenue for petty corruption. Um, Alexander, you're making a great case, but unfortunately we're running out of time. Now, just to sum up, um, I'll say a few points and then also give you the floor to make some sort of conclusion. I believe we have no other way but to fight corruption, including petty corruption. Yesterday, the 
other day I had a meeting with the city of Lublin and they work a lot with their counterparts uh, in Ukrainian cities. And I was impressed with the number of Ukrainian university students who stay in Poland. They create every condition, including tax uh, requirements, so that this young Ukrainian talent does not get back to Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian work migrants leave there and they work hard, but they will never come back, even when Ukraine offers a higher salary, they would not go back. Um, so it's about the feeling of, uh, of dignity. In 10 years' time, so that we could actually compete as a force to end it up in penury uh, of talent. The Petty corruption is the most difficult thing to tackle because this is the most widespread practice faced by Ukrainian citizens. And uh, the recent survey of the Republican Institute provides striking figures that at least five times per year uh, people need a permit to open up a business or address their issue regarding school or healthcare. So thank you for providing the success, success story. We are aware that certain change requires much resources and time and effort, but we are citizens and we are indignant. We want the change now. But you mentioned it's the 30th anniversary of independence and some people believe more could be done during this time. So thank you for progress. Thank you for your efforts. Um, I am partial to what you said that it's about joint effort, that we need to engage those who complain and identify corruption and detect it and fight it, that cooperation with the central government needs to be in place. I do hope that there is no turning back, that we shall indeed prevail because we're a dignified, democratic, free nation. If there's, there are some comments or remarks on, conclu on conclusion that you want the Ukrainians to hear, the floor is yours. Vitaly. I'll be very brief. We need to learn from success stories elsewhere, from Poland, Slovakia, work closely with our partners, learn from them, and not have to reinvent the wheel, put it in our safety deposit box and contextualize it then. So learn from successful cases. We've uh, learned a lot from Georgia. And uh, by talking to our partners, we need to uh, learn from them and put it to use. If, it's, if it works in a different country, we need to process it and apply at home. The flight is on, and I would like to report you about the deliverables. When every person studying in Poland would want to go back home to his home country, to his parents, seeing good job prospects and being well protected. And the key word that's been actual in Ukraine, that is justice, the rule of law. Couldn't agree with you more. Mr. Alexander, your final say in this panel. I'd like to say that what Ukraine needs most is uh, comprehensive digitalization. It's important so that we can pull our ranks and make the decision-making process as transparent as it can be. It's important that the government make sure that the people who go to the uh, audit agencies and governmental agencies earn decent pay so that it would eradicate the risks. When I visited the U.S. and I asked whether police officers would take a bribe, and they replied, given our social protection and uh, uh, the uh, profession which we see a vocation, we would never take a bribe. And uh, when a person can take a break that is more than his monthly pay, that's just not right. So the risk and benefit should be 
uh, such right. And this needs to be tackled at the governmental level. And importantly, we need to raise the professional level of the people working in the controlling agencies as uh, we would uh, receive uh, some initiatives that are unprofessional. And uh, I'd like the people who have a mandate to take on corruption be professional. And then brings us back to the idea that for a person to be professional, he needs to retain a decent pay to stay in the profession and not go into business. Mr. Yuri, you say? You know, the trust with the government has to be enjoyed by the residents and the investors. And I'd like to advise the Ukrainians to elect the government that is capable of implementing reforms that can learn from best practices. I would advise them steering away from political motives, but doing the daily specific work. The best example I like giving brings us back to our city. In Poland, they shut down an enterprise to open it in Trostianet, creating new job and decent pay, highest in the region. And that is the high standard of living. And it should be manifest everywhere in the public transfer pay, transportation, schools and hospitals, different digital solutions, eradicating solutions, and uh, creating well-being for, for the people. And that is the best that can happen. Thank you. And now let's get down to work. Thank you. Greetings from Kyiv. This is the second day of the International Forum Democracy in Action Zero Corruption Conference. This is a top-level event organized without involvement of any oligarchs, instead through a joint effort of Ukrainian civil society and our international partners that uh, are presented on our website, where you will also find our media partners. And the leadership in the event is with the Anti-Corruption Action Center and uh, Center, the Nova Europe Center, and other partners that have conducted special studies about hybrid threats to democracy. And uh, specifically, we mean disinformation, lawfare, and systemic strategic corruption. Corruption is at the forefront of our two-day discussion. We are looking at solutions to threats in Ukraine and beyond the, in the EU and the United States, as the corruption is a cross-border phenomenon. And uh, when the money is stolen from a developing country, they end up on the bank accounts of the leading European and Western countries. So only by joining efforts and through a shared political will we can combat corruption uh, on the national and international arenas. This is the day two. It's going to be a very intensive day. But before we start, let's uh, look back at the yesterdays day. What happened here at the forum? I rest assured that this is the case. Uh, we need to make friends, to stay united, and to work together for the benefit of our motherland, for the benefit of Ukraine. 
uh, we do need the cooperation of, of the countries in the region. And I uh, have discussed the issue, for instance, the issue of um, fighting smuggling in the Transnistrian region. I've discussed it with President Zelensky, and I do count on Ukraine's support here. Autocrats and oligarchs cannot concentrate power without concentrating wealth through illicit means. So our ability together to identify and expose that behavior needs to be at the heart of our support for democracy around the world. We need to ensure open civic engagement for an enhanced transparency and oversight of anti-corruption reforms implementation. Civil society organizations and the independent media are absolutely vital actors in this process. In our interest is to, uh, again, keep uh, stability, de develop and invest in prosperity and invest in the, in the reform elements in the country. As you can see, amongst the participants of the forum, we have the highest level speakers, the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Moldova, Maya Sandu, highly esteemed guests from the European countries, the officials from different European institutions, and we are seeking a common answer to the threats, hybrid threats to democracy. We have 15 different panels in the two days. We'll have about 10 blocks or so today. We've just completed a panel on the challenges to local communities and their uh, contribution to combating corruption. And we'll talk, continue to talk about lawfare and judiciary in transitional democracies. And fair justice is going to be a combined panel that's starting in 30 seconds. Afterwards, we'll look at the threat of disinformation, global threats of disinformation. We present a number of interesting studies about the impact of pandemic or how the narratives and propaganda myths have evolved in the pandemic. We'll see if there is any correlation. We will also talk about investigating transborder corruption and uh, uh, siphoning illicit goods. We are hoping that Sam Sitwick, the director of NABU, will join us for the discussion to discuss how political corruption can be prevented through effective control of asset declaration. We'll talk to that about Alexand to Alexander Novikov, who is the head of the NAPC, and we'll seek the answer to the question, how do we ensure resilience of democracy through elections? Olha Vazovska will moderate that panel on elections and uh, democracy. And we'll have the oligarch and de-oligarchization panel, and it's needed as a facet on the discussion and the day will conclude with the long-awaited conversation about the North Stream 2, which is an important factor affecting security of Ukraine and beyond. And right now, we transition to our panels dedicated to the lawfare and judiciary in transitional democracies. I'm giving the floor to the moderator of the panels, Halinya Cizek, judiciary reform expert of the Anti-Corruption Action Center. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Halia Cizek. I am Judicial Reform Expert at Anti-Corruption Expert Center. And for the next two hours, we will be discussing lawfare, strategic corruption, and judiciary in transitional democracies. First of all, I want to welcome our distinguished speakers. With me today are Mr. Gianni Bocchicchio, the President of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, 
Good morning, Johnny. And Mr. Artem Sitnik, the head of National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. Dobro ranko. So, lawfare. It has been defined as using law and legal systems against an enemy by damaging and delegitimizing them. But for the last few years, the uh, meaning of law, the concept of law has changed, and now we refer to it as to hybrid threat to democracy, when weaknesses of legal systems are used by oligarchs, kleptocrats, and crooks to undermine democracy. Corruption, especially strategic corruption, corrodes democratic institutions and therefore also serves as a tool against democracy. Countries that attempt democratic transformation can be easily damaged by lawfare. Our enemies are used as weaknesses of our institutions against us as a weapon. So, the question is what should democracy do to defend itself? How can we strengthen our democracies and our institutions? I now invite Mr. Gianni Bocchicchio to present his speech. Mr. Bocchicchio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alina. Distinguished participants present here or online, I wish to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of participating in this panel today. I will start by reminding that corruption is a scourge it takes hold of the highest uh, end of pol politics. It distorts the proper functioning uh, of the state or international system. Corruption is a destroying factor because it blocks and kills reforms. It uh, frustrates uh, uh, all effort. Corruption is an inhibiting factor because it paralyzes reform efforts in anticipation of uh, the uh, uh, default. Corruption is a delegitimizing factor because when money and power are seen to benefit the few uh, at the expenses of the many, this abuse of power corrodes public trust, uh, not, not just in uh, um, politicians, but in the institutions and values in which we believe. Corruption is an undermining factor because it threatens the function of the state institutions and pushes towards extreme solutions, sometimes at odds with the Constitution. Corruption is a hindering factor because it hinders the protection of fundamental social and economic rights. Uh, it, it interferes with, with equality, with the right to fair trial and with many other substantive rights. Corruption is an impunity factor because it shields criminals, notably grand corruptors, uh, from sanctions and sends a message to the society that the system of accountability and responsibility is not fair, is not equal to all. It does not function. Finally, corruption is a corrupting factor because it encourages others to join the group of the, those uh, who thrive on it. Grand corruption generates petty corruption. Preventing and tackling corruption and, at worst, state capture must therefore be a top priority for governments across Europe and the world. Corruption is generally divided into different categories. Petty corruption or bureaucratic corruption is the lowest form of corruption, typically involving low-level public servants or managers who abuse the, uh, the limited authority of their position uh, for personal gain. Petty corruption frequently involves uh, the abuse of entrusted power in exchange for favors or small uh, sum of money. Gen grand corruption refers to business leaders or criminals uh, paying off key government, uh, governmental functionaries or political parties in exchange for a, a favor in economic sector uh, where uh, uh, high margins are at stake. In both cases, it is a process of grand uh, uh, greed and uh, an attempt to be richer. Systemic corruption, also called endemic corruption, 
occurs when a public uh, or a private organization establishes uh, uh, rules or norms of governance that permit or encourage corruption. There is also a new phenomenon, which you quoted, which is the topic of this panel, strategic corruption which refers to corruption used as an instrument of national strategy. Here, according to the doctrine, corruption is backed and sometimes orchestrated by a state power for political rather than economic goals, uh, or to advance a comprehensive authoritarian agenda with inseparable political and economic uh, objectives. As you know, the Council of Europe was set up to protect human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Uh, fighting corruption has become an increasing part of our work. GRECO, the Group of States Against uh, Corruption, our anti-corruption body, has acquired a crucial importance, uh, delivering clear indications uh, of the path to follow in uh, to uh, achieve uh, public uh, authority as a public sector integrity. The Venice Commission has been very active on, on the fight against corruption because its mandate involves the reform of the state institutions, including the judiciary and the constitutional courts, and the appropriate setup and reform of new institutions, including anti-corruption bodies, which is a crucial uh, um, uh, aspect of this combat. The approach of the Venice Commission in the search for a systemic and institutional response to corruption in compliance with the principle of constitutionalism and the rule of law. This approach does not change when the challenge is a grand corruption and when it is strategic corruption. The fight against corruption is a multitask, multi-target procedure. You cannot fight corruption by fighting corruption alone. You also need to improve good governance. If you improve good governance, you improve the opportunity for economic development, which uh, reduces the temptation to corruption. The fight against corruption, to fight against corruption, you need to strengthen the democratic functioning of all the institutions at, uh, of the state. Single initiatives are dis destined to fail in the long term if they are not coupled uh, with an overall reform. If short-term urgent measures are taken to address uh, a corruption issue without considering the, their effect on the overall system, they are doomed to fail. What I mean to say is that any anti-corruption reform must be designed, assessed and implemented against the background of the prevailing constitutional setup. The Constitution must uh, guide the, leg the, the legislator and uh, the, uh, the check and balances of the con constitutional system must be uh, 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 preserved. The Constitution is the framework and reforms must abide by it. This is what constitution the constitutionalism commands, what uh, the rule of law commands. An effective fight against corruption and respect for judicial independence and rule of law have to go hand uh, in hand. There can be no effective fight against corruption without an independent judiciary and respect for the rule of law. Equally, there can be no independent judiciary and respect for the rule of law when corruption is per pervasive. Anti-corruption reforms must uh, not go against the Constitution for two reasons. First, they risk upsetting the balance among the institutions, weakening some of them or making others too strong. Governance become, becomes difficult, e even impossible. Corruption creeps in uh, instead of uh, uh, being shut out. Second, Violating the Constitution destroys the legitimacy of the anti-corruption measures itself, and it uh, uh, destroys public trust in the commitment of the government uh, to abide to the fundamental values uh, of, uh, uh, of the uh, state. There is uh, never any good reason to uh, violate the Constitution. 
unconstitutional actions against another state institution if uh, even if they are deemed to address a fundamental issue of corruption, may not be conducive to, an, uh, uh, to solving any crisis. To the contrary, they weaken the state, erode public trust, open up to more corruption. The judiciary as an institution must be respected. Its judgments must be executed. The, the independence of judges must be protected. Judges should be uh, accountable to the public through a system of disciplinary and uh, criminal responsibility. They should enjoy only functional immunity, but they must not be accountable to the executive or to the legislative. Uh, claiming to address an issue of corruption when uh, the judiciary, uh, by, subjecting, uh, by subjecting judges uh, to the executive or to the uh, le le legislative powers is a misleading answer to the problem. A corrupt judge may be uh, removed, but this, uh, the loss of independence will be beyond repair. The same is true with, uh, um, for, for constitutional courts. Constitutional courts play an essential role as gatekeeper of the Constitution and its values and as the arbiter of separation of powers. Constitutional courts and their, uh, and their decisions must be respected. A decision that dissatisfies parliament or the government or, it, uh, or is unpopular with uh, the public does not amount to abuse of power or to arbitrariness. Constitutional courts must enjoy public confidence uh, and also the confidence of uh, the other state institutions. Confidence does not imply lack of independence. On, on the contrary, a constitutional court may only enjoy the trust of the other state institutions and of the public if it is truly independent. Trust needs to be earned, but it can only be uh, earned within a system uh, which respects the constitution and rule of law. Constitutional courts sometimes uh, do issue uh, problematic decisions. We are all well acquainted with the October this, uh, judgment of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. But even when they appear to be arbitrary, this decision uh, of the Constitutional Court are final and binding uh, under the Constitution. And as such, they need to be respected. They cannot be disregarded. <clears throat> In its opinion on the October judgment, requested by President Zelensky, the Venice Commission suggested manners to do so while preserving the anti-corruption mechanism. The Commission analyzed the judgment and found that it presented several flaws. The Court had not respected its own procedure and some of the judges had been in a possible conflict of interest regarding the uh, out outcome of the case since the accuracy of their own declarations had been challenged by the anti-corruption bodies. The court decision was poorly reasoned and interfered without proper justification with the, the powers of the parliament to uh, define crimes and uh, establish uh, liability for them. The, prop, the, the poor quality of the judgment gave significant leeway for Parliament to follow uh, the judgment in principle, thus paying due respect to the institution while interpret, interpreting it in a manner which was consistent with the Ukrainian constitution and legal order, including the international obligation, obligations uh, to fight corruptions. We were pleased to see that our recommendations were useful and were followed, and today Ukraine's anti-corruption bodies uh, uh, have been uh, uh, restored. In order to prevent the possibility of further uh, tainted judgments uh, with such an adverse impact on the legal system of Ukraine, the Commission also suggested that uh, the rules governing the Constitutional Court require improvement. The Commission therefore recommended in a second urgent opinion also requested by President Zelensky, on the one hand to improve the system of declaration and uh, recusal of judges in cases of conflict of interest. On the other hand, the Commission considered that it is imperative to improve the manner of selection 
uh, of the Constitutional Court judges. It therefore recommended introducing a screening body for candidate judges uh, of the court with an international component which could uh, include international human rights experts and participations from the civil society. It also reiterated that constitutional judges should be elected by a qualified majority in the RADA. <coughs> Institution must be preserved, and in order to do so, tainted judges must uh, certainly be uh, punished and, if necessary, dismissed. International law requires that a system of as asset declarations uh, should be in place and, uh, and that it should be supported by appropriate deterrent uh, uh, penalties. These penalties need to be uh, proportionate but severe. The Venice Commission, in its recent opinion, has welcomed the reintrodu reintroduction of imprisonment for up to, to two years for the most serious cases of inaccurate asset declarations. Uh, draft law uh, number 4651 uh, was adopted a uh, few days ago. The amended version, however, has replaced deprivation of liberty with restriction of liberty. Further, property of the relatives of public officials uh, has been removed from the duty of declaration and uh, from the, responsib the responsibility of uh, the public officials. These are negative amendments which the Venice Commission does not support. For this reason, I appreciate the President's intention to veto this law. As concern, concerns dis disciplinary procedures, dismissal is the most severe sanction, but all these measures may only be taken at the end of the appropriate procedures carried out, carried out by the competent institutions, uh, n notably uh, I judicial councils. But can these institutions be trusted to carry out this crucial task impartially and efficiently? This is a dilemma. Bestowing guarantees of inamovibility of corrupt judges creates a potential of impunity on which corruption thrives even more. In this context, the Venice Commission reminded that the re-establishment re of the High Qualification Commission for the Judiciary is urgent. The opinion welcomed the proposal to establish a, a mixed national international body, the Competition Committee, uh, for the selection of the new members of the High Qualification Commission. The method of establishing the competition uh, committee should remain close to the successful model of the anti-corruption court. It also uh, stated that the High Qualification Commission should not be merged or submitted to the High Council of, uh, of the Judiciary as long as the latter uh, uh, is not reformed uh, and vetted. Unfortunately, Law 3711 uh, as adopted in the second reading on the 28th uh, April, does not meet the Venice Commission recommendations and we do not support it. The High Council for the Judiciary needs to be vetted before it, it is entrusted with the, the setting up of the High Qualification Commission for the Judiciary. This is imperative or the judicial reform will be, uh, will be doomed. On this uh, last point, the Venice Commission uh, issued another urgent opinion a few weeks ago on draft law number 5068, which aims to establish an ethics uh, council for a period of six years uh, to, to screen candidates before they can uh, be elected or appointed as members uh, of the High Council of Justice and uh, vetting the current members of the council. The opinion welcomed the trust uh, the, this uh, draft law uh, uh, in, uh, intends to re uh, as it intends to reform the I Council. The, this opinion also welcomes the participation of international experts in the Ethics Council. It is indeed the strong opinion of the international community, including the Venice Commission, that mechanisms with an international membership component 
uh, may, uh, 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 are capable of ensuring an objective approach to the uh, choice of the candidates uh, on the, uh, in, or to the imposition of uh, sanctions. Bringing in uh, an international component raises the question on the weight of the votes. In the, its la latest opinion on the High Council of the Judiciary, the Commission recommended as a rule for votes that normally decisions of the Ethics Council should be adopted by uh, uh, at least four of its six members, including two international experts. In case of a tie, the vote would be uh, repeated, but then the group, including the, at least two international experts, should prevail. This, uh, the prevailing, pre prevailing weight uh, of the international component should be recognized also for the com competition com committee for the High Qualification Commission for ju the Judiciary. This option is difficult for the state and for the judges to accept, but we strongly believe it is necessary. This is why I would encourage the judges to, to be patient and engage in this process of building a public trust. It is a necessary evil to combat the scourge of corruption without gener generating instability and more corruption. Is this compatible with the international standards? It is, if it is done in a manner that conforms uh, to the uh, Constitution. For example, vetting under draft law 5068 would be a mere recommendation to the appointing bodies, including the parliament, the judiciary, the bar, uh, uh, universities, etc., to dismiss the relevant member. The decision would stay with the appointing bodies, even though there is uh, uh, an expectation they, they will uh, follow uh, that they, uh, they will follow the recommendation. And if they don't they would be uh, accountable to the public. For how long should the international component stay? It should clearly be limited in time. I would say that when there, is a clear, uh, there are clear signs that national and international members uh, uh, act in the same, uh, in the same super partis manner, ending the system may be envisaged. Ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude by saying that I do not underestimate the complexity of fighting corruption. By no means is uh, any of uh, the above uh, easy to implement in practice. As I said, this is a multi-task, multi-target ta target action. Uh, I, I, I would add that it is a multi-actor action. Corruption within the judiciary must be fought by uh, the decision makers, by the law enforcement agency, uh, but also by the judges and prosecutors themselves, by the, the uh, parties to the proceedings, by the lawyers, by the, uh, the, the civil servants which operate in the courts, uh, by the media, by the civil society. I don't overlook the urgency of fight corruption the impatience to achieve results, but the expect expectations must remain realistic. We should promote a cultural, cultural change in politicians, in the judiciary, in the law enforcement agency, in the society. If uh, the wiles may be blown, if the wiles uh, is blown, impunity for grand uh, corruption might commence to decline. It would be a good beginning. Thank you very much. Mr. Bocchicchio, thank you for this remarkable speech. I cannot say how close your words are to my heart. Really, uh, independent judiciary is a pillar to, uh, of a democracy. Those, uh, we need to combat corruption to defend our democracy and to make uh, our judiciary truly independent. The essential part of this fight <coughs> against judicial corruption is the reform of judicial council and we are incredibly grateful to the Venice Commission for its uh, opinions uh, on the reform of the High Council of Justice and High Qualification Commission of Judges. Uh, 
we are convinced that um, international experts should have a decisive, temporary, but decisive role in the process of reform of the High Council of Justice and High Qualification Commission of Judges. Otherwise, the reform will be doomed. So now I promise you, as a civil society of Ukraine, we will do our best to make sure that Venice Commission recommendation on judicial reform are implemented. And now I'll switch to um, Ukrainian. So, Artem, Mr. Bukikio started his remarks by saying that preventing and combating corruption and especially countering the attempts to capture the state must become a top priority for European governments and governments worldwide. You lead one of the key anti-corruption institutions in Ukraine. Has fighting corruption become indeed our top priority? What tools do we have to tackle strategic corruption? Are we willing to share experience with the other countries? You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. First and foremost, thank you for having me, for being a part of this crucial discussion. Lawfare and using legal acts and sometimes intentional ignoring laws has been characteristic of Ukraine as a transitional democracy. But this issue became even more urgent over the last two years. Let me explain. You Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine was created back in 2015. We started investigating ju judges and top officials having major power. When Anti-Corruption Court was established, these investigations finally translated into convictions. Yesterday, the director of state-owned enterprise was convicted and another conviction vis-a-vis -vis the judge was issued yesterday. The system was in place. And we have seen the, what is mentioned in the topic of our panel, using the laws or sometimes intentional ignoring of the legal basis. Mr. Bukikio mentioned the Constitutional Court. I stand with him. The Constitutional Court must be the decisive body guarding the balance of powers, deterring certain authorities from usurping power. Of the last two years, things that happened in constitutional court ha can hardly be named uh, aimed at ensuring balance. These decisions could hardly be named legitimate. When anti-corruption system started working, the constitutional court immediately basically blocked all that effort, nullified it. One of those decisions was repealing the liability for illegal enrichment. The anti-corruption bodies investigated top officials of state institutions. This investigation ended up in court, and after the conviction was issued, then the liability was cancelled. Um, after the reboot of NACP, National Agency for Corruption Prevention, we have seen that this important, um, important authority uh, was limited in powers. During current people in power, uh, the orders appointing the head of this agency was overturned. I, and in the district Kiev administrative court, there was a notice of suspicion that was issued to one of the justices, and the constitutional court repealed the notice. There were over 20 attempts in the parliament to limit or restrict Nabu's powers or to get its management to be dismissed or, or to resign. And the international partners and the civil society had the time to respond to those challenges. In the constitutional court, the procedure is concealed. It happens overnight in secret. And in the morning, we read the decision taken not only within the country, but international experts are assisting us for a number of years to do the judicial reform. We were investigating one of the oligarchs, and NABU relegated some of the uh, materials to the court. But then the Constitutional Court wanted to deprive NABU of this power. 
Um, it's heartwarming that our international partners are now a part of that effort. This must be stopped because the reformed of the reforms, if ever successful, are likely to be immediately stifled by the Constitutional Court. And there is one more case in the Constitutional Court regarding anti-corruption court. So uh, the institutional anti-corruption system is under threat of liquidation. I am a leader of one of the anti-corruption bodies, and one of my major concerns is the use of other courts to block certain investigations. The anti-corruption court was established with the participation of international experts. And those who were involved in anti-corruption bureau cases faced a problem. They couldn't ensure a positive outcome from themselves, beginning with the detective and ending with the judges of anti-corruption court who started convicting people, confining people, and the, those were the long-awaited uh, outcomes of the reform. And this underscores the importance of judicial reform, a comprehensive reform, as opposed to creating a separate, non-corrupt court. There are cases regarding top officials, and they neared anti-corruption court several even sometimes successful attempts took place through Petra's court they tried to take those cases away from the anti-corruption court to make sure there's no conviction coming this is this has no legal basis this is the offense uh, of the law by the court of the first instance uh, this is an example of leveraging administrative power. These efforts have somewhat abated now, but people were using a mechanism that is totally outside the legal basis. These cases were indeed taken from NABO, relegated to other investigative bodies, and then those investigators were effectively blocked, and we don't know what the outcome of this investigation is. It's paramount that these days the Constitutional Court problem is addressed because the balance of power in the state will be upset unless it's done. Judicial reform started years ago and you participated in it and we have cooperated to that end. But the reform is sadly not completed. So things now are probably even worse than they were back when we started. Therefore, Taking into account the latest seven years, successful selection procedures, successful reforms are linked to the participation of international experts. I mean, where international experts participated in the selected committee. In, I mean, SAPO, where international experts also participated. And I mean, HACC, where thanks to international experts, we could recruit people into this crucial and critical court, judges who were really willing to do this work. As justice is administered, HACC judges are under constant pressure from the non-reformed High Council of Justice. Therefore, justice reform needs to be advanced further. Judiciary self-government needs to be involved, and without it, the success is uncertain. It's hanging by the thread. The whole architecture is threatened. This success is extremely fragile, and it can be challenged because we see that the judges face an enormous amount of pressure as they administer justice, which brings me back to disciplinary proceedings. Things. Judges could be punished, but only lawfully, and this should be the disciplinary proceeding. So, coming back to your point, I also want to mention the Naftogaz state-owned enterprise reform. This was a pain point, always, but when international experts entered the supervisory board of this state-owned enterprise, this company now makes profit. Um, and this SOE has suffered a blow, but I do hope it's reversible. 
Reforming the authorities helped, happened thanks to the national component. But what can we call a success? Only those where international experts, international technical experts were involved, people who are competent, who have the background, who can impartially assess the integrity of the candidates running for the selection procedure. I do hope in the nearest future the Parliament will pass the necessary legislation addressing the gaps created by the decisions of the constitutional courts and other judges of Ukraine. After this change takes effect, I hope the selection procedures would not last for ages. Just to give you an example from Special Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, we have seen that it takes almost a year to hold that competitive selection and this pro process is basically now suspended and there's no end in sight. Artem, sorry to jump in. So basically we can say that involving international experts in reform and in judicial self-government reform is our decision. We know this is a demonstrated success story. It has a good track record and we are convinced that it's going to work for the other region. Again, uh, we are deeply honored to welcome you here today. Thank you for your remarkable speeches. Let's, uh, let's keep uh, moving in uh, this direction on defending our democracies and searching for new solutions to modern threats. Thank you very much. If, and you, if you allow me, I would like to say uh, three words. Yes, please. Uh, um, after what Artem said, uh, I agree with him. Uh, the uh, judicial reform must be comprehensive. The Venice Commission, the Council of Europe, are working on the judicial reform in Ukraine for decades already without uh, a real success. We are going piece by piece, but it must be an holistic reform of uh, the, the, the judiciary. Second thing, the anti-corruption body must be safeguarded at any cost, uh, because they've done a, a good job and they must continue to do their job. Uh, vetting the High Council of the Judiciary and selecting new uh, good members is a priority. Uh, also, the High Qualification Commission is the priority, but the, the two are interlinked, and I, I think it's much more important that the, the Council uh, of the Judiciary is vetted and reformed in order to uh, then to uh, select good members for the High Qualification Commission, although this is also very urgent because uh, you lack 2,000 uh, uh, judges in Ukraine and next year you will have 1,700 more who will be retired by then. It's to say that the judiciary will operate with half of uh, its personnel. So all these issues are urgent, and what I hope that the uh, government, uh, the parliament will do is to accelerate these reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I cannot agree with you more. So let's uh, do our best to make judicial reform in Ukraine a success story this time. Thank you very much. continuing our judicial reform panel and today we are uh, here to uh, continue our joint search for uh, new solutions to modern threats to uh, democracy which uh, are lawfare and strategic corruption and uh, now I uh, want to present uh, our remarkable speakers who uh, are joining me today so uh, Olesa Stamate, advisor to the President of Republic of Moldova on Judiciary and former Minister of Justice of Moldova. Good morning, Olesa. And uh, 
We also have um, online three uh, prominent and outstanding experts. These are Ms. Hanna Sochotska, Honorary President of the Venice Commission of Council of Europe. Good morning, Ms. Sochotska. Um, we also have Mr. Tilman Hoppe, uh, an expert from Germany, uh, anti-corruption and uh, judiciary expert. And um, we are uh, also uh, honored to welcome uh, Ms. Laura Stefan, expert from Romania and also former Minister of Justice from Romania. So, good morning. Good morning, uh, good morning, dear experts. So, for the next hour, we will be discussing uh, judicial reform in transitional democracies. As um, we, uh, with our colleagues in Antak, we made an analytical research, and it turned out that um, Ukraine is not unique. We, uh, with countries in the region, uh, particularly Armenia, Georgia, and Moldova, we do share the same problems. Uh, dependent and corrupt judiciaries, which are actually governed by uh, influential group of judges referred to as clans, poor judicial ethics, mutual cover-ups, and widespread corruption. This, um, all are um, factors that corrode judicial system, therefore it cannot defend our democracy. So, um, I want to ask my first question, uh, Ms. Stamate. So, I know that uh, Moldova is now uh, on the edge of fighting judicial corruption. So, what are your solutions to, to this problem? First of all, if I may, let me thank you, the organizers of this conference, for hosting it. Uh, not only for such a high-level participation and excellent organization, but primarily for this very interesting topic that he opened. I think that many experts like me and officials from the justice uh, systems in the countries in the region have asked themselves this question in the last years. Why do we have such a corrupt judiciary? As long as we did our homework and adopted legislation according to the best European and international standards. And I think this is the key question that at least I have been asking myself for the past five or ten years. And by me, the answer to this question is on the table. We have tried to build an architecture which works well in established democracies. Unfortunately, this architecture, in our case, was not accompanied by sufficient accountability mechanisms. They are on paper, but in practice, when these mechanisms are to be applied by peers, we end up in the situation when one hand washes the other. And therefore, we should look for more or less standard solutions tailored to the very specific context of each of these countries and to identify those best practices and also avoid the lessons learned, learned and mistakes that other countries have passed through. In our case, I think the only viable and sustainable solution to resetting the justice system is the extraordinary evaluation of judges and prosecutors. We, of course, might think of solutions that could seem simpler for example, resetting the composition or revising how the self-administration bodies in the judiciary are composed, selecting new members to the Supreme Council of Magistracy or the Supreme Council of Prosecutors. But unfortunately, I think that for them, even with very fresh new people, it will be very difficult to do the job by themselves, internally because corruption is so deeply rooted 
in Moldovan judiciary. It just spread throughout it. We have witnessed in the past several years in Moldova how about $40 billion were washed, laundered through decisions of judges from Russia towards the West. We have seen a banking fraud worth $1 billion. Nobody has been sanctioned so far. We pay tens of millions of euros for decisions of judges whereby we lose cases before the European Court of Human Rights. This situation has to end. There is no time to be wasted. And therefore, I think a combination of solutions, at least for Moldova, such as the extraordinary evaluation of judges and prosecutors, combined with the reshaping of the um, self-administration bodies, will provide for a viable and sustainable solution which will first clean and then maintain re the results of, of this exercise. Thank you very much. I cannot, uh, I cannot agree with you more on this uh, uh, vetting of judges and cleaning the judiciary. Uh, in fact, uh, is one of the goals uh, of judicial reform in Ukraine too. Uh, the most important here is to ensure that uh, the people who will be in charge of this vetting process are independent and unbiased because uh, we cannot entrust corrupt judiciary to uh, vet themselves. Otherwise, uh, the reform uh, will be doomed. So um, we have with us today Ms. Um, Hanna Sochotska and um, I now want um, uh, to give uh, the floor to her. So, Ms. Sochotska, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, unfortunately, in transitional democracies, uh, judiciaries are actually governed by uh, judicial clans, which are using the principle of independence of judiciary as a shield against any reasonable attempts aimed at ensuring integrity and accountability. So the question is, is it true? Is it true that the principle of independence of judiciary defends corrupt judges from vetting and cleaning? What is, uh, um, what is your response to this uh, challenge? Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I am very happy to be here, and I am happy that we found uh, finally the connection because I was a little in a panic that we will not be able to connect. And uh, I am just talking after a speech given by uh, by President uh, Gianni Bocchicchio, and um, uh, I will follow the, the of course the same line. Because, uh, you know, I um, remember very well the reform we started uh, in Poland uh, just uh, in 1989. I would like to remember that for us, it was exactly one of the most urgent issues to reform the judiciary. And the first reform to the judiciary was done uh, in the 1989, in April, and then in December, when we introduced to our system the High Council of Judiciary. Because, you know, uh, having such a, uh, such a heavy experience uh, with uh, political judges uh, in the communist era, we were of the opinion that, the first of all, we exactly have to create a guarantees uh, for, having, for appointing judges, for having a much more clear system of appointment of judges, of judiciary. So for that reason, that's a very young question, I would like to say that the problem of appointment of judges is a crucial one. We decided to have a high council of judiciary. very strong discussion because we had no experience among the transition democracies who decided to introduce high council of judiciary we had a very good uh, a very good model uh, abroad german model where the minister of justice is much more involved in the appointment of a judiciary of judges and it was also our tradition but then in the communist era when the executive power had the power to appoint judges we uh, how to say uh, um, grew up in this negative experience. 
so for that reason we looked for for much more neutral i can say solution and but since the beginning as you said um, we were of the opinion that the the, the body uh, should be a pluralistic body, not only composed of, of judges. But then we were of the opinion that the judiciary, judge, judges, uh, should be in a majority in this body. Uh, because it was the first step to, to guarantee the, the independence. But um, then the, the High Council of Judiciary stepped by step, um, try to, how to say, uh, became a kind of uh, new Ministry of Justice, became much more so bureaucratic and also uh, trying to, to organize everything for, for itself. And it was uh, the first sign that uh, we had have to create such a body as a much more, even much more pluralistic, but not a political one. And, and uh, for that reason, uh, I think that it would be exactly maybe worthwhile for the, for the future uh, to invite much more independent uh, uh, professional person from, uh, from uh, barrister, from bar association, uh, from, from advocate maybe, to be part of high judicial council, but not uh, from politics. And now in Poland, we have a new um, law on High Judicial Council where the um, majority of judges are elected by parliament. It is not the just direction, yes, because uh, judges elected by, by parliament, uh, I can say, can represent two negative aspects, politicization and then corporatism. So it is exactly completely bad solution. But uh, trying to convince what should be done, I think that High Judicial Council is exactly important body to be uh, to be um, a body for uh, keeping independent and for uh, playing an important role in the appointment of judges. But taking this into account, the High Judicial Council should be also, how to say, autonomous body and converse of integrity person. So it is a first step to have such a to have such a body, yes? because otherwise when when the body is uh, representing only such a um, corporative thinking, it is a clear way or maybe the, the, the very easy way to corruption. And uh, and then saying this, I think that um, exactly what what should be what should be done also the uh, discuss here by 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 in, in your opinion in our opinion and in your law the asset declaration because i said that we have the reform we started just our reform in 1989 and then uh, we introduced asset declaration also for judges. I remember that when I was a minister of justice, as a minister of justice, I received the asset declaration uh, from, uh, from judges. And they were obliged exactly to declare uh, not her, how to say, um, um, money, property, uh, all the things. So it was the first step uh, to make the the whole judiciary to clean the judiciary, yes, and the, the fighting uh, against corruption. And for that reason, I can say that in Poland, we don't have so many cases and the, the corruption in judiciary is not such a high problem. The problem is much more now the politicization of judges, how to say, the, the, the uh, way open to politicization because judges are not yet politicized because we exactly introduced this system since the beginning. But the problem of politicization still exists. But I think that is much less the problem of corruption. So I will, I will stop here because I think that, uh, that we'll discuss the, the problem later on. But uh, I would like to support the idea of, of um, making as a declaration because it is one of the important uh, steps to fight against uh, uh, against uh, corruption thank you very much sir
Our important conclusion now is that uh, judiciary should be governed uh, independently and uh, it actually should be independent from uh, any undue influences from legislative or executive, <coughs> but it also should be independent from politicians, oligarchs, as well as different groups of interest within judiciary, which is the case of uh, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. Uh, now it looks like that uh, judges in our countries and across Europe uh, built a fortress uh, from different standards of the uh, Council of Europe, uh, other European organizations, and uh, they, uh, these recommendations uh, and standards serve as a wall. Uh, they are shielding against society and uh, society's uh, wills to uh, ensure accountability of uh, judiciary. So we have. Um, Dr. Tilman Hoppe, expert from Germany, with us. Uh, Mr. Hoppe, what uh, are your thoughts on the on the issue? What should we do to ensure judiciary is both uh, independent and accountable? Thank you very much, Halia, and let me thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with um, all the various team co-experts here. Um, yeah, I can only follow what uh, the previous speakers have been saying or building, building on that, um, that we face a dilemma here. On, on the one hand, rule of law and the European standards, they tell us we need independence and we should not politicize uh, the judiciary, we need personal independence, we need institutional independence. <clears throat> and then on the other hand, um, we have judges, we have people that take this as a personal privilege. Mm -hmm. And as you say, they wall themselves into a fortress um, and they abuse these European standards. They say, oh, you want to introduce asset declarations, like, like Hannah Suhoka was saying. And they say, no, it's violating uh, judicial independence. And then they cut away all the meaningful parts of the reform until a facade, a puppet of an asset declaration system remains. And of course, they do this um, as part of a larger corporate network or corporatism network, um, because the politicians also like it when the judges cut away these parts from the asset declaration reforms. So it's not only the judiciary, it's actually a larger power caste or elite network they are serving. And, and this is a dilemma. Uh, and, and, and what can the Venice Commission do, for example, the Venice Commission? I mean, they cannot write in the opinion, um, you have the wrong people in the judiciary, or, or a large part of them. It's just the wrong people. Please get rid of them. I mean, the Venice Commission cannot write that. They, they, can, only, they can only judge or assess the framework, and they can assess the tools that are being proposed. And in a way, I think what I've served over the past 10 or 11 years, especially in the Eastern Partnership region, is also a learning process, I think, for everybody involved. Um, and that is, you cannot fight corruption in a country like Ukraine or other countries you mentioned um, the same way you do it in Denmark or Sweden um, or France. It's the same standards, but there's different social needs that justify different measures. So it's the same thinking, but actually you have to apply tools like that were spoken about already, uh, vetting of judges or prosecutors. It would be unthinkable in the UK to, to, to say next year we'll be vetting all judges because we don't trust them anymore. Um, it would be outrageous. And in Albania, it was supported by the entire international community and it was treated as something obvious and necessary, and the European Court of Human Rights even approved it. And in my view, it's the only light of hope I have right now in terms of like how to move forward, because we, we break the dilemma. We get outside stakeholders who have no political interest, who are not part of the domestic networks, um, 
and, and who break this corporatism, as, as previous speakers um, were saying. And we see in practice that the public and the larger community, they trust these processes and they are being perceived as um, displaying integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hopper. So we've been talking a lot on um, about uh, our judicial governance bodies, uh, judicial councils, um, and we clearly see that unfortunately they are not um, they are not independent because they are governed by uh, judicial clans and. Uh, uh, Talking about the experience of uh, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine uh, countries uh, that attempt democratic transformation, it became obvious that um, solutions that work for well-established democracies, solutions that envision uh, establishment of uh, independent judicial councils governed by judiciary, these solutions at the same time um, do not work for uh, transition democracies because uh, uh, when we um, grant judiciary, corrupt judiciary sole control over uh, reforming itself, uh, at the end of the day we see that uh, reform failed. Uh, it is, this is something Ukraine did in 2016. So, um, and I want to give the floor to you uh, prominent expert from Romania, Ms. Laura Stefan. Laura, do you agree to the uh, conclusion that uh, transitional democracies need uh, new solutions to tackle judicial corruption and ensure judiciaries uh, are truly independent? Well, I think for many years we have um, we have fought this dilemma of the chicken and the egg. You know, what comes first, uh, uh, reforming the judiciary or giving judges enough guarantees that they feel safe uh, to actually go ahead and do their job? Um, and as any dilemma, this is a complicated thing. And trying to use simple solution because our brain is wired in a way that we search for simple solution and we truly believe that simple solutions can exist in our daily life for complicated situations. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think we learned uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, that complicated problems usually have complicated solutions and that one size fits all type of solutions do not work. That you cannot apply the same standards that countries um, that have had democracies and robust judiciaries for tens or hundreds of years, um, you cannot apply the same standards to countries that have uh, just come out of communism or are transitioning to uh, rule of law and, and uh, fully fledged democracy. Um, why is that? Uh, simple, you know, you have to adjust your solutions to the problems you have in a country. When your judiciary um, is completely um, uh, inward looking, not to say corrupt, but let's, let's limit ourselves to, to, to thinking that the judiciaries are just protecting their own rights and privileges. Um, when you have uh, uh, people that have connections uh, because they grew up together and they developed professionally with the help of important politicians or oligarchs, uh, then it becomes ridiculous to assume that they will ever be able to tackle complicated um, um, problems in the society, be it high level corruption or um, organized crime, as it was the case in, in Albania. Yeah? Um, so to me, uh, it is obvious that we need to come up with solutions that actually reflect our current challenges. And pretending that we don't see the challenges is not going to help, really. Um, I think if we take a step back, the question is really, is judicial policies really a kitchen table discussion that should happen only with people in the judiciaries? Because that's the argument. Nobody knows better than we do. Yeah, but is it just for you to have a say? Uh, when it comes to judicial policies? Or is this something that the entire society has to discuss? 
Uh, I remember having a, a conversation uh, in uh, some years ago, maybe four years ago, uh, when an attempt to change the pension system in Romania for judges. Uh, just to give you a hint, here they retire when uh, they have 20, 25 years of uh, judicial experience, yeah? So around 50. Um, and they wanted to retire when, they're 20, when they have only 20 years of seniority, yeah? So around 45. And I said, this is outrageous. We were discussing with Venice Commission um, experts. And they say, I, I wonder why you say that, because everybody seems to like this provision. I said, of course. I mean, of course they like it, because it's good for them. Wouldn't you want to retire when you're 45? I, I know I would, yeah? So why do we only discuss with the judiciary? Should we have other people around the table? Should we maybe have civil society? Should we have barristers? Should we have people that uh, have, a, have a, an interest in the judiciary um, beyond uh, the, the, the legal profession? And, you know, um, I think the answer is yes. But I think then we are faced with the next challenge, and that is how to ensure that these people are not proxies for oligarchs and politicians. Because let's face it, this is the next, the next threat. Yeah, so we open the door, we bring in new people, hoping that they bring integrity, transparency to the process, new standards, new ways of working. But what if they become proxies for exactly those that we wanted to keep out of the judiciary? And I think this is, this is a fair concern that I hear from uh, uh, colleagues in the judiciary. You know, once you open this door, Let's again look at our countries. I mean, populism is flourishing. Oligarchs are super powerful. They buy TV stations, they buy newspapers, they buy people. Why wouldn't they buy an expert that would be part of these new systems? So I think, I think we need already uh, to craft in our mind an answer to that question because it will come and it is a relevant question. Um, and one last, uh, one last comment about, you know, our, our dream uh, that good laws, uh, laws that match uh, Western standards would transform societies, yeah? And our big disappointment that, you know, it also takes people. It takes people because in many of our countries, these laws were a mere window dressing exercise. What I mean is not that we didn't adopt them and we didn't implement them, but we didn't believe in them. For us, they were there just to check a box and maybe deep inside we were all hoping that will prove that these standards don't belong here yeah so this is i think a growing up uh, experience where you develop um, a deeper understanding uh, and and you internalize um, these standards you understand why they're there it's almost like a kid you when you tell them don't do that uh, because that's the rule. And they say, but I don't care, why, why should I follow the rule? But then when you explain why the rule is there, that the rule is actually there to help you, I think then the click happens. And, you know, sooner or later, uh, they, will, they will also internalize the rule. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have, of course, we have to adjust solutions to the problems we have in our countries. And before we move to you, the most... Uh, at least in my mind, the most interesting part of our discussion, discussion on the solutions to uh, judicial reforms in transitional democracies. I want to present um, a remarkable intervention we have today. Uh, we have a pre-recorded speech of Wendy Morton, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, Minister for European Neighborhood and the Americas, United Kingdom, Wendy Morton. Hello and Dobri Den. The UK is honoured to be one of Ukraine's strongest partners and allies, and I'm honoured to speak to you today. We are steadfast in our support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity in the face of Russian aggression. And we are strengthening that alliance after signing our strategic partnership agreement late last year. So it won't surprise you that we view judicial reform in Ukraine as essential both for the country's development and its resilience to Russian aggression. Ukraine has made strong progress in reform since 2014. But as a close and honest friend of Ukraine, I can say that while reform is a good defence, 
a self-interested and corrupt minority is preventing the country from using it effectively. That minority wants to consolidate its grip on power, and an unreformed judiciary remains their best tool for maintaining their stronghold. The UK, both bilaterally and with our G7 partners, has for a long time advocated a systematic approach to judicial reform as a central pillar of the fight against corruption. We are confident that it is the key to unlocking Ukraine's full, amazing potential. We have talked about deoligarchization for some time. As President Zelensky has said, we all know the names of these people, but that, we, but, but that can't be achieved without comprehensive judicial reform. We understand that the entrenched problems in, U in Ukraine's judiciary, its links with vested interests, present enormous challenges. Challenges that need pragmatic, creative solutions that balance cleansing with constitutionality. Some of Ukraine's successful reforms, like the establishment of the High Anti-Corruption Court and the reboot of the National Agency for the Prevention of Corruption, show that core European values, such as judicial independence, can and should prevail. It's for Ukraine to decide its own route there, but we have drawn some key lessons from others' successes in the region. There are three things that we know are effective. First, a comprehensive strategy backed with political will. Quick fixes just don't work, and we want Ukraine's success to be for the long term. Second, consultation. The best judicial reforms use the expertise of civil society and legal practitioners who recognise the need for change and the best order for reforms. And third, a willingness to take bold steps. International case law increasingly shows the need for radical measures to disrupt a status quo of, of corruption. In Ukraine's case, this likely means using external input on concerns over judges' integrity. It's vital that the Ukrainian government maintains its commitment and momentum, and I am confident it will. Its friends in the international community should be equally committed to supporting it. Events like this are so helpful for, for facilitating that support and helping the government give the Ukrainian people the security, stability and prosperity they want and deserve. UK, Ukraine can rest assured that the UK will be by its side on that journey. And I wish you a really fruitful discussion at the conference. And I hope that next time we can meet in person. Thank you. So thanks um, to Ms. Morton. And um, again, I want to stress that um, judicial reform is a key to unlocking amazing potential of uh, of countries in the region and uh, particularly i mean uh, moldova ukraine uh, georgia and armenia so we've been uh, talking a lot of problems we have with uh, judicial governance in transitional democracies we've been talking a lot about corruption we've been talking a lot uh, about lack of uh, independence of judiciary and individual judges so what the solution could be to these uh, threats how to ensure our judiciaries are independent and accountable at the same time so a month ago experts from Armenia, Bulgaria, Romania, Georgia, Moldova, uh, Romania and Ukraine um, that together to, uh, to search for solutions. And uh, we came up with the recommendations towards ensuring accountable and independent judiciaries in our countries. And uh, we want to present these recommendations today um, at our panel because uh, one of the uh, goals of our conference is not only to pay attention to 
corruption, uh, lawfare, and the threats uh, to democracy, but also to discuss and suggest solutions that uh, that might work not only for Ukraine, not for only for countries in the region, but uh, also for the whole world. So, um, what is our response to uh, the problems of judicial corruption? Um, we uh, prepared eight, eight recommendations towards ensuring independent and uh, accountable judiciaries. First of all, it is important to stress that um, powers of judges should be counterbalanced with their duties. And uh, as uh, Laura Stefan already uh, stressed today, when we decide on specific model of uh, judicial governance, we should take into consideration the history of judicial administration and uh, judicial culture. We should take into account uh, specific situations we have in transitional democracies. Next. Judiciary should be governed by independent authority. It is crucially important that people who decide who should be appointed to judicial positions and who should be dismissed, it is crucially important that these people are independent and unbiased, that they are free from undue influence of, uh, of the parliament, of the government, of the president, and also of politicians and uh, oligarchs. This. Uh, Independent judiciary, therefore, should be composed of independent members who meet the requirements of professionalism and integrity criteria. This does not mean that judges cannot become members of uh, judicial councils. Of course, they are welcomed, but judges, as uh, any other candidates, uh, should meet the requirements and they should undergo um, a scrutiny of um, their integrity. They should not have some exclusive rights or quotas for membership because it is uh, what they are using now to preserve the status quo and to preserve their influence over the whole judiciaries. The next important recommendation is that, uh, um, of course, the independence and transforciness of the Council for Judiciary is, um, should be ensured by the way its members are selected. Therefore, they should undergo a public, transparent and fair selection procedure. And uh, uh, to safeguard the selection procedure, it is important, uh, uh, it is set up by law. National system may provide for different models for appointing members of uh, judicial councils. Uh, like uh, in Ukraine, uh, we have parliament, president uh, engaged in this process. Uh, uh, some countries uh, involve uh, ministry of justice. Uh, the majority of justice uh, of, uh, of members of judicial councils uh, in our countries are now appointed by judiciary itself. But it is crucially important that uh, in any case, an independent panel should be in charge of uh, the assessment of all the candidates who would like to become members of judicial councils. It is crucially important that um, this independent panel ensure that candidates who meet professionalism and integrity criteria are appointed. The panel assessing integrity of the candidates applying for positions uh, in judicial councils should be composed of independent unbiased experts possessing outstanding professional and personal qualities and have an impeccable reputation and trust of the society and aiming at fostering public trust in the process national system should encourage the involvement of civil society and international experts in particularly well reputable civil society organizations with recognized experience in rule of law, human rights and anti-corruption should be eligible to nominate experts to the independent panel. The involvement of international experts uh, successfully worked uh, for the establishment of the high anti-corruption court uh, of Ukraine. Now we are trying to multiple this uh, uh, experience to the uh, um, selection of members of judicial councils and I'm truly convinced that um, this um, will also successfully work for the countries in the region. Last but not least, um, it is important to ensure members of judicial councils are accountable. So they should not be exempted from general anti-corruption requirements and measures and when where possible they should comply with higher integrity standards and uh, 
professional ethics criteria given the importance of their role. And uh, last but not least, in case of misconduct, a member of the Council for Judiciary, um, an effective disciplinary procedure should be in place. Principles of independence and accountability should be equally respected when relevant disciplinary procedures are conducted. So we believe that um, the implementation of this recommendation in our countries uh, will help us to uh, make judicial reforms a success story this time. And um, now I want to, uh, to discuss it with, uh, with our experts and first of all with uh, Ms. Stamate. So, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that uh, the implementation of these recommendations uh, might uh, work and Moldova could benefit from the implementation of these ideas? Um, actually, um, I think these ideas are a good uh, concept uh, from which we can derive more specific tailored scenarios for each specific context. So, as an overall concept, um, the recommendations are setting a way uh, or paving a way towards a more inclusive, a more transparent Judicial Council, which is very important. I have to admit that I fully agree with what uh, Laura Stefan said earlier, that if we include, or let's say diversify the membership of the Judicial Council to include uh, independent experts from civil society, representatives of the Bar Association. The key element here is how to select them. Because in Moldova we have had in the past several years uh, competitions or selection processes that unfortunately have been flawed, that have failed. There were the best interests to select the best people through those uh, processes but for one reason or another, these have in many cases failed. So indeed, not to give, so we should be very careful not to give this power and authority to external actors f from outside the judiciary to, let's say, administer the, uh, the judiciary in a, in, in a judicial council, uh, to give it to those who, uh, are not um, qualified. And I'm not only saying uh, about their professionalism, I'm actually more referring to their integrity and uncorruptibility. And in this respect, I think as a transitional measure, the involvement of international experts would be highly valuable, valuable. How to do that is another question. So we have to think how we can shape this mechanism or this exercise in a way so that it corresponds to the needs of the country and also to the international um, uh, framework, international, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, best recommendations in this area. But I think a combination of these factors uh, should be uh, considered so as to ensure maximum success of, uh, of, of this idea. Thank you. I, I completely agree, and uh, um, now I want uh, to uh, ask uh, Ms. Sochotska what, um, what, what uh, are her thoughts on um, the recommendations uh, presented. And uh, I would say that uh, when this commission uh, goes far beyond the recommendations uh, envisioned by uh, the Committee of Ministers of the, High, uh, of the Council of Europe in, uh, initially in 1994 and then in 2010. When is Commission, uh, when assessing um, draft laws uh, of Albania and Ukraine, suggests very revolutionary ideas, uh, conclusions and solution. And uh, basically I can say that uh, here in our recommendations, we uh, actually, we do not suggest something new. It is something when this commission has already commented on. So uh, can we uh, state that uh, when this commission opinions on uh, Ukraine, on Albania, uh, uh, are setting up precedents for the countries in the region for transitional democracies who want to fight judicial corruption. 
Ms. Suchotka, are you with us? I was, I was disconnected. And so for that reason, I lost connection. I haven't heard your, 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 your question oh, defined. It, I started at the beginning, but I haven't heard your question. It's, it's all right. Uh, of course, uh, I, uh, I will repeat it. So, uh, what, uh, the idea is that uh, it seems to me that um, the Venice Commission, uh, in its uh, recent opinions on uh, judicial reforms mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Albania and in Ukraine, goes far beyond the recommendations set up uh, by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe in 1994 and then in 2010. When this commission, uh, in its recent opinions, uh, has made, uh, I would say, revolutionary uh, conclusions, it suggested uh, ideas and basically these recommendations we uh, just uh, presented um, they do not suggest anything new because it is something Venice Commission already uh, suggests, already envisioned in its opinion. So, um, in this regard, can we conclude that uh, Venice Commission opinions are setting up precedents for uh, judicial reforms in transitional democracies? You know, I try. I tried to, to answer your question, but I was uh, exactly uh, not fully connected with, 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 with you. Uh, what, uh, what should I say? Our, our uh, opinion, uh, opinion of the Venice Commission, as it has been explained by, by President Bukikio, um, is built and, uh, on, the, on the, how to say, uh, line uh, of the um, guiding lines of the Venice Commission opinions prepared uh, in the term of 30 years. You have to take into account that exactly our one of our main roles of the Venice Commission was making opinion to the reform on judiciary. We were involved in many countries on different stages of making the reform. And here, uh, only maybe one short comment, because I am of the opinion that it's sometimes difficult to call the amendments making to the law as a real reform, because very often there are only small amendments which are put to the existing system, and then finally they are not fully coherent with other solutions. We could observe it in the case of, of Ukraine when such uh, partial amendments were included to the law and even then to the constitution, but then they were not, as President Bukikio said, there was no such a holistic reform. And um, I think that we also, uh, have to change the, maybe on the country observing the situation. You said now that the Venice Commission is going far beyond the opinion of the Council Minister from 1994. 1994 probably it was a different situation. We didn't expect it that the, how to say, corruption would be so high because in the beginning we thought only on the politicization, as I said, depolitization of the judiciary. And we thought in the Council of Europe, in the Venice Commission, that when we introduce some mechanism, then we guaranteed the depolitization of the judges, but that also impartiality. And it would be automatic way to And of course, it opened way to the to the corruption. This situation uh, was a, a clear sign that now we have to look for a new method, new solutions for guaranteeing the independence of a judiciary, and especially to create impartiality of of judiciary. It is one of the most difficult problems. For that reason, I see the recommendations proposed by you 
as being in line with recommendations of the Venice Commission. And not only the recommendations, which are now the details recommendation concerning the Ukrainian law, but your recommendations are exactly put in the framework of the Venice Commission report on the appointment of judiciary, you, or the judges. You remember that it was one of the first uh, report, general report of the Venice Commission on appointment of, ju of judges. Uh, so uh, we found the system of appointment is so crucial and important for uh, creating an impartiality and independence of judiciary that the first report was devoted only to this issue. It was done in cooperation with the Council of Europe and Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe. And then the next report was a report on the independence of judiciary and guarantees of independence of judiciary. And then in the report of the Venice Commission on the independence of judiciary, you can find also some uh, sentences and, and uh, proposals which are uh, totally in line what is now included into the uh, into your recommendations, yes? Because, for example, there is also such a clearly said that we have to guarantee the universal standards, or maybe better use the word European standards, because we are discussing on the countries that are members of the Council of Europe. So we have to guarantee the European standards of independence of judiciary. But the way, as we discuss here, leading to this guarantee to the to the final effect uh, could be different and the, the, the how to say solutions uh, in different countries could be different but finally there should always be how to say kept on the track because then otherwise we can go completely to different direction and to create again the politi political uh, political uh, judiciary. So for that reason, and now we can see, and it was also a very a symptomatic evolution of the opinion of the Venice Commission concerning the role of High Judicial Council. Because in the beginning, the Venice Commission was not so strong in favor of creating the High Judicial Council because um, gave examples, as I said before, that there are countries where the uh, High Judicial Council does not exist, but the independence of judiciary and the just appointment of judges is guaranteed. But then after, when this commission changed its mind, it was also after opinion done for Albania and other countries that probably in transitional democracy, the best way is to create high judicial council. But high judicial council should be autonomous body, as I said. And first, we thought that this autonomous body means that it should be composed of majority of judges. Now, we see after the evolution is going on, that as his he said, probably in this body should be also participation of other uh, persons. Now, depends who. We can agree here that probably not politicians. Politicians should not be represented in such a body, or maybe only, as it is in some countries, one member, two members of parliament, and minister of Standard, but the European standard is that the body should guarantee the, um, how to say, uh, just way of uh, appointment of judges, prepare the, 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 the good procedure, and to, to uh, finally to create a group of integrity persons that are working for judiciary. In this sense, I am also of the opinion that the role of international experts in countries being in transition is of great importance. They should take part in the work because they have a different experience. And I can say that the countries where the international experts were involved showed that it was a, in many cases a success. You also in Ukraine, you have the anti-corruption court, yes, which is one of the most successful stories in Ukraine, but because it was based on the cooperation with international 
expert. So this case should be taken into account and the decision to, uh, to decide on the international expert would be a decision taken by sovereign state. But exactly, I think that it would be very, very useful. So I support, finally, I support the recommendations presented by you because they are in line with the Venice Commission, but in details, they should be adapted to the uh, situation existing in concrete countries, not breaking the general European standards. Of course, uh, definitely we do not want to replace existing standards with our recommendation. Our <coughs> aim is to introduce uh, some alternative solution for countries in transition and of course we aim to build judiciaries independent enough to govern themselves so this is our overall goal we would like to um, to get there but now we feel like that we need some uh, more um, adaptive solutions, I would put it like that, and uh, I completely agree with you uh, on the fact that politicians should not be involved, they should not be uh, members of judicial councils, and they should not be involved in the process of the election of members of judicial councils. Um, so, uh, international experts, uh, Mr. Hoppe, what are your thoughts in this regard? What do you think uh, of the idea of uh, involving international <coughs> experts in uh, selection of uh, judicial governance bodies, in judicial governance reform? And importantly, do you support the idea that they should have a um, temporary but decisive role in this process? Thank you very much. Um, as I was listening to you reading the draft recommendations, I was thinking, what would a Ukrainian member or president of, of a judicial self-governance body think about these recommendations? And when I look at them, I think they would probably not to almost all of the recommendations. They would say, of course, we should have integrity and accountability. Mm -hmm. Of course, this. Of course, we should be disciplinarily accountable. Of course, there should be integrity a criteria for our appointment. Um, and this is what we did. We submitted our ass declarations mm -hmm. and um, we never committed a crime, or at least you could not prove it. And we know this whole violin of, um, um, how shall I say, um, let's say, passed by a, by a, by a low bar. Um, of standards. And I think they might even appease or compromise to the idea that civil society members or non-judicial members are part of the council as long as they, they are not majority. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the Venice Commission and the European Court of Human Rights or whoever, they will never give up the idea that there should be a majority of judges. And so they, and, and for a good reason. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so they will feel pretty safe. And as Laura was saying, um, the civil society, civil society members can easily be proxies. Or if you go to other countries, for example, Azerbaijan, um, you have meaningful civil society organizations there, but you also have a state sector civil society there. So um, I think the only thing that would hurt or make them like feel uneasy, um, the luck test is the involvement of international experts, actually. Um, because they are proposed from outside the system, they come from outside the system, they are often even financed from outside, outside the system, but th that is not even the point in the end, I think. Um, and that is a real game changer. The, the, the networks will not work anymore, um the playing down of integrity standards um yeah because when i look in the in the in the recommendations it says they should pass integrity criteria but then the difference is in practice um like like how do you define integrity and how high do you set the threshold and do you actually um um uh, how, how, how shall i say um um, um, let, let it suffice that there is su substantial um, doubts about a candidate, and so that candidate will not pass. Um, all these little technical questions, I think, in the end, will only be a success if the people selecting the council members are independent. 
And in this, again, I, I agree with Laura, it's not a simple solution and it's not the silver bullet, but it, it's my light of hope, as I said earlier. And what we saw in Ukraine, I think, um, is very promising um, and in the perception of many different stakeholders. And to me, I have a very simple lacmus test if, if an anti-corruption tool is effective or not. <laughs> if the ones who are affected don't like it, and are very silent about it or start to create um, ugly narratives about it, it violates the sovereignty and other myths, um, then I know I'm on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Stefan, what, what do you think of uh, involvement of international experts? And uh, importantly, uh, do you think that this might work for, uh, for the countries in the region for transitional democracies, whether we can uh, engage international experts and give them temporary, uh, crucial, uh, even decisive role in the process? Uh, would it help us? Uh, is this the solution that... Uh, can help us to achieve uh, independent judiciaries? It definitely is a solution and it has been tried and it worked. And I don't think it violates really anything. Uh, I think this is just, uh, uh, you know, uh, an argument that people opposing the reform of the judiciary are making, uh, are making up. Uh, I think uh, when embarking into such an important uh, effort, um, there's also a need for international organizations to understand that this takes time, commitment, and consistency of decisions. You can't expect that things are solved overnight. So this uh, element of, of temporary nature of the process, I think it needs explanations. It needs to be clear for everybody involved in this thing that it's not in a blink of an eye. You're not gonna build um, uh, strong uh, internal instruments uh, overnight. And, you know, talking from the perspective of Romania, I can tell you that, uh, you know, there was a lot of reform between uh, 2004 and 2007 in the area of the judiciary. And we kept getting this question from the European Commission, is the reform irreversible? Is the reform irreversible? Is there... How can it be? How can it be irreversible? Of course it's reversible. Of course it takes more than three years uh, to actually cement changes in the, not only in the mindset, in the institutional uh, uh, setup, in the, in the way people think about issues. I mean, I, I, if you look at Romania 15 years ago and you look at Romania today, I think integrity dilemmas are completely different in the judiciary, right? So, so it takes time. And I think international experts uh, have, uh, have a very uh, um, uh, good input in terms of their background, the way they th see things, because they've seen it in other contexts, but they also need the help of nationals. And I think that is the, you know, that's the, the Achille uh, 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 point, so to say. Who's gonna advise the internationals? because you need to know who's who in a country. You need to have that national knowledge uh, and insight that only someone that has lived through these, these times has. I mean, I don't know, I, I think we have the same uh, prototype of, of people that are uh, on the wrong side from our perspective, yeah. So they're not supporting reforms of the judiciary. They think that the status quo is very good. But at the same time, professionally, they are not good. They're not bad. They're not stupid. They're well-trained. They're well-networked. Uh, so they would present themselves very nice in an interview, right? Uh, there I have hopes for the, for the declarations of uh, assets and uh, interest, really, because I think uh, that's where you see who's who also. Um, so, so it goes without saying that I'm supporting these uh, ideas that you put forward. I was part of uh, uh, the group that, that thought about them and, and, and talked about them. I don't think, I think they are in line with, with what we see um, in the standards of, of the Council of Europe and the Venice Commission. But, um, I, I think it is important to, do, to look at the details. Yeah, J just don't think that, you know, as we thought about the laws, you know, that they will change everything. Don't think that a commission of internationals is gonna change everything if it's not 
um, attended for by people with high skills and, and good knowledge of the local context. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we know that when countries start anti-corruption campaigns, uh, there's a lot of misleading information in the public about, uh, you know, who's good and who's bad. Uh, sometimes judges are criticized for, for decisions. And then when you look at those, those decisions, you see that they merely exercise judicial oversight in good faith. Uh, but maybe uh, the evidence was not compelling. Maybe the evidence was not legally uh, gathered and so on. So, so I think, yes, absolutely having international uh, experience is a, is a plus, but we have to put in the other ingredients in the soup. Just the chicken won't do. <laughs> we need carrots, we need onions, we need everything to, to get uh, the end result. Dear, I want to thank you for your contribution. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. It feels like we already we just started, but um, now we came to the closing remarks. So I invite our speakers to you to make some closing remarks. Uh, Miss Stamata. Um, thank you. Um, just if we think of. Uh, uh, what is the key element that is missing currently in and I think it's the same for all the countries in the region that we are speaking about but I can definitely tell you about Moldova what is the key element that missing is missing in the Moldovan judiciary is accountability and I think that from this very word accountability all the other and I don't like to use the word reform because it has been compromised so much. All the other renewal, resetting mechanism should come from this accountability um, vision. So this should be set as, as, as a crossing, as a red line throughout the process. And when we design how we reshape the system, so that we reach this accountability, I think things will become more clear because accountability will be also the word which will accompany the reshaping system. When you select the international experts, when they select the members of the national, of the high judicial council, etc., etc., it's all around the same accountability. And I really hope that we will be able to say in a few words, in a few years, not very far from now, that we finally have a judiciary which is not just independent, but is also accountable, accountable towards citizens and accountable to the law. Thank Let's you. make it happen. Uh, Mr. Hotka, if you are with us and uh, would like to, to, to give them closing remarks, so you're welcome. I guess uh, there are some troubles with connections, so if uh, we can listen now to Dr. Tillman Hoppe. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I would repeat again what I... Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes, we do hear I don't you know. too, so... Yes, yes, okay, so I have the two sentences. So I also would like to say what I said at the beginning, that the problem of, of appointment is a crucial one because we have also to take into account that now the many cases are judged by the European Court of Human Rights and also by the European Tribunal, but taking into account the process of appointment of judges. And so, so we, can, uh, we have... Uh, we have a judgment uh, where is exactly the, the, um, the mode of uh, appointing of judges that not guaranteed the right to fair justice. So for that reason, I think what has been said here uh, that we have to find in different countries in transition the best way for appointment of judges, also with the participation of international experts, so far as it is possible, and it would create a better guarantee for creating a judiciary uh, composed of integrity person, exactly. And in this case, also integrity means that the person will be accounted, yes, because it is strictly uh, connected to the two things. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Hopper, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I just want to echo what Laura Stefan was saying, um, that indeed um, international experts cannot work um, just isolated or in an isolated manner. But um, as we saw in Ukraine, it was really going hand in glove with civil society, like you were seeing, um, for example, for the selection commission of the High Anti-Corruption Court, where the International Council and the, the, the Civil Society Council worked hand in glove, or on the NACP selection commission, non-judicial, but still, where you had half-half international experts and civil society experts, and it was a wonderful experience, and, and it worked really well. So, um, yeah, just to underline this point, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Ms. Laura Stefan, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think, uh, I think you're proposing uh, a good way uh, forward. I think uh, we have to thank you for getting all of us together to reflect about these issues. Uh, I think uh, uh, in the future, as we move along uh, these lines, we have to also take into consideration mechani mechanism to safeguard uh, the fact that this process is not hijacked uh, by oligarchs, by criminals, by organized crime groups, because they would probably be uh, uh, preparing their own experts. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, the angle of gongos should not be uh, underestimated. And, you know, I mean, it was, uh, Antak, I think, gave a great example of how this can work with a very involved civil society in Ukraine. And I think we have a lot to learn uh, from, uh, from that uh, experiment. And uh, I do hope that the transfer of expertise also happens through this international plus national um, cooperation mechanism, because that's the end result, that countries uh, do stand on their own feet and that uh, judicial integrity is actually achieved at the end of the process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. So, dear, uh, dear speakers, thank you very much for uh, joining our discussion today. Thank you very much for joining Democracy in Action Conference. We presented a solution today. We already know what should we do and how can we tackle judicial corruption, how can we combat judicial corruption, and uh, how can we ensure our judiciaries are independent and at the same time are accountable. As Ms. Sohotska said, now we have to ensure our recommendations are implemented in the recommendations of the Council of Europe. So let's uh, do our best to make this happen. Um, thank you very much for watching us today. and. Uh, there will be a lot of fruitful discussions uh, today, so please uh, stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Дякую Галині та учасникам цієї панелі за таку змістовну важливу розмову. Thank the panel for the fruitful and important discussion on judiciary, and we continue the discussion on fighting corruption, namely about asset recovery and about fighting the legalization of illicit gain. The town of Shevchuk is here with us, with me from Anti-Corruption Action Center. Who Tatiana, welcome. So, asset recovery. What exactly cases do you mean? What is the amount of assets that have been exported by previous people in power? You see, we only have approximate figures. We don't know for sure who and how much stole because none of the cases have been referred to court yet. There are some projections. We know about the Lazarenko case. Lazar Mr. Lazarenko is a former prime minister of Ukraine and he stole approximately 250 million US dollars and this is a, a case in progress uh, in the USA so there is chance that Ukraine recovers this money. Now, Viktor Yanukovych, the infamous pre president, corrupt schemes amounted to 40 
billion US dollars when he was in power. Theoretically, this money could be recovered. 40 billion is an exorbitant amount, obviously, and probably it could have been exaggerated, but 10 million dollars could potentially be returned to Ukraine and they can be used to ensure the prosperity of the citizens or to finance reform. Tatiana, why do you say approximate amount? Who failed to ascertain the exact numbers or when this effort was initiated? Who started looking into the cases? So, for the Lazarenko case, back in the day, it was not investigated by Ukrainians. It was by the Swiss and the American law enforcement. In Ukraine, it was politicized, and as new people came to power, it faded into oblivion. The focus has never been about asset recovery. The debate was about fighting corruption, but it was politicized. Now, after 2014, when Ukrainians realized the sheer scale of embezzlement, when they saw the residents Mujahiria and the lifestyle of Yanukovych and his associates, there was a big call for justice. So recovering illicit uh, proceeds became a big topic. There was an attempt after 2014 to actually reshuffle the law enforcement and the judiciary system so as to reclaim these assets for Ukrainians and to make sure that justice is served. This was a way to address the desire of Ukrainians to punish all the perpetrators. Tatiana, could you give us an idea of where we are now in fighting corruption? Back in 2014, we realized that the law enforcement, the way it was back then, is incapable of quick review, is incapable of administering justice. This is how the idea of the so-called anti-corruption architecture was envisaged. Special Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office and Anti-Corruption Bureau were established. Investigations started and then they relegated the case in the courts where the cases were stuck. They were simply lying on the table. All judges were corrupt and we realized that there is a consolidated effort to undermine the justice and this is where the idea of high anti-corruption court arose. So there are bodies that investigate and prosecute corrupt and there's also a body focused on preventing corruption, the so-called NACP. They verify the asset declarations by public officials publicly available on the internet. The, and also an asset recovery agency or ARMA was created. It takes everything found by the Anti-Corruption Bureau and then duly transfers it to the government. But recovering assets and illicit process is actually a long story and probably it calls for international cooperation. What legal instruments are available for recovering these assets from other countries? You have a point. It takes years. And the problem is not only with the law enforcement, but the thing is that these investigations are indeed very complicated because the perpetrators and crooks know how to conceal those assets um, abroad, how to transform them in various uh, luxury items such as yacht, yachts uh, or property. And hence the international cooperation is crucial, coordinating law enforcement of different countries is crucial too. In 2014, after the revolution of dignity, it was of big help that our international partners imposed targeted sanctions against former officials, thus freezing their assets. So, okay, the assets are frozen, but when will Ukraine get them? What should happen so that we can return these funds to the state budgets and actually use it for the benefit of Ukraine? Ukraine must do its homework to its fullest. The architecture is in place. The legislation facilitating 
its work is in place. Then what we must do is not to create obstacles for these authorities, ensure independence of the Bureau and the SAPO. And we also need to inform the public on, on the progress of these cases. What assets have been seized? What assets can be returned to the Ukrainian budget? Oh, that sounds like a comprehensive homework to do. Today we have a special dedicated panel that is called Investigating Cross-Border Corruption and actually re recovering illicit gains. And we expect the director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, Artem Sitnik, to join the panel. And now we have a short presentation to show you. We have recorded a blitz interviews with anti-corruption activists that are operating across a number of countries. We called the project Democracy Against the Pandemic of Corruption and we asked them what's their personal motivation to fight to recover the stolen assets day in, day out. We also asked them about the accomplishments that uh, these activists have under their belts. Our video starts now. Biden is a global con man who rigged the US election and, in fact, constructed his version of victory via controlled media. Most NATO and EU members are on the side of Hitler and killed 8 million Ukrainians. Tell me, are they your brothers? Well, instead of motivation of those who fight corruption, we saw the motivation of those who combat disinformation. Very similar fields of work, and we will listen to the disinformation panel after I talk my, to my next guest. I have here with me today Mr. Oleksiy Harany, and he will present a research of Democratic Initiatives Foundation. Uh, the presentation is called After 2020, How COVID-19 Pandemic Influenced Pro-Russian Agenda in Ukraine. This is the best introduction to the next panel. Oleksiy, welcome. Welcome, thank you for having me. Oleksiy, you actually have the chance to answer this question. So, the Russian propaganda is indeed making use of the vast toolbox in its propaganda warfare against Ukraine. And I'd like to draw your attention to the first diagram that we have in place. I don't see if the slides are actually there. The audience will see the slide, Oleksy. We can actually see it, but it's going to be the next slide. Yes, thank you, Ina. So could you please put the first diagram on screen? 
Yes, the next slide, please. So we assess the attitude towards vaccination. Uh, have you carried out the research before the vaccination process was unrolled rolled out? We measured it across different times, this February, last autumn, and in April, respectively. Oh, there you see the slides. 29%. So, orange line there stands for 29% people who don't believe in vaccines' efficiency. This is almost 30%. Another almost 20% don't have faith in Ukrainian healthcare system. And this is a, gr a reason for our major concern. Yes, this is the February data. And obviously the Russian propaganda is trying to build on that. The next figure is here. So the attitude towards different vac vaccines, positive and negative mentions in the media relating to different vaccines. The blue lines represent Pfizer and AstraZeneca. In January, an announcement came. These vaccines were shipped to Ukraine, and we see a surge of positive mentioning in the media. So it was a very powerful effect. Ukraine is receiving help. What happens next? March and April, we see a drop in the balance between positive and negative evaluation. The total sentiment is positive, after all, but you see that it plummeted because of what Russian propaganda did. Even though the channels directly controlled by Medvedchuk were shut down, but nevertheless, even those remaining channels still spread the information, even those who don't belong to so-called the pro-Russian holding company. Alexei, but who is pushing this message? Well, you know, mostly it was pushed by Medvedchuk companies who have been shut down now. But you see, it's also in the media. Social media are creating this tension and are trying to hype up vaccination. They're saying you shouldn't get vaccinated, that allegedly the Western vaccine aren't effective, hence the plummeting. So initially, it was received positively. And the most positive balance to trust versus mistrust was towards Covishield, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. But we see that this balance was upset. Could you please elucidate on the Sputnik line on this diagram, Alexei? Am I right in understanding that the Russian efforts mostly sought to create a negative reputation for Pfizer as opposed to Mm. as opposed to supporting Sputnik. Well, this is the line of Sputnik vaccine, the Russian vaccine. It's quite stable. No ups and downs there. However, the balance of positive and negative evaluations are is, is almost zero. So the positive evaluation is somewhat dominant because, you know, it's a vaccine it's against. But it's held in less positive regard as opposed to the West. This is Johnson and Johnson line, but you know people don't know much about it yet. Therefore, people are less enthusiastic about this vaccine. The next slide, please. In assessing the general sentiment towards vaccination, this is what we see. It's a way to divide and sow discord between the local and the central government. Please, the next slide, not this one. As you can see, both in September and in January, if the local government had wanted to lift lockdown restrictions, then there would have been a big split in the society, and the majority would have been in favor of lifting restrictions. 
the central government is imposing restrictions. And the local government says, no, we oppose, we're going to live though. And unfortunately, uh, ordinary citizens would support that. You see the first two um, columns here and there. What does that mean? That populism is sadly winning and that the local government is trying to gain some dividends. Next slide, please. And in conclusion, the impact of the Russian propaganda is not limited to such questions and co as COVID or the tension between the central government and the local government. Russians continue operating in their traditional field, such as uh, the language policy, history, geopolitics, etc. But here we see important achievements. We want to provide some good news for the audience. The support for the eastern vectors, i.e. the vectors to join the Eurasian Union, is only supported by 10 percent. Before 2014, there was a split. Um, it was a divisive issue, should we support the east or the west. Now there has been a dramatic decrease in the support of the eastern, eastern vector. 71 percent of Ukrainians think that Ukraine is at war with Russia, not the civil war or conflict as conflict would have us believe but they believe it's this is war there is there has been significant progress vis-a-vis -vis the language policy i'm going to name the eight the figures 80 percent of ukrainians need to speak ukrainian that during their work time the senior management should use ukrainian and the schooling needs to be in ukrainian it's somewhat less, up, it's 54 percent when we say the, u, the use of the Ukrainian language of the businesses. This is new. Uh, people think that you would be forced to buy, thing, to buy things using the Ukrainian languages, but tectonic shifts have happened vis-a-vis -vis the memory, historic, historic memory policy. There's this notion that the Third Reich and the users are, are responsible for the beginning of World War II. Fantastic figures, 50 percent agreed. We thought there was a mistake. This year we asked the same question. And we have seen that practically half of Ukrainians believe that the Russia, no, no, the USSR, not Russia, USSR and the Nazi Germany are mutually responsible for starting the war. And just another, just another figure, because it's a stark contrast to what is happening in Russia. Almost 80 percent of Ukrainians think that war would have not been possible to win if it wasn't for the anti-Hitler coalition. And this goes totally against what is said in Russia. Putin's regime denies the responsibility of the USSR and they want to criminalize that. And they also say that they allegedly could win without the um, allies and without Ukraine. So this has indeed been a dramatic shift. Alexei, why has this happened? Well, I think one of the causes is that we know more now. We have a greater knowledge. There are different media reporting on that. And the media, not only the patriotic media, but also the media that are allegedly controlled by the oligarch, they also have those narratives in place. But the key factors is what happened after 2014, the Russian aggression demonstration that Putin is not to be trusted. I believe this is not just the Ukrainian context, but an international war, because these history wars are waged in Ukraine and on the European arena as well. If Ukrainians are getting more information and becoming more critical when assessing the past events, the discourse in Russia hasn't changed. In its international platforms, the Russia is still propagating the same narratives. So how do we prevail on the international arena with how do we beat the historical myths? I believe 
we need to spread the information. Ukraine is not participating in the memory war. This is what Russia is doing in full disregard of the real historical fact. But there is an important message to the Ukrainian governmental official, something that may not go down well in the West. It's about commemorating the tragedy of Babi Yar, which is a common tragedy for Jews and Ukrainians and others. My grandma uh, was a Jewish and all her relatives perished. She was the only one who survived as she was evacuated. This hurts me a lot, and I have the right to say so. There are two ways to commemorate the Babi Yar in Ukraine, one developed by the State Academic Institute of History, supported by the experts, Ukrainian and Jews alike, and the second, which is a so-called private project, which is uh, promoted by three Russian oligarchs, which we have not seen, but they have already started an illegal construction, and they're building on a cemetery, they're building on the bones, which is prohibited by the Jewish laws and just by humane laws. The construction is um, conducted illegally, and I would like to use this opportunity to attract the attention of the Kyiv mayor and the Kyiv uh, city administration to the problem. Uh, so what are the red lines or the markers that we should be following with this project? We need to follow the law unwaveringly, and the president has supported the private project. He appointed the head of the working group, a person from his secretariat, who refused to meet the people advocating the public project. So my first beseech to the president and to the government, why don't you give the developers a chance to present it? And secondly, when we are building such a tragic memorial in a national reserve law. We have to do so consistently with the national law. And the government should hold the majority shareholding. It shouldn't belong to the Russian oligarchs, but it should be owned by the Ukrainian state. So as far as I know, we should be using the supervisory councils as a way to monitor. We need to, uh, to have a public steering committee to monitor the project. The Russia is going to use it for its narrative. Any development around Babi Yar will be used to discredit the role of Ukrainians in World War II or the role of Ukrainians these days, saying, oh, they don't want to have a, to commemorate the Babi Yar tragedy, and they want to misappropriate. It's a tragedy for the Jewish people and for the many other nationals who perished in Babi Yar. It's a global problem, and if the this discourse can attract attention to the issue in good time. Perhaps we can prevail by explaining. The time is limited. The tragedy which happened in late September is approaching fast, and those private builders are racing ahead with the construction is done illegally in disregard of the Ukrainian laws and public opinion. The calls on the government to create a, an urgent council for the public project could include the representatives of the private project too. And our request to President Zelensky to support the initiative instead of appointing one project implemented by Russian oligarchs. Going back to the issue of disinformation and building a bridge into the following detailed panel to follow our conversation, I'd like to pose you a question. How would you 
What flagrant myths would you identify that are propagated by Russia against Ukraine, both modern Ukraine and Ukraine as part of the Soviet Union? Well, they would say that we are nationalists, fascists, and anti-Semites. Let me, uh, I can see it, uh, your words quoted on the media. Well, <clears throat> Apart from Israel, um, we uh, can fully rebut uh, the myth that we are anti-Semites. We need to talk about the complexity of World War II. It's no easy narrative, but it's uh, doable. There's a good generation of analysts and historians who can really sort it out. In the laboratory of journalists, uh, together with our British colleagues Peter Pomerantsev and Internewser Crane, we conducted our own study, how do we transition from the memory to a constructive dialogue about history. And let me make a small teaser for the next panel, as I'm sure it's going to be brought up during the next panel. We should talk why these myths go down and go down into the values held by Ukrainians and how do we see ourselves in this context. I'd like to thank Oleksiy Harany for his data, for sharing the good news with us. I'd like to thank you now and bring in the moderator for the next panel. Oksana Romanyuk, I'm giving you the floor. So, Oksana Romanyuk is right next to me. She's director of the Mass Information Institute. You must have heard us mentioning the pandemic and how the discourse from the Crimea changed the way the propaganda evolved on the international arena. That now the Western vaccines are a subject of the war, information warfare. Did you plan to talk about it? We wanted to talk about the key trends in disinformation noted in 2020-2021 and the structure of information, its appearance has evolved in terms of senses and numbers and content and the target audience. Has our response changed to disinformation? How do we tackle it? What's the global picture of the world? As uh, there are several players in the field, let's not just keep mentioning one player. It's an important one for us in terms of security, but let's also talk about global challenges. And let's talk about how do we combat them at different levels. What can the government do? What can the civil society do? What can the business do? What can the social platforms and corporations do? So join us. Before I let you go, I'd like to ask your opinion. We've seen some good news from the Democratic Initiative Foundation that only 10% of Ukrainians support the pro-Eastern vector of development. So how do we, uh, what's your take on it? How do we assess that? I would, uh, wouldn't be so straightforward in this. This year we noticed a growth of different conspiracy theories. We all know that uh, the U.S. and the West had a popular conspiracy theory canon. There is some equivalence of that in Ukraine, too. Uh, more about it at the panel. I would uh, cast a much broader look, as the propaganda isn't only geared to promote the Russian image, but also to undermine trust in the institution, in justice, in reform, in the development of Ukraine towards democratic European values. 
So it's a very comprehensive and much more complex situation. It's a key panel just in just a few seconds. I wanted us to go back and to see the answers of the activists combating corruption in different countries and to learn what drives them and what uh, achievements they hold dear, why they dedicate their lives to strengthening democracy by fighting corruption. And looking forward to the disinformation in just a few minutes. The best description of Russian's information that I know is this quote from Black Sabbath. Death and hatred to mankind, poisoning their brainwashed minds. Russia tries to find or even create breaking points in societies. Putin do not need you to believe him. He wanna make you hate next guy. So divided we fall. And our only chance to stand is to act, not react. For people around the world today, the internet is a major source of information and news. This has only become more true in the era of social media and smartphones as young people and citizen journalists share content, articles and information directly with their audiences, often bypassing centralised or professional media outlets. But we cannot take access to the internet for granted. Recent years have seen either partial or complete shutdowns of public internet access in several countries, including Iran, Myanmar and India, which have inhibited access to information, stifled debate and curtailed people's abilities to protest or demonstrate. The question is, what can be done to ensure that ordinary people have free and open access to the internet, free from the fear of arbitrary or politically motivated shutdowns? The involvement of civil society is critical for tackling, tackling different propaganda narratives. Therefore, states have to look for different ways to engage civil society and, uh, and multiply their resources through people. We can all build resilience by keeping our generation informed and devoid of fake news toxicity. Because every activist and human rights fighter will tell you, knowing what is happening is the first line of defense against an authoritarian government. With a trilateral agreement signed between Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, the young people of these countries have become more aware and more sympathetic to each country's security issues the need of common values, freedoms, and how loud can voices against injustice and aggression sound together. So let's open a very important panel on disinformation and new trends in disinformation that we noted this year. We have with us the leading international and Ukrainian experts in the field of disinformation, media communications, and we will talk to the Ukrainian dimension, but also about the global dimension, how the disinformation affects the world, how this disinformation defines the decisions people make and what responses we are ready to offer as people, as governments, as civil society organizations, as businesses. Let us start the panel by presenting a video presenting a research conducted by the Ukrainian civil society organizations on the key trends in disinformation. The disinformation has evolved undoubtedly in the last few years. It's uh, drastically different from uh, what it used to be five years ago. If we could have the video, please. Russian disinformation in Ukrainian media space. Number of messages with Russian manipulations per week. Narrative structure. Why 
Байден – это, знаете как, аферист и коррупционер мирового масштаба, который фальсифицировал выборы в Америке и фактически через подконтрольные СМИ формировал свою позицию победы. Кто входит в НАТО и в Европейский Союз? Я вам скажу, кто. Большинство стран европейских, которые воевали на стороне гитлеровской коалиции и убили 8 миллионов украинцев. Ему ха-ха. Но это страны, которые входят в НАТО и в ЕС. Они наши братья, скажите. Байдене Украина будет больше лежать под штатами, чем при Трампе. С преступной террористической организацией. Почему? Потому что подобные действия и подобные условия – это условия террориста. Thank you. Amazing numbers. Earlier, we noticed anti-Western propaganda at a level of 8-10%. But this year, the growth of anti-Western propaganda has been staggering. And I have the question to our first panelist, who leads an NGO, Detective Media. What is accounting for the growth of anti-Western propaganda. Did you feel that the uh, Ukrainian space is a battleground for the giants to wage war? Or are you seeing that some uh, uh, conspiracy theories with the coronavirus are giving ground to the new trends? Good day to all the participants. I would say that this inundation of anti-Western propaganda is due to the political situation. We conducted a global study that went over for two years with the efforts of the Mass Media Institute and uh, Detective Media. We covered both the TV channels and uh, online publication, Telegram channels. As for the Telegram channels since January 22 till April 2021, we've analyzed by neural network method and machine learning, over 6,000 messages. There are certain waves. Whenever something happens between Russia and the U.S. or in the U.S. itself, like the elections, and then the Russian Federation starts using it to its end. It's very important to understand that we are seeing the same picture in Belarus. We started monitoring the situation with Roman Protasevich in Belarus, and we see very strong anti-Western rhetorics aimed 
against him. He is called a neo-Nazi and asserting his links to Azov and Ukraine, and he's also called a special agent for the Western Special Services. I suppose the Russian will escalate the anti-Western propaganda, but that's Russia. What do we see in Ukraine? In Ukraine, we've seen a lot of Ukrainian, so-called Ukrainian mass media outlets, but they still advocate anti-West and pro-Russian messages. Uh, thanks to the Mass Media Institute and Media Detector, we are noticing that amongst the messages that we had analyzed, we are seeing 39 are pro-Russian and over 60 are pro-Russian in their rhetorics. As for the Telegram channel, uh, the anonymous messages prevail, but there is something important we notice, that the anonymous channels pump more anti-Western pro-Russian rhetorics, but the degree of uh, tension is uh, higher with those who are not anonymous and have cl claimed themselves like uh, Tanya Polinska, Ukraina Ru, Buzhansky, Max Nazarov, VCUA, etc. Strangely, the anti-Western rhetorics is uh, yielded by the representatives of government of the Servant of the People Party, MPs. Interestingly, when the Medvedchuk TV outlets were shut down, we are seeing uh, a certain de-escalation in the spread of propaganda as the viewing of the channels has dropped. The same for the websites. Now on YouTube, there's only Pashina uh, Zaleshny TV channel, but it's all transitioning into the online space. To say that propaganda is on the decline would be uh, wrong. It's just moving online. And a lot of Ukrainians, politicians, and TV anchors are doing the same. Same for oligarchical channels, a TV channel called Nash, owned by uh, an unknown person. Official is owned by Muraev, but uh, de facto we see money from different sources there. We've seen in the news that uh, Muraev, the owner of TV channel, is making certain statements. And some representatives of the governing party would also offer anti-Western messages to us and uh, they would wage their attacks against Biden, Blinken, other representatives of the new U.S. Pres presidential administration, the International Monetary Fund, NATO. We see an increasingly greater attempt to uh, give off the West as an enemy and not an ally to the Ukrainians. Uh, when the Russian propaganda before was pretty straightforward, aiming to support and advocate what Russia was doing, now we are seeing that they are now pushing conspiracy theories. So they're not just advocating the pro-Russian or Russian policies, but are instead spreading rumors that Ukraine is governed by some foreign uh, subjects. And that is very consistent what we're seeing on the global arena. But before I go to the global arena, I'd like to go give the floor to Peter Pomerantz, who is the senior fellow of the John Hopkins University and the director of the ARENA initiative. So these conspiracy theories, do they um, take a root with the people. Are they accepted? If you could have the video first, please. As we're waiting for the video, 
we could start talking to Peter. The most successful propaganda effort basically needs to resonate with the culture and with the basic mindset of the person. Why was the coronavirus propaganda successful? Because it matched certain beliefs and values held by people. After all, is propaganda successful? Do these conspiracy theories work, Peter? Um, thank you very much for, for, for having me. Um, re really, in, in many ways, this is how uh, a good propagandist will, will define their work, the extent to which they understand their audience. Um, the essence of, of what they do is to, is to resonate with an audience. Um, we've had hundreds, I mean, over a hundred years now of research on this, uh, going back to Hitler's propaganda in the 1920s and 30s. It only worked in the bits of Germany which were already very anti-Semitic. Um, that's where his anti-Semitic propaganda resonated. He managed to normalize the anti-Semitism. He managed to bring it out, but it was already there. Um, um, in Russia, Vladislav Surkov, Putin's first great propagandist, I suppose, um, was a marketing expert. And he said, we don't need ideology anymore. Ideology is from the 20th century. It doesn't work. You can't force people to believe something. You can only work with their cynicism with their suspicion, with their doubt, with their experience of life, and then you manipulate it. And that's really the, the, the definition of successful propaganda is, is understanding the audience. Um, and we see across the world um, the spreading of conspiratorial propaganda, the mainstreaming. It goes from the fringes to the center. And if we're going to combat it, we really have to understand sort of the deeper things that it plays on. Um, let me give you one example. Most people who follow the QAnon conspiracy in America do not know the main ideas of the QAnon conspiracy. They're not doing it because of knowledge. They're not doing it because of information. They're doing it because they want to feel part of a community. In a world where old social identities are crumbling, where people don't know how to relate to each other, conspiracy theories can give you a sense of community, for example. So we need to start thinking about what is the appeal of that? Why do people need these communities? How can we build a more healthy type of identity and community. Now, in Ukraine... I will uh, interrupt you here because we already have video with your... Uh, ah, beautiful. I was about to talk about it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, please. And the video starts. Great.
uh, interesting. I think we all have an impression probably that propaganda has become smarter, yes, that it is more uh, complicated, not that straightforward that it used to be, uh, but how to measure it and how to deal with it, because uh, we have seen uh, conspiracy theories spread through YouTube channels in different regions of Ukraine, and, um, well, the situation is complicated, but at the same time, it's interesting for um, researchers. So, um, Peter, how do you think, uh, what can be done with it? So, so, I mean, to be clear, uh, ARENA is not about, just about research. We do research and then we work with journalists in many countries um, to do something about it. So we're very geared towards uniting research and creative content production. That's what we think about. So, so the research isn't just pure research. But, but I do think we have to understand why people are drawn to these narratives. So just taking the case of this research in Ukraine, a lot of the people who believe um, these narratives that we just heard about, about Sorosyata, about the IMF taking away people's land, I mean, you're much more likely to believe these things if you watched the channels of Viktor Medvedchuk. You're almost twice as likely to believe. You're also almost twice as likely to believe them if you're, you vote for the opposition bloc. So we kind of expect that, you know, that is a world which is already very suspicious of the West, where the identity is often, if not pro-Russian, then open to Russian narratives. So we'd expect that. What's scary and alarming about these narratives is that they're also leaving that space and they're also relatively popular among people in Western Ukraine, especially rural Western Ukraine, people who consider themselves very much against the Kremlin. Now that's interesting. So we need to think about why. And I do think that focus groups, interviews can be helpful because polling only tells us a little bit of the story. It's a very thin way. So we want to talk to people. And, and you can do that through focus groups. So you can just do that as a journalist by talking to people and understanding them and listening to them. And it's very interesting. Look, people, people's reaction to propaganda is not simple, yeah? People will often say, well, I don't quite believe this narrative. This smells like Russian propaganda, but, but, you know, I do believe the world is controlled by dark forces. I do believe that, you know, the Western powers aren't just helping us. They're here for some reason they're not telling us about. A lot of times people would say, there is no sir, biz musholovki. So people are deeply suspicious and it's because of their history. You know, when they look at the IMF, they think of banks from the 1990s that stole their money. It must be the same thing. So you have to understand this experience. You have to understand how deeply it goes. And you have to open up a conversation with people that understands that. You can't just lecture them. You can't just say, here is the truth. You've got to understand why they're worried. Um, in America, we had something very similar in Afro-American communities who uh, didn't want to take the vaccine. It's because they had a terrible experience with the official medical profession really over decades and hundreds of years in Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins University is, um, the Afro-American population were experimented by uh, doctors in the 19th and 20th centuries. There's a memory of that. So you've got to understand that. You've got to work with those things. And you've got to bring people into to a dialogue. Um, you've got to understand people's need for economic and human security. Maybe we should explain that, you know, that the point of the reforms isn't to frighten people and take things away, it's, it's to make them more secure, you know? Um, and it's very important not to lecture people, it's to bring them into fora 
bring them into town hall debates, bring them into online conversations where you can start building that trust. Um, I mean, I don't want to talk for too long, but, but this is a challenge that we face everywhere in the world. Um, and it's a, it's a systemic challenge. The idea that a, a good journalist can come on at 7 p.m. and say, this is the truth, listen to us, that world is gone. There is too much information out there to think that can win. Um, the metaphor of a marketplace of ideas, that the best ideas will somehow magically rise to the top, th that metaphor does not work. We live in a world where we need a new type of journalism, uh, journalism based around engagement, around bringing people into newsrooms, around creating spaces where we talk and listen to them, about offering solutions to the challenges they face, a journalism which is almost a service for people rather than just lecturing down at them. And we need to bring that in. I think we need to urgently introduce that in Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, it's a very interesting point uh, to talk about the um, combination of all these factors. I mean that uh, people feel insecure, uh, there is a lot of information and uh, really the quality journalism is very hard to detect, I mean, for ordinary people. They don't know, uh, there are plenty of different media who to believe. And there are plenty of global players at the so-called disinformation market. We have been talking about Russia, but there is also another player which um, also is like investing a lot of efforts. What about China? Was its disinformation evolving? Has it evolved somehow over the several recent years? Um, we have here at our panel David Schulman, senior advisor at the International Republican Institute who is uh, one of the best experts on uh, the global disinformation and he can tell us about China and its disinformation. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate being here. Um, and I appreciate the chance uh, to talk a bit about China's approach to disinformation and how it fits into the Chinese Communist Party's use of a wide array of tactics to promote its preferred narratives abroad, to tell China's story well as Chinese President Xi Jinping has put it, and to squelch criticism that China's leaders view as threatening to their expanding global interests. And this is a really key point to make at the outset to understand the drivers of China's behavior and how it's different than Russia's. And, and one might ask, you know, how does China, the world's second largest economy now, expanding military, much, much greater strength over the last uh, many years, view such criticism as a threat? And so it, it's critical to understand that information control, control over ideas, are at the very heart of the Chinese Communist Party's concept of security and preservation of its popular legitimacy. And it has been since the party's founding nearly 100 years ago. And so while recently the focus has been mainly internal in this regard, it's a concept that's not bound by national borders. And as China's interests are increasingly global, and as China has a greater capacity to manipulate information spaces, it's doing so. And it's doing so to cultivate the image of a benevolent rising great power, to smooth the path for China's rise to global leadership, to be welcomed rather than criticized by Western democracies, which China perceives as trying to use control over narratives to prevent the emergence of a peer competitor in China. China wants to grab that global megaphone out of the hands of countries like the United States and use it to shape discourse about China. The COVID era has upended all of this. And so with the emergence of this global pandemic in China and the simultaneous mounting of global awareness about China's human rights abuses at home, uh, most notably the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang, Beijing took emergency action to address what it saw as its worst uh, public relations and, and reputational crisis globally since the Tiananmen Square massacre. So as a result, we've seen China really taking a big step in its employment of disinformation abroad. China, of course, has long used disinformation domestically. In recent years, we've seen uh, an aggressive use of disinformation in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, but in the last year and a half, China's demonstrated a newfound willingness to create and amplify disinformation abroad with the goal of discrediting narratives that go against Beijing's messaging aims. So, for instance, disinformation and conspiracy theories to sow confusion about the origins of the pandemic to distract from a focus on China's inability to contain it in, in Wuhan and calls for investigations there 
or a disinformation campaign about the effectiveness of Western vaccines to distract from negative reports about Chinese-made vaccines. These sorts of disinformation efforts are new for China, and thus they're significant on their own, but they're even more concerning viewed in the context of a ramped up propaganda campaign, which may not be strictly disinformation, but manipulates information to discredit Beijing's critics, critics, uh, critics and shift focus from China's problems. In the last year, we've seen China repeatedly employing propaganda on social media, amplified uh, through an army of bots and other tactics, to highlight Western democracies' problems of systemic racism, their struggles to deal with the pandemic, uh, their failure to help other countries with their responses to the pandemic, as evidence that it's hypocritical for them to then criticize China about its own issues around COVID and, and Hong Kong and Xinjiang and what have you. And these efforts on uh, social media are a new element of a much broader effort to manipulate information, not only globally, but within the growing number of countries within uh, where China has strategic interests. So as part of this, China has spent billions of dollars to expand its official propaganda outlets globally. It's also expanded efforts to shape local media um, reporting on China. So this is through content exchanges where you have official propaganda inserted in local media, journalist trainings are trying to encourage local journalists to write positively about China, uh, investment in cash strap media that allows potentially for censorship on China-related news, and a whole host of other uh, different um, techniques. So all combined, these efforts to manipulate content combined to ensure a lack of objective information in countries, not only about China, but also about the activities that China takes in any given individual country that undermine democratic accountability. And so uh, this includes the sort of corruption and elite capture that we that are inherent really to investment just China makes through the Belt and Road Initiative. And so this is obviously really uh, critical in the context of the subject of this uh, conference. Lastly, I just want to note uh, that the manipulation of information that's occurring online, that, that is the digital content layer, is just one aspect of China's growing technological influence in countries. So China's role in everything from information communications, technology infrastructure, uh, you know, cables, wires, 5G, ICT hardware, uh, and also apps and platforms is already amplifying the reach of China's propaganda and presents Beijing with significant amounts of leverage over countries that might want to push back on China's increasing uh, aggressive information manipulation, manipulation efforts. And that leverage only looks set to increase as more countries adapt, China, adapt uh, Chinese tech and standards and you also have uh, countries modeling policy and normative and legal approaches off of China's, whether it's cybersecurity laws, uh, adopting elements of uh, China's great firewall to, to control the internet. Um, and China's content moderation tools are becoming a really big business and could spread Chinese style censorship around the world, allowing all sorts of regimes to filter out political content that they don't like. So in closing, I'll say perhaps just as important for the future of democracy, um, uh, is the content that China uh, and the content that China itself is pushing are these tools that are helping illiberal leaning governments more easily to control their own information spaces in the same way that China does and use Chinese technology and learn from China to more easily deploy their own disinformation to censor inconvenient political content and to move us further toward a world of separate information ecosystems where ruling governments are able to determine the nature of truth in their own spaces. Thank you, David. Very interesting. And using this opportunity, I want to say hello to Ukrainian journalists who travel and uh, write rosy materials about the beautiful life in China and hushing up all the situation with uh, human rights, uh, democratic development, etc. And um, we have seen that everything moves online. A lot is done through social platforms. And we have here a representative of one of the key global social platforms, uh, Katerina Krug, uh, who is the Facebook Regional Public Policy Manager, Central and Eastern Europe. Katerina, how social platforms respond to this disinformation? Do you think that this response is equal to the threat? And do you differ um, your approaches uh, targeting national level challenges like local internal Ukrainian uh, disinformation, then uh, international disinformation? How do you uh, differ this approach? How do you respond? Thank you for your questions. And obviously, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, although online. Uh, 
fingers crossed soon we will be able to meet together in Kyiv. Uh, when it comes to Facebook and when it comes to our strategy to combat online misinformation, uh, I would have to start with a short caveat that we as technological company, we absolutely understand that, first of all, there is no one solution which would um, help us to tackle information or uh, remove misinformation globally. That is why we um, rely on three different approaches, on three different pillars, how we work against misinformation. And on the other hand, we obviously understand our responsibility, but also understand the very soul of the company, which is technology. And fighting misinformation and manipulations quite often is about expertise, meaning that technological companies, big tech players, uh, Facebook obviously being one of them, can't provide the solution to the problem itself. Uh, because of the very way the misinformation is crafted. It is being brought by different pieces of different narratives. Sometimes, as Peter mentioned, uh, bringing on fears, and that is why you need to know the local context very well in order to be able to tackle it. But when it comes to Facebook strategy, it relies on three main pillars. First of all, removing, reducing, and informing. We remove all the information which goes against our community standards, and one of the community standards is about uh, removing information which can cause um, health problems or offline harm. And obviously this is a huge policy approach that we've been doing for more than a year in the context of global pandemic. Uh, and in this context, we have been working very closely with WHO, but also with all leading health organizations around the globe to, to address not only the uh, fake news and misinformation around the, the story itself, but also the conspiracy theories, which are just traveling around the globe. And we really see the global bench, which is being shared in all the different countries, no matter uh, which region they are representing. But also what is important to understand the context of misinformation, it's not always uh, just the information itself, it's also infrastructure, how to share it. Meaning we are talking about the fake accounts. And uh, this also goes against Facebook uh, community standards. And every single day, we remove around 1 million fake accounts at the moment of their creation. And obviously later I will be uh, talking about the so-called troll accounts, basically which aren't created by the machine, uh, but you have real people uh, behind them which conceive their identity and which obviously hide their purpose. And there is very interesting also um, angle to Ukrainian story and obviously how we take the regional um, aspect into their account. When it comes to remove, reducing the distribution of the information, uh, this is an incredibly huge amount of work that we've been doing over the years and this is still very much developing story because we do understand that the techniques are obviously changing uh, and also, obviously, we try and test the policies that we create to, to make sure that they really fit the situation and they can provide as much impact as possible. Uh, obviously, we can remove only a very little fraction of the misinformation under our community standards, but there is a huge amount of um, manipulation, bad content, bad journalism, uh, which still is circulating online. And this is exactly the moment where we as technological company can't assess whether this information is manipulative, how manipulative it is. And this is why we have created the global program of third party fact checking. Uh, and Ukraine is one of our countries where we run this program with two local partners for more than a year. Uh, on the global perspective, we have 80 partners covering uh, more, than, more than 60 languages around the world. And this is how this, the way this program is working is that we uh, provide our partners with a special tool in which they can provide their own signals and obviously the articles they see, but also we engage our artificial intelligence and we collect information that our users have reported as potentially false. And also we use all the different signals that, for example, would be helping us to establish whether this information is potentially false. Our fact checkers, they rate this information and they provide the rating. And this is the rate, this rating actually in, um, influences our algorithm and influences the way we distribute news in the news feed. Uh, just to put it very simple, the more manipulative the news is, the less people will see it. So basically we're hiding it down in the news feed. So one should, should try very hard in order to find this piece of information. And obviously we also apply uh, misinformation labels, uh, warning signals provide vortex information, but I will talk about, um, about it a bit later in the information piece. Now, when it comes to removing, um, to demoting information and working with fact checkers, um, it is important to understand that it's one thing working against the information itself. Another thing is tackling the bad actors who have been sharing it. That is why we have special policies which are addressing the bad actors which uh, are repeatedly sharing the misinformation. And we do understand that they have some specific 
um, intentions behind it, be it the financial motivation, be it political motivation, be it geopolitical one. So um, for many years, we had a policy against pages and groups. Um, for those who have been engaged in sharing misinformation constantly, um, their demo the, the, the distribution of their posts obviously has been significantly limited. Uh, and they would use the ability to monetize or run ads. But a few days ago, I do believe it was last week, we have also uh, strengthened this policy against the individual contributors. So even people who are using signal profiles and who have been sharing misinformation constantly or repeatedly, they will also face the same penalty as pages and groups, meaning that all of their posts will be shown uh, to the less audiences in the newsfeed. So this is also uh, one of the examples how we evolve over time and obviously how we change our policies and our approaches. And with informing people, I already mentioned that the labels, which uh, are incredibly effective. This is the question that we receive in many countries. Why aren't you removing misinformation at all? First of all, uh, Facebook is not the entire internet. Uh, it doesn't mean that if we remove the misinformation on our platform, people won't be uh, able to see it somewhere else. That is why we go in the direction of informing people and educating them and providing them with context and basically arming them against the misinformation. But when it comes to labels, we have checked it last year over the 50 uh, million pieces of content and in 95% of cases, people weren't clicking through. So this is indeed very powerful instrument, which first of all, alarms people that this is misinformation and already arms themselves uh, against this, uh, against the instances of this misinformation on other platforms, but also it shows that people do react to this uh, warning. And obviously something that was um, recently very actively discussed in Ukraine and Ukraine is developing the media literacy campaign this is something that have, we have been doing in other countries, Ukraine included, but also we also see it as a very powerful element of fighting against misinformation on the larger scale. And the last point that I would like to address specifically about Ukraine, and this is um, addressing your question about um, how, we do, how we understand the local perspective. A um, few weeks ago, we have published a report about CAB, Coordinated and Authentic Behavior, and trends that we see globally. And uh, obviously, unfortunately for Ukraine and um, painfully for me as a Ukrainian citizen, uh, Ukraine is in top global ranking, rankings when it comes to CAB activities. So basically, uh, first of all, we have been able to confirm based on our fi findings and based on the networks that we have removed that Ukraine is indeed targeted by Russia a lot or by the networks which are originated in non-government controlled territories in Ukraine. However, Ukraine has another significant problem, being domestic networks, which are quite often, and in most of the cases, tied to political parties, public figures, or PR agencies. And the significant thing that would be also interesting uh, in the context of the corruption and the, you know, the, the wider topics of this conference is that uh, Ukrainian domestic networks have huge spendings. One of the networks that we took down spent more than one and a half million dollars uh, in ads. One of the political parties' networks that we took down spent more than $200,000. Uh, this is huge amounts of money. And obviously, the question that um, probably should be raised in Ukraine is, first of all, where they are coming from and why political parties, first of all, aren't report reporting those spendings. We have created transparency tools when it comes to political advertising. And obviously, we're show show showing this kind of work in the context of the CAB, because the networks which are used by political parties in most of the cases, I used against their political opponents. So this is the way how we all come together into this concept that misinformation quite often is tied maybe not specifically to corruption directly, but definitely to shady interests, to shady money and lack of transparency. Thank you, Katerina. I absolutely agree that this information, misinformation is very uh, directly connected to corruption. And this is why we do need uh, the monopolization, the oligarchization of uh, the media sphere. We need transparent and competent regulation of media sphere. We need media reforms to combat it. And uh, it's really, uh, um, I think, not pleasant for Ukrainian citizens to see Ukraine among the top five countries in the world where the disinformation is really very widespread. And I'm happy to see here Katerina, and I have a big question to YouTube policies, which is very um, closed and very weak in terms of responding to this information. I would like to see next year at this panel representative of YouTube as well as we see here representative of Facebook. And uh, is 
this this information uh, we have seen that it really challenges global democracies. But is it really successful? Maybe we overestimated David Stulik. Uh, how do you think? I, um, David is head of Eastern European program at the European Value Center for Security Pro Policy, Czech Republic. And he's uh, one of the best experts in uh, this uh, foreign policy, disinformation, and media sphere. How do you think, David? Um, we have seen these different uh, aspects, uh, different players, different responses to the disinformation. Uh, are they really successful? Good day. I believe they are successful, if only short time, and they aren't always effective. Now I would like to share a more positive story with you, because I have a sentiment that the experts in Ukraine are often limited and uh, torturing themselves by focusing on the negative uh, dimensions of disinformation. And I would like to do the contrary. I would like to focus, if subjectively, on the positive. The first thing I wanted to say is that it's not true that Ukraine is losing out in the information warfare. To the contrary, it's winning in the information war. You can ask any European in Europe today whether Ukraine is a fascist country, if it's a junta. No, the Europeans would not have that impression. We should never generalize. Surely there would be people who would hold that belief, but they are a minority. The next point I wanted to make is that even the European institutions and the EU use a notion called aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Let me tell you how difficult it was in 2014 to persuade the colleagues from Brussels that Russia is a direct aggressor against Ukraine. That was a major undertaking. But we see that this narrative is very different from the Russian one being about the civilian conflict has become mainstream, even in the discourse and statements of the key European institutions. And now I'd like to focus on two key factors. First is the time, and the second is the audience. The time is on our side. The time is doing the fact checking, is doing the reality checking when you can check the narratives, you can test the disinformation propagated by Russia or China. The second factor is the audience. We shouldn't think that the European audience is a dumb one. They can think critically as well. They can also assess facts about what's happening in Ukraine and around Russia and their assessment and critical thinking also come into play, and they are in favor of the objective truth and objective facts. So, going back to the question of how successful they are, they can succeed short time in a limited time span. The information is disseminated momentarily through the social platforms and modern media, and it's very difficult to respond to it, but the time is on our side. We know the key narratives are pumped by Russia. We are ready to come up with the counter arguments to rebut the facts. And it's not only for the independent media to play a role, but also the government, the different think tanks, analytical tanks. Uh, countering hybrid threats that can propose the arguments. In Czech, there's a major concern about history, but the Russian narratives promote the thesis like the Soviet army liberated Czech, and we keep discovering that it wasn't just them. There was the American army as well, and there was the army that was uh, uh, held by the traitor party, by General Vlasov army. And on the 9th of May, we keep he hearing the same phrase that the Czechs are ungracious. They underestimate the role of the Soviet army, but uh, we have developed our own arguments. The historians have have joined the ranks, and now these arguments are 
coming into the mainstream politics, and they have greater sway than the Russian arguments. The second case is about the Sputnik. This was a vaccine that became the vaccine, part of the vaccination diplomacy. During the first wave, we've seen a simultaneous disinformation a launch of a phrase that EU has given up on you and that uh, um, EU isn't helping you. And we're seeing the second and the third wave of vaccination and the level of trust of people in the EU is on the increase. So in the time when we could make the reality check, when we've seen that the European Commission is buying the vaccine, distributing it fairly, and in time we've seen that Sputnik isn't well documented, isn't checked, isn't properly um, uh, authenticated. The only thing in common is the name. And when we've looked at the facts, this disinformation narrative proposed by Russia and uh, China simply crumbled. So the fact of time is a key one. And the third important point is that in Ukraine, it's part of the self-torture two-way. You have to be careful not to become an instrument for Russian propaganda and a Western propaganda against European countries. And here I'd like to reiterate, if you have heard me say, I apologize, but let me say it again. I would often hear on a daily basis here today that how could it happen that the pro-Russian Czech has suddenly become anti-Russia? No, Czech has never been pro-Russia. When I keep saying it, they would tell me, but your president stopped that just one person. Yes, he was democratically elected, but let us be clear that indeed has, he's become a true instrument for the Russian propaganda. And the first time after the recent history with the explosions at the ammunition depot, the Czech society has come to the understanding. For the first time during his cadence, 52% of the people believe that he was upholding the interests of the Russian Federation and not upholding the interests of the Czech. Let me repeat some statements made by Mr. Horan. 66% of Czech people feel that Russia poses a threat to its national security, and the numbers have remained unchanged. But the President Zeman is used in the Russian media, and from the Russian media, the information is pumped into Ukraine. The Russian media pick it up, the press agencies pick up the baton, and yes, the President made a statement. But it creates an impression that the Czechs are pro Russian. So you really have to think critically and uh, think who says what and why. If it took a week to prepare a response to the situation around the explosions, some journalists asked their colleagues to share the information about what the president was going to say, but not invite him to different talk shows, not give him more media space, as it was clear in whose favor he was playing. The time has all put has put it all right, has crossed all I's and dotted all T's. And that is a very important point. It's very important that the audience isn't dumb, that the time is on our side, is on the side of the truth, and that these disinformation narratives lose out their momentum with time. Thank you. It's a very interesting question indeed. Time is a factor. Sometime left, later we have seen that things are not the way Russian propaganda portrayed it. But sometimes we don't have the time. This time during the military escalation near the Ukrainian border in April, we looked at the ways of training journalists so that they could work in the military conflict zone safely. What do you do if the propaganda narrative is quickly transformed when propaganda resonates with what is happening in the world and it injects ever more new topics undermining trust? to reform tr faith in democracy, uh, faith in the partnership with the Western institutions. I give the floor to Lubov Sobolska, head of the Center of Strategic Communication and Information Security in Ukraine that was created 
this year in Ukraine and in the Ministry uh, of Information Policy. Lubov, so you start talking uh, about the part of what can be done. I would take a helicopter view and then narrow down gradually. This is what we know. Misinformation is in place, but hybrid war is a comprehensive thing. We know the types of influences and interferences. There are seven or eight types of way to influence. One of them is military uh, interference, cyber attacks, pro-Russian media and social media. And this is the uh, policy, policy, both on the central level and the regional level. So this is the church and also the far right and far left. And uh, this is characteristic not so much of Ukraine as of the European countries. And finally, the civil society organizations. We know that Russia is operating across all those dimensions. Talking about countering just misinformation is to no avail. We need to look at all this Hydra, the multi headed Hydra. When Hercules chopped off one head, two more grew. So so if you only fight one dimension, there's no way we are to prevail. Remember what happened not so long ago next to the U.S. Embassy, where Ilya Kiva led people who allegedly freed Ukraine from external governance. We are well aware that this was uh, shown on many TV channels, not only on pro-Russian Medvedchuk channels. Many people showed things, uh, many channels showed things as they were. This is not even disinformation, but this is the influence of Russia. And if we scrutinize Surkov leaks, you know exactly how Russia is working with activists by organizing this type of spectacle. Therefore, we need to work across the board, across all dimensions, and look at the funding for the agents of influence, not only fighting some pockets um, of narratives. Even Europe, oh, sorry, David, uh, even Europe that was some years ago was talking only about misinformation, not even that, in terms of Russia, when they were talking about Sputnik and Russia today. There was no mention that the local TV also push the Russian narrative forward. Finally, now there's talk about the Russian advancing their interest in each of the European countries in terms of energy or diplomacy or culture or eco economy. Therefore, we need to address the problem at the root cause and at the same time working with all those dimensions. As far as this information is concerned, I believe it's worth noting and mentioning the strategic communication agenda. It is often said, oh, this is false, this is not true, but Russia is using and addressing internal vulnerabilities. But there are so many subjects which Russia can attack. Therefore, even as we counter these enemy narratives, we must suggest something else. We must come up with our own agenda. Hence, the importance of consolidated effort. But I'm sure that the government cannot do it alone. No matter what positive narrative the government comes up, unless it's picked up and supported and upheld by the media and the citizens, it will never succeed. Uh, what uh, is good news to me is that over the last year, these organizations that research disinformation, propaganda, stand together in Ukraine. A, a group was created under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was a group of civil society organizations. Currently, we have 
created the um, Center for Strategic Communication and Information Security. We haven't produced that many deliverables as of now, but we have created a brochures, but then we were aware that escalation is possible and that the citizens are not ready for that in terms of information preparation. So now we're putting together a leaflet for Ukrainian citizens. What do you do in case of war? What do you do in case of emergency? One of the benefits of this leaflets is that it has this section on information space, on the do and do nots in the information sp space. And we developed it jointly with the civil society groups. And this brings me back to a word that has been overused recently. However, it remains very much relevant, S uh, sustainability. A country cannot be sustainable and resilient unless its people is resilient. And resilience is only reached through these consolidated effort. And I'm so proud to say that uh, the Ukrainian Elves project was launched. The Ukrainian Elves are working locally with the community. They are training local activists. More and more civic groups come together, journalists come together, and as the government is joining effort with the civil society, paved the way for successful combating of corruption. And I echo what David said, he always said, but this needs to be reiterated. The Russian, uh, the Russian propaganda is very repetitive, and that's why it's successful, so we should do the same. Uh, Russia is targeting our unity, and this is a message for us. This is what needs to be done. There is a need for greater cohesion as opposed to further division. We can say that Ukraine is at the front line of Russian disinformation. We are constantly looking for ways to address that and to tackle that and probably we will become the experts on the subject. Yeah, and one very small addition, Oksanta. What's important is not to lose faith. <laughs> what Russia is doing is trying to make us stop resisting, trying to make us feel tired and exhausted. As soon as we are exhausted, it's going to be way easier to conquer us. Therefore, we need to keep our spirits up all the time, inspiring each other. Lubov, what do you see? Uh, we see the increased amount of disinformation uh, in the world. We see that the narratives are changing, at least as far as Russia is concerned. There is a surge on injects attacking the West specifically. And we see this shift towards online space. How can this be tackled only by joining efforts? Hence, my question, what synergy do we have to offer at the international level? So far, what I've heard from this panel discussion is that both Russia and China are basically going the same direction by undermining trust to the European democracy, to the US democracy, to international institutions. Uh, we almost come, have come to the end of this panel, therefore I invite every panelist. You have one minute or maximum a minute and a half. Two key statements. What is to be done to provide a consolidated response to misinformation? What should we do together, probably? Natalia? I believe it's very important that uh, our country and international partners uh, initiate a change in the legislation that would bolster financial transparency in the media, that would bolster and prevent the existence of these platform of disinformation that have that should have been stopped 
exist long ago, but they, st they persisted thanks to lack of transparency in funding. funding. First. Second, we need to call and urge our international partners and the Ukrainian governments to support the quality media. There are different methods, but I'm talking about quality journalism, because ever so often, even the telegram channels are created by the government to snuff out internal opposition uh, as opposed to fighting international disinformation. And the other thing, effort should be undertaken to bring together small and medium enterprises and businesses. They sometimes advertise platforms for disinformation. So sometimes they, these need to be supported by some sort of grants and efforts should be consolidated in certain international structures. Disinformation through this conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Yes. Uh, can you hear us? Sorry, I lost the audio for a second. Was that to me? Yes. I, uh, please, very short. What can be done to build resilience to this disinformation? So there's, there's, there's at least there's two levels we need to think about. And I think Natalia already started to talk to them. One of them is a regulatory level. Um, Facebook have taken, have made some initial efforts to define what we mean by disinformation. They talk about it in terms of coordinated, inauthentic behavior. The stress is on the behavior, not the content. I think this is the right way forward. We do need to define what this is that we're fighting and and there should be legal measures taken against this not against speech but in the types of campaign that are launched this creating of millions of accounts with no punishment that should become illegal that should become illegal internationally and nationally local parties shouldn't do it and foreign forces should definitely not be able to do it yeah so not regulating speech not regulating content but regulating the amplification and the spread of it. That can be regulated, yeah? yeah? So that's the regulatory part. And the other part, as Natalia says, is, is, is boosting good communication. But what do we mean by that? I think the heart of it is understanding audiences better than the propagandists, and then engaging them in ways which are transparent, which are democratic. We're in a race with the propagandists, you know. They want to understand people, understand our traumas, understand society's vulnerabilities, and then manipulate them like a, like a cult leader who works out your weaknesses and then messes with you. We have to be like psychotherapists. We also have to understand audiences and then start talking about these issues. Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you because I really have uh, little time. Please, David, do you think that uh, regulation is the answer? to this um, struggle against like Chinese disinformation, what can be done to build resilience? Sorry, was that a question to me? I've been having trouble with audio as well. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, I have a question to David Schulman. Uh, can, what can you hear me? Yes. Uh, what can uh, be done to build resilience to a global disinformation players? Uh, uh, do you have any well, recommendations to us? Just very sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I lost audio for a few minutes, so I don't want to repeat what's already been said. But I would just say, in the in the China space in particular, um, because it is different the way in which China is going about uh, information operations generally, and because China's drivers are different than than Russia's and other actors, it's really important for uh, folks in individual countries to understand and have an understanding of how the Chinese Communist Party operates and how it seeks to shape the information space. Uh, in countries and globally. And so I think that's number one, is making sure that we build up uh, the level of understanding in countries uh, about, about how China operates. You can see in countries where there is a significant level of understanding around the Chinese Communist Party in places like the Czech Republic, in places like Australia, and certainly in places like Taiwan, um, there is a better level of resilience against what China is trying to do in the information space in those countries because there are people who are ready uh, to identify what China is doing and to expose it. And then the second piece, which I know uh, has already been mentioned, um, is making sure that you have a really healthy core of independent investigative media and journalists who are looking into what's happening. And so that's related, right? It's not just looking at, okay, that's disinformation because it's potentially you know, fairly obvious. 
it's looking at uh, the broader swath uh, of information manipulation efforts that I mentioned uh, earlier uh, around shaping the media space, around shaping the academic space, uh, around elite capture, uh, so that the ground is not laid for, um, for China to basically be able to walk in and shape an information space without people exposing it uh, and being ready uh, to talk yes. about what to counter. Uh, thank you very much. And that uh, awareness and the inoculation piece are both critical. Yeah. Uh, Katarina Kruk, how do you think, uh, can uh, Facebook do something better to fight with this information? Like, uh, you already flag uh, misinformation, but uh, what about supporting high quality media, putting them higher, turning attention to quality information? And uh, what about creating like regional departments on, um, that would uh, coordinate better probably with uh, local legislation? Very short. It's a very long question to request a very short answer. Uh, to put it very briefly, when it comes to Facebook, we do have journalism programs. However, it's quite a challenge to scale them. So uh, we have news tab, we have um, also news index when we uprank the quality media. However, it's really very hard to work on those lists. And this is the program that we currently have in, current, in, in few countries around the world, but obviously we have a plan to expand it as well. So sooner or later, it will be available in other countries and in Ukraine as well. It's just the question is that this is a huge amount of work to understand whether we are taking all the analysis which is available into account and how, um, how we are able to support the quality journalism. So this is something that I would say is in the making. Uh, about the regional coordination, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe in recent years we don't feel a lack of coordination between Facebook and Ukrainian activists and Ukrainian institutions. So this is also the sign how a company has heard the request from Ukraine and appointed a person, basically created um, a position which would um, be this channel of communication between Ukraine and, uh, and, and Facebook. But also it's important to understand we have many different divisions and it's up to Ukrainians to actively seek contacts with Facebook and share your ideas. Because um, just very briefly on what can be done generally from the Facebook's perspective, we do value incredibly local initiatives. And Facebook in, um, fact checking is one of those examples when uh, this very effective program wouldn't be available and wouldn't be possible without the local expertise and local organizations. So this is very important, just invest in local NGOs, invest in local fact checking. But also I do second the, the thoughts about regulations because Facebook can only do um, work on our platforms. We can't go, go offline, we can't go on different platforms. And obviously our reach is very much limited. But uh, as Luba very rightly mentioned, uh, and also, as other speakers mentioned as well, um, the problem is very much multi-layered and requires multi-layered responses. Just the latent information won't put a stop on the behavior and on the bad actor's motivation. Yeah. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, David Stulik, uh, please, very short. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, David Stulik, if you give us the interest in European response. I wanted to say a few words about how we can build the resilience of the society, how we can hide information security, and that is to support the critical thinking and media awareness. I can see it uh, illustrated with my children who are attending primary school, and they are starting lectures, uh, teaching children media awareness, media literacy, how hybrid threats uh, operate, and that is a very important component. The second element that was mentioned in the context of China is to investigate, conduct journalist investigations to crack and delegitimize the proponents of propaganda, see where they're fronted from. And I have good news to hear that the Czechs have launched the process already. And the last thing that's important to be done in Ukraine is important to leverage your diaspora. There are wonderful Ukrainian students studying in Czech. There's a great embassy, and you delegate some of the work to the local experts, to the local agencies that can do the share work in um, uh, consort with the Ukrainians, and the synergy is in our unity. Thank you, David. And I would like to ask Luba Sumulska to recap this panel for us. So what are the solutions out there for us? 
I wanted to make another comment as a side note then we should start noticing the elephant in the room called the oligarchical media. It can't be that a group of tycoons with political vested interests would shape the picture of the world for the Ukrainians, especially if the Ukrainians are under un stopping attack of the Russian neighbor as they pave their way, in, way into Europe. So we need to be focusing on this topic. We shouldn't tolerate the fact. Secondly, talking about our joint response, about what do we do so that we stand with the West in it. No one wants to appear weak. It's not right evolutionary or want to side with the strong ones. So it's important for Ukraine to learn to show off its strengths and to reform our vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Uh, talking of our strengths, we've gained unprecedented expertise in so many areas, and it's important not to denigrate ourselves, but instead show off our strengths, and then the West will join our ranks and protect us. Thank you, Luba, and thanks all the participants of the panel and our viewers today. Let's pull our ranks and stand united as we combat disinformation. Corruption is probably the most known word in Ukraine, but what do Ukrainians think about corruption? Let's have a closer look at the data from the recent anti-corruption poll to find the answers. For 75% of Ukrainians, corruption remains one of the top concerns, while 63% believe it is highly prevalent in society. Simultaneously, Ukrainians are intolerable of corruption. The share of those who think it should not be justified hits 75%. When asked about corruption, most of Ukrainians think first of all grand and political corruption hidden in the offices of the deputies and top officials. Still, the share of those who think that the prevalence of corruption throughout governmental bodies, with the exception of police, has dropped. But in real life, the share of those who admitted to have faced corruption personally during the previous 12 months fell to 16%. COVID and less contact among people oust traditional person-official interactions. Across the country, experiences of corruption differ from obelisk to obelisk. Only in seven obelisks, respondents reported increased levels of corruption, while the rest claimed the same or lower levels. Who has the will to overcome corruption? Citizens, media, and NGOs. However, many are discouraged as they feel anti-corruption fatigue and think their efforts are futile. More than a half vest responsibility for countering corruption in the president and his office. Ukrainians are increasingly confident that this is the responsibility of the specialized anti-corruption bodies like the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, National Agency for Prevention of Corruption, or the Higher Anti-Corruption Court. Feel this is incomplete? Get a bigger picture at engage.org.ua. Corruption, as radiation knows no borders. Corruption is equally invisible. However, it erodes society, killing us on a daily basis. Last year, during the Chernobyl disaster anniversary, our conference had to take place for the first time. It was called Zero Corruption Conference. Kyiv would bring together different guests and they would visit Chernobyl. Because of coronavirus, the plans had to be changed. And this year we meet in this hybrid dual setup. But I think we shall revive the idea someday. A year ago, we started interna an international poster contest. We partnered with this legendary Design, designers association that is called the, for, the fourth block. The topic of the contest was corruption as a safety threat. They covered environment, digitalization, professional across the world responded to our call. We received a total of 1,300 posters painted by 450 designers, artists, 
showed their visions from Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and naturally Ukraine. And today we are willing to present you the best artworks of this international contest. And we have a special guest today. And it will, the contest will be accompanied, but the youngest uh, DJ from Ukraine, when DJ Crystal was as little as 10 years old, she set the record as being the youngest DJ in this country. So let's look at the presentation and listen to modern Ukrainian music. Wait. 
position Who I am It is a question Who you are So many questions I cannot answer But no one thing One thing These are incredible works, and thank you for the sublime music. DJ Crystal, thank you. For the sake of this generation, we are tackling corruption and combating other threats to our democracy. As a reminder, if you'd like to print these artworks or create stickers, you can find them on the, set, on the website of the Anti-Corruption Action Center or on the website of this conference. We shall upload all the videos of all the panel discussions. You can re-watch them, you can re-listen to the messages sent by foreign partners. And now I would like us to see another pre-recorded message from US Senator Ben Cardin. Hi, I'm Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. I serve as chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, and I am the author of the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. I am grateful to be with you today at the Zero Corruption Conference. This conference is emblematic of the strength of the Ukrainian civil society, which remains Ukraine's greatest asset in on its ongoing fight with corruption. Russia uses corruption to undermine Ukraine's democratic development. The strategic corruption cannot be fought solely by Ukraine, but also must be confronted by all who stand for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And it's not just Ukraine that is targeted by the strategic corruption of dictators. Russia has applied these same tactics to many other countries, as has China. It's imperative that the United States and our allies fight back. This means building a more resilient financial and legal system at home targeting kleptocrats abroad, and helping other countries build the rule of law. To fight back against strategic corruption, we in the United States Congress have adopted an agenda that emphasizes transparency, accountability, and responsiveness. Some of our greatest tools for accountability are Magnitsky sanctions. These sanctions on the worst human rights abusers and most corrupt kleptocrats block bad actors from our shores and financial systems, and provide a measure of justice to victims of kleptocracy. Magnitsky sanctions are particularly potent against strategic corruption, since they can disable the oligarchs and cronies who are often the vehicles for it. These sanctions have also seen wide adoption by Canada, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, although the European Union has yet to adopt corruption sanctions. Transparency is also critical and sorely lacking. Too often, kleptocrats are successful in brushing their crimes under the rug. That is why I introduced in the United States the Combating Global Corruption Act. This bill would mandate that the State Department create a tiered ranking of countries based on their compliance with anti-corruption commitments. This list would name and shame leaders of countries that are not doing enough to fight corruption and authorize sanctions against those leaders in the lowest tier for whom corruption is not an anomaly, but a form of governance. Finally, responsiveness is key. 
Sadly, U.S. rule of law aid has often been stuck in technical multi-year programs, not fit to fight the rapid tactics of strategic corruption. The Countering Russia and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Crook Act, which I also introduced in the United States Senate, would change that. The Crook Act creates an anti-corruption action fund financed by a charge on companies guilty of paying bribes to foreign officials that will collect these prevention payments over time in order to surge these resources during historic windows of opportunity for reform, like the 2014 Revolution of Dignity right here in Ukraine. In addition to these bills, I am proud to announce that the United States Helsinki Commission will soon form a bipartisan caucus against foreign corruption and kleptocracy. Congress is leading the way in recognizing corruption as a national security threat and creating the tools needed to fight it. We look forward to working with our allies to curb corruption's corrosive influence. Thank you for having me, and I wish you a productive conference. Once again, our guests reiterate that corruption is the key threat to national security, not just of the United States, but also of Ukraine and other countries. And now we are moving on to three blitz panels, which are united by the same subject, which is searching the response to weaponization of corruption in hybrid warfare. In the first section of this panel, our speakers are going to discuss the recovery of assets um, obtained in an illegal way. Today we already talked about this together, uh, and we are going to discuss it more with NABU Director Artem Sitnik. In the second section, our speakers are going to speak about declaration of assets with Alexander Novikov of the NACP. And in the third part, we are going to talk about the tools of uh, fighting against uh, transport their corruption and uh, please get ready for this marathon. Um, the moderator of the first section will be Greta Fenner, the executive director of Basel Institute of Governance uh, and the director of International Center for Assets Recovery. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, moderating this first uh, Blitz panel in a marathon. We are going to talk about investigating transborder corruption and recovering stolen assets. And I have a wonderful panel with me. To my left, Artem Sitnik, who truly needs absolutely no introductions in Ukraine and more widely in the world. He's, of course, the director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau in uh, Ukraine. Also with me, but on uh, the screen behind me, really, is the one and only Mary Butler, who is a, a career anti-corruption prosecutor, also someone very well known and a good friend to Ukraine here. She heads the Department of Justice's Kleptocracy anti uh, Asset Recovery Initiative, and as I said, has been closely involved in supporting Ukraine for many years. I believe also on the screen behind me, I have Ambassador uh, Roger Dubach, uh, also an old friend of mine, career diplomat in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, where he is currently the Deputy Director of the Directorate for Public International Law and heads something that's rather unique in Switzerland, namely the Asset Recovery Task Force, which is hosted in the Federal Department for Foreign Affairs. Blitz talk means quick answers. Artem, the first one to you. Um, at last count, I understand there are something like 19 parliamentary initiatives trying to get you out of your job. And in my books, that can mean only one of two things. Either you're doing a terrible job and they really need to get rid of you for NABU to finally flourish, or you're doing a very good job and people are scared of you. Tell me what it is. Well, actually, the assessment of our work, if we speak about legislative requirements, 
uh, and whether we work effectively or not should be um, answered by the audit, which is uh, carried out every year as prescribed by the law. But uh, for some reason, the government always um, refuses to use this option for oversight of the Bureau. And the Parliament uh, tries to achieve a change of leadership in the Bureau instead. Why does this happen? It happens because uh, even though uh, we have uh, had a long time since the revolution of dignity and the establishment of the anti-corruption infrastructure, political elites are not ready uh, for the fact that there is an anti-corruption system in the country which uh, oversees you regardless of where you work and what position you hold. If we speak briefly about the results that were achieved uh, together by uh, prosecutors, detectives and judges, in the short time that we exist, uh, we have had six ministers and their deputies brought to uh, justice, 11 heads of executive agencies, over 60 judges, and I think this creates a major problem for um, the authorities, and that leads to attempts to block our work. And this um, is not only about the Anti-Corruption Bureau, but the anti-corruption system in general instead. Uh, on uh, Friday, we had the 10th real conviction, uh, and this uh, is a big problem for everyone. So then we get the situation when we are trying to be stopped all the time. Thank you, Artem. So domestically, clearly, um, the situation is already very difficult, but many of the cases that NABU is investigating are international in nature, which doesn't make life much easier, of course. So um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience working with other countries, because the topic of this session is international investigation. Um, are the other countries helping you? Are, are the other countries helping NABU? Are they helping Ukraine? And one of, one of, what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the major challenges that you're facing when you're tracing assets internationally? Well, this is a highly urgent issue because without international cooperation, I believe we cannot speak about effective fight against corruption in the first place. We have worked together for uh, quite a while, for multiple years, and you know that uh, we work uh, internationally to uh, disrupt corruption schemes. You speak about uh, the misappropriation of public funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and laundering fights outside the country. We do have issues here because those uh, uh, people who obtain assets illegally, they Mm, don't trust their country and they want those assets to be stored abroad. So in order to carry out the complete investigation, we often work with our international partners. We calculate that in the six years of our work, we sent uh, uh, requests on assist, international assistance to 75 countries across the globe. So you can imagine the scope of corruption in Ukraine and number of uh, countries which were somehow involved in the flow of corrupt assets. We sent most of our requests to Germany, to the UK, to the United States, to Latvia, and some other countries as well. Thankfully, from the uh, very beginning, the NABU obtained the right of independent transnational cooperation with our partners, because now we see a certain resistance from other law enforcement agencies when it comes to international cooperation. That is why it's very important, essential, that we have the right to approach our international partners independently, and we do use this right. We constantly develop a memorandum on uh, cooperation, and if we speak about examples of such cooperation. Uh, recently, we had um, the first anti-corruption operation in the history of Ukraine together with our Polish colleagues when an international investigatory group was established, which uh, investigated the former head of Ukraftodor. Currently, uh, this uh, person is being investigated in Poland, and we continue our work. We believe this uh, experience to be successful, just as was our experience with uh, cooperation with our Swiss colleagues concerning an investigation of a former MP. And it was a very positive cooperation, as assessed by our detectives. These are just some examples that uh, I believe mm, are definitely not exhaustive, and we constantly develop our cooperation further. 
Well, thank you, Artem, and congratulations. I mean, what you just described is, is clearly a very proactive stance by NABU, including what you describe as a joint investigation with uh, the Polish colleagues. And one point that I would like to stress, which is globally important, is the ability of a national anti-corruption bureau to act independently when it comes to mutual legal assistance and international cooperation in order not to add a potential layer of undue influence in the work of what an agency needs to be able to do independently. You mentioned the cooperation with, uh, with Switzerland and you mentioned it very positively, so let me turn to, to our colleague, Ambassador Dubach. Roger, um, we know, and it's been in the media, and uh, Artem has referred to it, there are assets that are suspected to have been stolen from Ukraine on the previous regimes and that have been found in Switzerland. Can you tell us a little bit how, you know, the various ways in which Switzerland can assist a country like Ukraine, both in terms of the legal framework, but also maybe some of the good practices that Switzerland has, has developed, which a country like Ukraine can make use of and has possibly done so? Thank you very much for, for the question, uh, Greta, and many thanks also for the invitation today. Uh, I have prepared a very short slide, uh, which I would like to share with you. If possible, you could uh, put it on the screen. I don't know. Um, where I try to explain very shortly the Swiss legal framework <laughs> and with the example of, uh, of, of the, the work we, done, we have done with Ukraine. Um, we'll have to see if it works. Otherwise, I can try to share my screen <coughs> with this, if you prefer that. Okay. No, that's a NASA, NASA presentation. Oh, that's the wrong slide, yes. We are seeing um, Artem Sitnik's slide. Do we have Ambassador Dubach's slide? Otherwise, Roger, you might just have to speak to us about it. Roger, are you still there? <laughs> okay, I'm a bit lost here. <laughs> um, Roger, can you hear us still? Okay. Let's see what's happening because we are looking for both uh, panelists who are supposed to be on the screen as well as the slide and it's just Artem and me. I'm sure we have interesting things we can talk about as well. Uh, I don't know where the conference organizers are. Apologies for this technical glitch that I am, which is a little bit out of my control. Someone seems to be coming. Mm. Is it just us? I will speak to Mr. Sitnik now. Well, Artem, let's be ca spontaneous in our conversation. I think uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you more towards the end of the conversation, but let's take it now, is um, if you had this one wish or th what, what more, I mean, you've been speaking very positively about your experience internationally, but what more could international partners do uh, to assist Ukraine? Is there, is there anything that you keep talking about or you keep thinking this would be really helpful, maybe in the global legal framework or practically in terms of collaboration? Yes, of course, uh, having experience of uh, cooperation with our international partners, we often speak uh, not only about uh, sp uh, specific criminal cases, but we also uh, speak about the improvement of the system at some point, because there are some traditional problems which are encountered by all law enforcement agencies, not just in Ukraine, but uh, worldwide, for example, the offshore areas where uh, the money ends up in, ta in those taxes 
havens. And um, when we speak about uh, countries like Panama, we uh, wait for international orders for a year or more to get that information available. Of course, that negatively affects the criminal proceedings that happen. And I think that um, the system of international cooperation was formed quite long ago, which is the problem. Those people who use corruption schemes have uh, completely different tools. They can use the internet, they use modern technologies, and that's what they use to impl uh, implement those corruption schemes in multiple countries at once. But then we use those old mechanisms and we have to wait for responses for a long time. So I think it's an urgent issue to optimize international cooperation to make it more rapid, more efficient. I can compare, you know, for instance, the cooperation mm, uh, in the format of uh, police information exchange. This is much more efficient because it happens rapidly and we have the result pretty much immediately. But if we speak about uh, judicial uh, persecution, we need to maintain a very strict procedure, which uh, takes quite a lot of time. And we face the pressure to recover in progress. So I think that um, um, we do have over 120 million dollars, 8 million euros, uh, millions of Swiss francs uh, uh, seized abroad, so we could uh, recover all those assets to Ukraine. Thank you, Artem. And I think I couldn't agree more with you that it's very frustrating how criminals are fast in cooperating internationally and law enforcement is extremely slow. So there's. There's a real call for the international community to find a way to modernize uh, formal judicial cooperation. And I'm sure Mary would, would agree that sometimes it's a little bit um, frustratingly slow. Mary, you're back with us, I believe. You can hear us, I trust. Um, welcome back, Mary. I, I, I will, Thank you. I will move on to you, if I may, since we've got you back. It was a little bit of a, of a technological glitz here. But um, you're a career, an, uh, a career prosecutor specialized in anti-corruption, and I may say one of the top-notch ones in the United States. Tell us what is so difficult investigating international corruption. Why does it take so long? What's so hard about it? And, and also, in your experience with Ukraine, what do you think Ukraine has been doing really well in these last few years, trying to chase Yanukovych and other assets? and where maybe you think there could be more done in Ukraine from your experience and seeing it from the outside. Thanks so much, uh, Greta, and I'm, I apologize for the technological uh, challenge here. Um, the, I guess the most, um, it, uh, as you say, I oversee a, a uh, asset recovery program in the United States. We're focused on trying to recover assets linked to foreign corruption that affect the U.S. financial system. Uh, we have uh, tried to do um, a fair amount of work in Ukraine, and we um, are, I think, having um, some success there. Um, the main tool that we use is um, money laundering uh, violations coupled with non-conviction-based forfeiture. And the beauty of non-conviction-based forfeiture is we can use this tool um, whether or not uh, the people are in the United States, the true owners of the assets, whether or not uh, they're dead, whether or not they've transferred the assets to nominees or relatives. So, so it's potentially a very powerful tool. The problem is um, that our government, and like most governments in the world, requires that we establish that there's a financial transaction that affects the United States and a link to an underlying crime, the criminal origin of the asset. And that's the challenge. The identifying the financial transaction is usually relatively simple. It gets easier with beneficial ownership disclosure, but it's relatively simple. The challenge is in obtaining sufficient evidence of the misappropriation, the bribery, the embezzlement, or the bank fraud. And here is the real challenge, the evidence of these crimes is usually in the country where the crime occurred. And these are crimes committed in secret by people who want to keep this activity secret. 
And these kinds of investigations are difficult in any circumstances, but especially in a situation where there is very little political will uh, to attempt to address it. Now, despite that, um, we have worked with some very good partners who have very professionally conducted these investigations in their own country, while we, in parallel, uh, conduct them in ours. So, so this is a real, um, the real hard part. This is what takes the most time and the most dedication. And how about your experience in Ukraine? How would you describe uh, what you've seen in terms of, you know, investigative practice, or 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 also how they engage internationally with partners like the United States? Is there things where you feel like, okay, you're, you've made lots of progress here, but we need more of this or of that in Ukraine? Um, I, in general, I would say that um, our experience with these institutions, which have been set up since the Dignity Revolution, the NABU, the SOP, the um, high anti-corruption courts, um, from our perspective, are doing an amazing job in a very short period of time. And our experience in working with NABU has shown that there are some very talented, very uh, smart, dedicated professionals who seem to be doing their work at a very high level. And so this is all very, very promising. And obviously, we hope we'll be contributing uh, to our ultimate success. Uh, I guess um, what is so hard to watch about Ukraine is that uh, these very important institutional reforms um, which have um, been put into place. Um, it took almost as much energy to put them into place as it does to stop them from being unraveled. And this um, is painful, I'm sure, for these courageous people who, who helped to build the institutions. But we'll hang in there um, and do what we can uh, to support Ukraine and to try to recover uh, some more significant assets. Mary, I'm going to be a bit spontaneous here because we've lost Roger. He's still not back with us as far as I can tell. So I'll just, uh, no, we do have him back. Wonderful. So Mary, I'll I'm keep, back. Uh, I'll keep yeah. my surprise question. Roger, I'm sorry, it seems that your slide's not coming through. Would you mind just talking us through uh, what you were going to say about how Switzerland can assist other countries uh, in recovering stolen assets? Of course, and I am sorry for the deconnection, but uh, I don't know what happened. Um, yes, so just very briefly, oh, there's the slide now, that's perfect. Um, I would just very briefly uh, explain the Swiss legal framework and this with the example of Ukraine. So, um, in 22nd February 2014, the Ukrainian parliament voted to impeach President Yanukovych, and just four days later, the Swiss government decided to freeze all assets in Switzerland belonging to former president Yanukovych and his entourage. And so this uh, freeze was thanks to uh, what we call a PEP Act, <laughs> which allows to very quickly freeze assets if there's a regime change or, or other um, changes. And this gives the basis for a judicial cooperation. And you see that below uh, the, the box of asset, the assets frozen. And so perhaps once again, this PEP Act allows to freeze very quickly and gives finally time for a new government and new authorities to engage in a judicial cooperation. And this happened between Switzerland and Ukraine. Uh, there has been this cooperation between 2014 and 2020. And Switzerland was able to transmit to Ukraine evidence on the assets located in Switzerland. Um, if you go one box further, then you see the judgment in Ukraine. So. Uh, to restitute finally, it's absolutely crucial that there will be final judgments uh, rendered by the Ukrainian um, judiciary uh, in order to confiscate the assets and then to restitute them. And there is a time limit. Um, we are able to freeze assets for 10 years. You see that in the first box. And so it means that we should be able to restitute until 2024, which gives us another three years. And we really hope that we will be able um, 
to restitute those assets within this time limit. One word about the, the practice. Um, uh, I think it's important to realize that it's, every state has its own legal order and that for the cooperation to be fruitful, a mutual understanding of the requirements and expectations of the other state must be developed. In the case of Ukraine, Switzerland decided to support financially a third party, the International Center for Asset Recovery, to act as a bridge builder between the Swiss and Ukrainian authorities and to foster mutual understanding. And as you are the managing director, Greta, you are very well aware of this work. And in my eyes, ICAR has played an important role in the success of this first phase of judicial cooperation. And I'm very confident that um, this fruitful cooperation will, will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. And uh, indeed, thanks uh, to the Swiss authorities for having supported us. I think you're pointing to two very important facts, which is on the one hand, the PEP law that Switzerland has, which is really intended to give victim countries the time they need. After political trans uh, transformation, there is a need for institutions to build up again. And these cases, as we heard from Mary and, and from Artem as well, are they take time to investigate. So that law is essential because it gives a degree of space for the victim countries to actually engage in a meaningful and high quality investigation. Of course, we know now it's running out in two to three years. So Artem, there's a bit of pressure on us here in Ukraine, but uh, let's see how far we can go. And I know it's not all only you're doing, there's other actors involved, of course, as well. And the other point is, um, Roger, what you pointed out as the translation work, there's a lot of mutual understanding, which really is not something about the law, but about communication. So again here, I think uh, these are two important points to be taken into account. Now, <coughs> excuse me, a question to, to Roger and Mary together actually, or I mean one after the other, Mary maybe first. We do know, uh, and that's part of the reason why you're on the panel, the United States and Switzerland have been known in the past to harbor assets that were stolen from other jurisdictions. But the same is also the reason why both, both your countries have kind of been propelled to become the pioneers or the, you know, in, bringing innovation to international asset recovery. Personally, I can see that it's still only a handful of countries who are really serious about recovering stolen assets. They may still not be the perfect financial centers, but they're serious about recovering stolen assets. Assuming you agree that your countries are among the pioneers, what would you like to see other countries do? Because it's not just up to the US and Switzerland to assist countries like Ukraine. Mary, maybe first, what would you like to see happen internationally? Thanks so much, Greta. So I would say two things. I mean, the first is that we need to use the momentum of the international focus, especially on corruption this year, here at this conference, at the G7, UNGAS, FATF plenary, the OECD anti-bribery convention plenaries, the UNCAC conference of state parties, everywhere we can to join with international partners to fight against complacency in uh, establishing safe havens for illicit money. As the Swiss and the, and the US and the UK make uh, greater and greater commitments <laughs> to try to prevent their own economies from being safe havens, for corruption proceeds, we see that new havens, new safe havens are starting to develop. And we really um, need to fight uh, the possibility that these new, new countries um, cre create the conditions where safe uh, money can safely be hidden and where they provide a little international cooperation. So we, we really uh, need to uh, band together um, to try to, to stop this. And, and second, I would say that, um, it, echoing my earlier comments, we, we really need jurisdictions where the corruption occurred to work as much as possible to preserve evidence, to gather evidence in the most professional and lawful ways, because it's with that evidence that your foreign partners, where there is some jurisdiction, some activity, can actually do something meaningful to help you recover those assets. Thanks, Greta. Thank you, Mary, and um, I can only echo very much that we need to use this momentum at the moment and be sincere in, in, in also addressing the issues with those countries where 
the criminals are now diversifying their investments. They're sending them to other jurisdictions where there's not the same legal framework and not the same will. Uh, Roger, uh, what do you say to what you heard from Mary and what are some of the thoughts that you have in terms of where the international community needs to come together more? Many thanks. I would like to say two things uh, as well. Uh, first, practice, practice, practice. Um, I think uh, we should start practicing <laughs> the asset recovery. I think it's very important that there's an increasing attention paid to asset recovery on a multilateral level. But there's also a risk that uh, there's that they think there's a need for new structures, for new tools, and so on. I think personally, I believe that the tools are there. We just have to use them. And it would be great to see other countries using those tools. And of course, we are always uh, happy to share our experience with, with uh, other countries. And secondly, um, I would like to see partnerships. I think also from a practical perspective, uh, we always try to engage in, in a spirit of cooperation, of partnership. And I think that's absolutely key uh, to succeed in, in asset recovery. Thank you so much, Roger. And it turns out we are spot on time. I've got the red light blinking at me, so there's a lot more to be said. Uh, but I do want to stress maybe my personal take on things and also echoing uh, uh, Artem's point. Yes, international cooperation is still a very long and slow process. We need to reform it. But while we are waiting for this reform to happen and hopefully actively pushing it, we need to be as unbureaucratic as possible. There is many ways to simplify MLA simply by just being understanding of each other's challenges. And I think the US and the Switzerland are excellent partners in this regard and examples to follow. And they do have a very reliable partner in Artem Sitnik. So I couldn't have been happier to have those three, two, uh, three people on the panel with me. With that, many thanks. Have a lovely afternoon and over to the next session. Thank you. I'm very pleased that we have an excellent opportunity today to have an interview with very uh, energetic, uh, dedicated, visionary young leaders who are in charge of specialized anti-corruption prevention bodies in their respective countries. Here we have today, uh, and let me introduce to the audience, Mrs. Haihuki Harutunyan, who is the chair chairwoman of the Corruption Prevention Commission in the Republic of Armenia, and Mr. Oleksandr Novikov, who is the head of National Anti-Corruption Prevention Agency in Ukraine. We will have a very interesting theme to discuss today, how to prevent political corruption, and what are the tools that could be effectively used to that. And those are the tools that are directly relevant to the work that you do in everyday life and effective. Why asset declarations matter? What makes them that potent tool, uh, instrument that can actually curb political corruption and then deliver that effect to the public and live up to public expectations in this regard. First of all, let me to thank you for having me for this event and sharing the experience that Armenia has instituted very recently. And thanks for the nice introduction. So uh, after the peaceful transformation of power in 2018, Armenia has decided to make the system of asset declarations as an effective instrument to prevent corruption in the country. And in late November of 2019, uh, the new government has established a completely new institution, Corruption Prevention Commission for the country, 
and then empower the institution to prevent systemic corruption in the country. The key for corruption was uh, the power given to execute the system of Assad declarations. And at this moment, I believe that Armenia has one of the highly effective systems of Assad declarations that can be shared with other countries aiming to make prevention of systemic corruption in their countries. So what we have, uh, the power that the CPC has obtaining information from the 13 state other agencies and databases about the public officials, um, uh, assets, income, interest, and any ties with businesses, but also information from third parties. Our commission has the right to receive information also about the bank secrecy uh, information of public officials, and with this composition has the chance to analyze the flow and wealth of public officials, determining whether there is any misconduct of public officials arising for, uh, from the abuse of power, but also detecting the possible risks of corruption at individual, but also at institutional level. So this instrument given us is a powerful tool also to establish integrity at the individual level, but at the institutional level as well. So the current set uh, of the, uh, the current system sets the comprehensive information receiving uh, from public officials. It covers the assets, as I mentioned, income, interest, but also business uh, ties and communications of public information, uh, public officials. What is important with the information is that allows also to discover whether the public official has obtained anything unlawfully and any time that that kind of signal is there, we have the power also to suspend and start the action against that public official. Uh, after these changes that the government has made, currently we have really the comprehensive scope of um, the public officials who are submitting um, declarations annually. So all high level and senior officials at the um, legislative um, executive branches of the government, judges, prosecutors, civil servants are submitting declarations and this number is uh, currently 9,000 public officials. And to give you understanding, I should mention that also um, the system refers to the family members and those who are residing with public officials and um, a total amount of um, declarations that the commission receives annually is 30,000. To give you understanding, I should mention that this is already 10% of the general population of Armenia. So with this kind of information coverage, but also the power that the CPC is given, we have already developed very effective methodology for analyzing the submitted asset declarations. And this methodology supports us to manage the entire process, but also pick up the declarations based on risk indicators and uh, conduct the full audit of these kind of declarations. It disclosed the information about any kind of flow and transaction that is happening through the financial uh, means of the public official and indicates whenever there is anything that is non-compliance with the data provided before, with data that we had about a particular public official, family member, etc., and relevant actions then uh, are taken by our commission, administrative, but also with the power sending these kind of cases where any element of um, criminal uh, possible offense is there to the General Prosecutor's Office of Armenia. So that's why I believe that the current system will give us chance really to prevent occurrence of the systemic corruption in the country. Be before I switch to Alexander with the question, with one sentence, would you, would you say that uh, already for the time being that this change came in, public's interest has risen uh, to what you have in the data uh, for public officials and then how important it is to have public engaged in this process so that the should, interest is there. I should have mentioned that also all the information, almost all the information that um, Commission receives through the declarations are public. 
So only a small num number of areas are not public, um, kind of protecting the total privacy uh, data for public officials. And this also makes this instrument very much powerful because based on the information that public can follow, we are receiving number of applications from the investigative journalists, from the applicants, who know that the neighbor public official has an asset that has not been de declared, but also the lifestyle that he is having is not in compliance with the income that he is having or the family is having. So this is also part of our kind of achievement, extending the scope of the information which is public and using also society for this very important task for us. Very, very well. Alexander, hello uh, from Transatlantic <laughs> Dimension. Um, uh, first, uh, the question to you. Uh, in Ukraine, when the electronic asset declaration system came in, it, shen, it sent the shock waves <laughs> to the society when the first information came in in terms of the scale of wealth of so many public officials at the time. Uh, years have passed, the system is at place, and then it is the task of your organization agency to ensure that it's not only when f is well functioning, but then uh, it has this powerful tool of verification embedded into it. How would you assess what is the impact already, if you could tell us, of e uh, asset declaration systems in Ukraine? Do you see that it already delivered on some of the goals that for which the system has been established in Ukraine? Did it live up to public expectations? Um, hello, and I want to thank uh, the Anti-Corruption Action Center for organizing this event. I wish I could be present uh, uh, in person, but I am currently in the U.S. And um, I should say that the asset declaration system has proven effective. Over 5,000 proceedings have been registered based on false information declarations. Just in, in past year alone, we found almost half a billion remnants of undeclared assets and as of today uh, together with the uh, anti-corruption prosecutor's office and the NABU we have already filed for a seizure of unexplained assets those which are indicated in the declaration but not confirmed by uh, proof of origin and last year's decision of the constitutional court actually proves the effectiveness of the uh, asset declaration register and the work done by the uh, national agency on corruption prevention and the NABU using those data. Alexander, uh, I will follow up with a question. You mentioned uh, that constitutional court's decision proves that you've been effective. Would you elaborate a bit more on that? <laughs> The thing is that the decision of the Constitutional Court was actually, uh, it actually took place after undeclared uh, assets were found with the head of the Constitutional Court and uh, they were undeclared uh, and uh, located in the Crimean Peninsula occupied by the Russian Federation was a land plot and we also found that actually two judges of the Constitutional Court failed to declare a significant uh, changes in their financial status, uh, while in Ukraine, uh, uh, public officials don't only file declarations annually, but if they uh, acquire assets for a certain amount, they are obliged to file that information with uh, an ACP. And another constitutional court judge was found to have failed to declare a vehicle. Hi, would Huke, you, would you assess that uh, effect of having ESA declaration systems in Armenia now, that uh, the, one of the elements of the effect of that is that the public officials are already aware of its existence and they take into account that uh, if they have unjustified wealth, it will be very hard to hide and then perhaps be non-accountable for that. Yes, of course. And I should mention also that for us um, as well, once the commission has been established, the focus was uh, analyzing the asset declarations submitted by the members of the Supreme Justice Council of uh, the Republic of Armenia, but also members of the Constitutional Court. So around um, 
250 asset declarations have been analyzed by our commission and the relevant actions have been taken, sending given the cases to the General Prosecutor's Office of the Republic of Armenia. This has proved that, uh, number one, uh, for me at least, that now public uh, officials are taking the system and declaration or the reporting of, about their uh, income, assets, and interests through the declaration system very seriously. It approves uh, also that now the country demonstrated that, uh, that uh, political will fighting against impunity, but also creating environment which is very much sensitive for um, corruption, aiming to prevent the reoccurrence of uh, such happenings that we had uh, before the, before the happenings in 2018. Alexander, um, would, you, uh, would you say that um, provisions related to illicit enrichment and civil forfeiture are important extension in some regards to asset declaration systems so that in the country one can have a comprehensive system where on par with transparency accountability could be well ensured as well so that powerful tools on civil forfeiture and illicit enrichment in criminal law as well could help to achieve an ultimate goal of prevention of corruption so that through all of these measures we can see that there is less graft and corruption in the public sphere. I think the asset declaration is the best tool to um, overcome uh, uh, corruption, to prevent corruption. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to make corruption uh, uh, violations and to um, uh, violate the law, uh, because you will not be able to use uh, those assets, because the register contains information not only on your income, but also about your expenditures. And like I said before, two MPs of Ukraine have already had this regulation applied to them, which attests to the efficiency of the system. Because the data on the expenditures of those MPs and those public servants have actually served as the basis on uh, those lawsuits on forfeiture of um, illegally obtained assets. So this system uh, is effective and it will be effective only uh, provided the asset declaration register works properly. But to, to, to follow up to the question itself, illicit enrichment in the criminal law and civil forfeiture in civil law, would, are they useful extensions to the e-declaration system? Mm -hmm. Or would you think that e-declaration system is sufficient in itself? Uh, declarations are effective independently, but we do understand that in order for the entire mechanism to work properly, we need to have the obligation to declare, but also liability for violation of those um, provisions. And of course, if we do not have uh, liability and punishment for false declaration, liability which would involve civil forfeiture, the uh, declaration itself cannot be as effective as it could be. Obviously. Hi, Kuhi. I'll revert back to you with the same question as well on liability, which is an important component to ensure that the crime does not pay off if it is committed and if it's a crime. But for the prevention as well, side of the equation, it's important to understand that there is this dissuasive factor because you would know that you will be liable for the action. How, how, how is the situation in Armenia? Do you have sufficient legal tools that could be uh, equipping you with all, 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 all uh, tool, tools that are needed for you to deliver on that? So another um element of this uh, preventive uh, reform that the government presented was also introducing completely new law on illicit enrichment. So this is uh, kind of gives the continuation whenever the preventive work is done. And I should mention that in societies and in countries like Armenia, Ukraine, where endemic corruption has been rooted since, I don't know, uh, more than uh, 30 years back, uh, Preventing will kind of be some th a kind of action um, addressing the challenges that we may face in the future. But what is already there on the ground, we 
should demonstrate that enforcement in a way that uh, public officials understand that the punishment will happen if the behavior continues in the same way. So that's the continuation how we introduce that any time the system of asset declaration reveals that any kind of um, income or asset has been obtained illegally it, and it, uh, it is not possible for public official to um, confirm or somehow demonstrate that the legal grounds are there. So then the case will be transferred to the general prosecutor's office and that grounds of illicit enrichment then become the part of the investigation, but also uh, the consequences will apply obtaining back that part of property or the part of the income that the public official had illegally. So this is the comprehensive and systemic approach for the cases where already um, kind of the grounds for illegality of the income has been established and I believe that that gives us a chance to have really effective uh, preventive work but also fight against the corruption cases where there is already the element of uh, criminal happenings. Very well. For accountability, uh, verification and monitoring of immense data that both of your agencies accumulating and have access to through registries and open source information is extremely important. It is important that there is, uh, there is a way through which you can make sense of all this information, verify and by that control as a declarations. Alexander, how important digitalization in your view is in this process so that there is a quality way of verifying information, analyzing information, and by that ensuring that all of this immense data that in the case of Ukraine you have over a million <laughs> public employees is not wasted and there is good use made out of that. I will uh, say more. Actually, without digitalization, the functioning of asset declaration register would be impossible. Today, Ukraine has the biggest asset declaration register in the world. 800,000 declarations uh, to 900,000 declarations are filed every year, and our capacity to verify them uh, would be a thousand or two thousand without digitalization. So that means that without digitalization, verification is effectively impossible. What has been done in Ukraine? In Ukraine, with the help of the European Union and the UN Anti Corruption Initiative, we have built a system of automatic control and it was modernized about a week ago. And what does the system do? The system uh, compares all the data introduced in the declaration with public registers, and the computer, the system automatically verifies all 800,000 declarations. They have already been verified, uh, then the system flags uh, high-risk declarations, and the first 13 declarations from this uh, high-risk list are uh, have already been sent for verification. And uh, we basically work only with those declarations that have been flagged with the system. We are only starting because the system started working for on the 1st of June, and we did need some time to uh, carry out that uh, comparison with registers. So we believe this digital verification is the most effective way because it in, uh, completely eliminates any subjective factors. So today we have three lines of uh, verification. The first one is the list of high-ranking officials. The second one is based on the statements from civil society organizations and the public. And the third one is based on the logical and technical oversight using the automatic verification. And we believe this automatic verification is the most efficient way. Heiko here, how, how about Armenia in this case? What are your plans in, in the way of digitalization and, and, and providing open data to the public as well when it comes to declarations and then all the data that you accumulate? So for us as well, we um, kind of adopted this approach that innovation should come to help us uh, really sufficiently doing that kind of preventive work. And um, as it already has been mentioned, we also created um, technical reference uh, for the completely new electronic system 
of asset declarations based on algorithmic decision making, but also artificial intelligence solutions that will allow us to have all this analytical part based on automated scam, but also the reporting itself will become automated as much that human intervention uh, there will be completely or almost illuminated. So this will allow us to act impartial and have the results that are not adaptable by, any, by anyone. Not the pu only public official, but public also can see this. And with this new system, which is also very important, that public also gets more accessibility of doing their own analyzing and uh, confirming for themselves as well whether the work of the commission has been sufficient enough to control corruption and detect the misconduct. What we also aiming to do is just through this new system making uh, the asset declarations user friendly for public officials as well because the current system is very difficult to use we know and it makes a um, kind of very much complaint coming from the public officials that uh, this is impossible to fill in and the mistake some sometime may happen just not intentionally so with this new system it will be very much user friendly we aim to have even the mobile phone applications and uh, other innovative approaches will allow us to have futures that make the system itself is interesting, not only for ourselves who will do this analytical part, but also for public officials and for the members of the society. Very well. I, I saw that Alexander was nodding when you were talking. Very, very similar issues to Ukraine as well when it comes to how to make it user friendly and then make it in that sense easily acceptable, so to say, for the public officials. We've even had developed together with NACP uh, a chatbot Taras uh, at the time when uh, public officials had to file uh, the declaration, so it made, made it, it very easier we would hope uh, for them to file the declarations. We have time for one more last question so that if you could be concise with your answer, but then I, I think it's very important to ch touch base on that. When we speak about political corruption, as a declaration is a big part of it, how to prevent it. But then I think party financing is another side of the coin as well. So Alexander, if you could comment on that, how do you see that part of your activity developing? How important it is to have a well-established system of monitoring of party financing, perhaps even political campaigning in the future? Two months ago, actually less than that, we launched a new product, which is an electronic register of political party funding, which was formed based on the same principle as the asset declaration register. The political parties will be filing all information about their property, uh, revenue, expenditures in the electronic form. All this information will be automatically registered uh, by the public apart and available to the public apart from the uh, personal information, which means that not only the NACP or our public council, but any NGO or any citizen of Ukraine will be able to prevent corruption by verifying information from that register. This uh, register is based, uh, like I said, on the same principle as the asset declaration register, and it also contains the automation verification block, which will automatically verify information and compare information with uh, other resources and other registers, and automatically flag uh, uh, risks and violations of uh, the legislation on party funding. We believe this register is no less important than the declaration register because the integrity of the political system uh, also stipulates uh, the quality of legislation and whether um, the um, uh, political parties work for the interests of the citizens of Ukraine or they work for some private interests. So in terms of political party funding, this is a key tool. And of course, uh, the um, most important uh, thing is to ensure the um, uh, termination of impunity. We believe that impunity needs to be stopped, and we uh, hope that in the near future we'll pass all the relevant legislation, and we will co also complete the judicial reform. Hi, uh, I, I believe that it's an important direction in Armenia as well that you're working on. So if you could elaborate on that from your side as well. Sure. Um, as a part of that large-scale large reform that the new government has adopted, addressing the political corruption 
is there as well. So uh, from 2022, our commission will institute the declaration system, but also uh, financial control over the party members and the party funding itself. So the funding members of the political parties in Armenia will become um, uh, will be obliged to declare their assets, income, interests, and any ties and relations with the business, um, as it is for other public officials, but also the funding and source of income for the political party will be supervised with the special methodology by our um, commission. So for that part also, we are now working very hard to have the electronic system in place and to execute it in a way that it really gives us um, the opportunity to clean the system in a way that the political influence and political power is never uh, merged with the business to create the oligarchic system in the country. We aim very much to prevent uh, oligarchic governance in the country, but also somehow encourage political party members and political parties themselves to serve for the public interest. Very well. I think that we have uh, very little time left at our hand. Unfortunately, no more questions that I could, um, uh, for my side, uh, direct to you. But if you have any remarks that at the end you would want to mention, perhaps, that we've omitted in the questions, we have about a minute and a half <laughs> at our disposal. Alexander, maybe from your side, final remarks, if you would want to mention anything? Yes. The thing is that we have built uh, the best IT tools of financial oversight in the world, as we believe it. And the political party register and asset declaration registers, they are effective. We have already verified party funding of three uh, parties, and we have uh, traced the flow of funding, which means that these tools are constantly attacked by those individuals and stakeholders that are not interested in overcoming corruption in the country. In particular, last week we had the law passed which can effectively uh, ruin the system of declaration and thankfully the president already said that he would veto this law. And there is also another initiative which can block all verification. <laughs> we uh, hope uh, that the public will help us to prevent those efforts. I think that uh, we are running out of time, but uh, I'm sorry, Haikuki, if I wasn't able to give you the time for final remarks. But my main takeaway from today's discussion is that the visionary leaders and then leaders that are dedicated to deliver with their team uh, on that important tasks that you have are uh, destined to be successful in the action. I hope you a good afternoon uh, and then all of our viewers and uh, over to the next session. Thanks so much.
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Oliver Bullo. I'm a journalist and author. I write a lot about corruption, and I'm really pleased to have the chance to moderate this discussion on civil society and law enforcement tackling transborder corruption together. I'm just sorry that I can't be there in Kiev in person, perhaps. Next year, we'll have that opportunity. Um, joining me today on the panel are Karen Greenwald, who worked as an investigator, case agent, and supervisor with the US Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, for more than two decades. For the last two years, she's been a consultant working on anti-corruption issues, unlike me. She's a member of the supervisory board of the Anti-Corruption Action Center there in Ukraine. Uh, Drew Sullivan is a journalist who co-founded the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Center in 2007. Under his leadership, it has won numerous awards, including a share of a Pulitzer Prize for its work on the Panama Papers four years ago. The fact you're attending this conference means you realize how serious the problem of corruption is and how it is spreading to new places all of the time. Hundreds of billions of dollars are sucked out of countries that desperately need them to the benefit of a small group of men, and they almost always are men. Corruption operates transnationally, thanks to a global network of enablers, but the police officers and regulatory authorities tasked with confronting it are stuck behind national borders. Those of us concerned about it need to learn new ways to work together across those national borders if we are to have any chance of reducing their influence. Having to establish this principle, however, doesn't mean this is easy in practice. There is much justifiable distrust between civil society, journalism and law enforcement. So what can we do to help ease this distrust and get everyone pulling together? That is the theme of our discussion today. And we're going to start with Drew. Drew, if you would, I'd like you to lay out how the OCCRP already works with law enforcement. Indeed, does it work with law enforcement? How does that work and um, how easy is that to achieve? So, so traditionally, uh, investigative reporters um, uh, communicate quite a bit with law enforcement. Um, uh, it's usually a source relationship. Um, and uh, I think both of us, both law enforcement think of journalists as sources and journalists think of law enforcement as sources. Um, and so there's a lot of traditional communication that goes along that way. Now, you know, historically, uh, investigative reporting, um, we do not um, uh, cooperate or work with law enforcement in any way. And the, the fundamental reason is that, you know, as journalists, we're also talking to organized crime and um, a lot of bad people. And if they know that we're cooperating with law enforcement, they're not going to talk to us and they're going to actually see us um, as an enemy or a problem. And so consequently, uh, you know, we have to keep fairly, um, uh, you know, uh, disciplined about not, not cooperating with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Um, but the OCCRP is a bit of a unique approach uh, in the sense that um, we do have what we call the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium with Transparency International. So we do work with um, a, a civil society organizations. Um, there's a lot of capacity for investigation in civil society organizations. And those organizations do work with law enforcement. So uh, indirectly, there is communication that does go on uh, with law enforcement. And you know, we started this to, to streamline the process. Um, you know, tip in the old days, you know, journalists did their investigation and then civil society would follow on and say, that's important, we're gonna do some activism on this, but they would have to almost recreate the investigation. And then law enforcement would say, we need to act on this. And then they would recreate the investigation a third time. And it was a really inefficient process. And I think, you know, by sharing information through to the civil society organizations and them sharing information with law enforcement, you make the process more efficient. So that's kind of how we work with law enforcement. Um, I would say it's, it's indirectly. Could you, could you talk about an example of when that's happened and what kind of results that's achieved? Sure, sure. Uh, for instance, we were doing some work in the Gambia looking at the uh, uh, former president um, and his, his work there and uh, his, his um, thievery there, I should say. Um, and uh, he had, um, uh, he was basically a typical uh, African autocrat who was enriching himself uh, at the expense of the people. It's a poor country, there's not a lot to enrich yourself with, um, but it was ending up in property uh, in the United States and other places. And so we started an investigation on that and then passed that on to uh, Transparency International 
um, you know, they, they actually provided some help in the Gambia uh, for some of the investigation and we worked with reporters down there. And then um, that, all, that information was all shared and that was the basis um, uh, for the Transparency International to take that and then work to, um, uh, to, to basically get properties that were in the United States um, in Virginia seized um, on behalf of the people of, um, of Gambia. And actually it was Karen who, uh, who uh, helped enable that uh, to happen, so. Um, is that the kind of result that you would count as, a, as an impact of your work? Is that the kind of thing when you, you, would, you would put that as a, as a tick in the box of, of impact? I mean, I, I know how, how sort of donor-funded organizations tend to often try and garner impact reports. Does that count as impact? Well, it counts for impact on the uh, you know global uh, you know uh, uh, anti-corruption consortium. It, I wouldn't say it's a, it's an impact for the for the journalism per se, but you know it's it's a strange time, and I think the traditional um, you know avenue, the traditional ways that news media has seen itself are, are really changing, especially in the developing world. You know um, where there really is no rule of law. Uh, and you need to do things that are often outside of um, the political situation. You know, those types of activities are ones that are going on in other countries. I mean, our impact is not in the Gambia, it's in the United States. Um, you know, but ultimately it goes back and, and impacts the Gambia. So the idea is to look beyond borders and to look beyond um, the, the traditional ways of getting impact. And I think that in that sense, yeah, it, it is impact. It has impacted good journalism and it has in good impact to good civil society. Um, thanks. And Karen, could you talk a bit about um, the, the way that the FBI or other law enforcement officers would use journalism as a way of initiating investigations? And then also how um, you know, you, you'd, you'd cooperate or work with or talk to journalists during the course of an investigation to try and make that easier for you. Yes, um, thank you, Oliver, for um, inviting me to uh, come on the panel today and thank the organizers. Um, so traditionally, what I would tell journalists when I would, when I would talk to them about how the FBI uses their information, I would tell them that uh, the FBI owes them a great debt because I can tell you for a fact that there are a number of investigations that have been started in the United States over the course of many years uh, that were started because of journalist reporting. Um, in fact, um, uh, one case, in particularly as it relates to corruption, uh, in one case in particular that I'm familiar with, uh, I, I, I was I was present when you know a you know a an agent was reading his morning newspaper, uh, and and saw some reporting on the governor of a state, and and just started asking questions like, "Wow, could this be true? Was this contract you know improperly awarded?" Uh, and it led to that governor actually being indicted, uh, uh, convicted, and going to jail for a number of years. Uh, and that was started directly from a journalist report. Um, another case, you know, was a, a, an FCPA case, a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case, that was started based on journalist reporting um, in the city of Chicago, uh, where the journalists started asking questions whether or not the awarding of, in that case, a contract to uh, install red light cameras in the city of Chicago was properly awarded to the company uh, out of Australia that, um, uh, that uh, was awarded that contract. Um, and it led to not only investigation in the United States, but an investigation in Australia and, and, a, and de a Department of Justice involvement. And that was all from you know, a journalist doing the hard work of taking data um, and, and looking at you know, this awarding of this particular contract. But of course, you know, a journalist doesn't get credit for that. Uh, they often don't know that the FBI has used their information. Um, and, but then the challenge becomes, you know, for example, in a case like the one MBD Malaysia case, where the journalists are doing a, a great deal of reporting, um, um, and the FBI does open investigation, and, and the situation or the, the criminal activity is ongoing, so how is there a way for German law enforcement to share information? And the answer is that gets very tricky. Um, it gets very tricky not just for the journalists because of their ethical standards, but it gets tricky for law enforcement because um, we have to go into court at some point and account how we got to where we were in the case uh, and put in evidence. 
um, and um, uh, we don't we don't we we avoid as much as possible making journalists witnesses in cases because uh, because we don't want to um, uh, you know to cross the line of harming you know the you know the freedom of the press in the United States. Um, so we, at the same time, the journalist, you know, in, in the one MBD Malaysia case was talking to some very key people. Um, and so, uh, so the, the FBI has a very vibrant, you know, public affairs office um, that, that acts as the in-between between the investigators and the, the journalists to, to find ways to, to if, if possible, to be able to share information back and forth. But again, it is a very regulated, and, and that takes a lot of very high level approval within the FBI to be able to do that, to be able to, to, to kind of work kind of in parallel with the journalist who's working on a really great story like that one was. Um, it can be done, um, uh, but it's not the usual course of business. Most of the time, what happens is the journalist, um, you know, if they have an ongoing situation, they they're just doing their reporting in a vacuum, uh, and 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 going to the FBI to to make a re you know make a request to see if they can get a comment. Uh, but in the last couple of years, the FBI has has really changed its policies on how it engages with journalists. Uh, so um, unfortunately, now the FBI's position is that they will not comment on an ongoing investigation period. Now that was always kind of the, the policy, um, but even asking for a referred journalist to the FBI to talk about um, the, the, in, the indicted Semyon Mogilevich case, um, uh, which has you know, we've had Mr. and Mogilev indicted for for more than you know almost 20 years now, uh, and and the one of the agents who worked in the case is still in the bureau, and the bureau's answer was, you can talk to that agent, but not about that case. So um, so the rules have changed in the last, particularly in the last three or four years, as to how the FBI really can talk to journalists, even on background, um, in in and particularly in ongoing investigations. Um, do you think that a, a structure like the one Drew was laying out, by which you know journalists work with law enforcement with a essentially a cutout of a sort of mutually trusted organisation like Transparency International in between, is that is that something that might be desirable or helpful for a law enforcement like an agency like the FBI um, to try and to try and get past the the issues that you're talking about? Uh, absolutely, um, and uh, I would refer to a, a, a speech that I heard last week by the, the new head of USAID, uh, who talked about uh, at, in, in, uh, as, as a part of a, United, a major United Nations conference, who talked about how USAID is actually, who is one of the funders, by the way, of OCCRP, uh, uh, is talking about um, putting uh, more money into civil society organizations to teach them things about, you know, you know, money laundering and how to trace money uh, so that they can be more empowered to identify crimes uh, and, 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 and even, you know, which is, which is tricky business for law enforcement, even potentially identifying evidence that could be used to bring criminal, um, uh, bring criminal cases. Uh, I would also highlight too, that the U S government last week, uh, announced the, the white house announced that we now consider, uh, corruption and grand corruption, a national security threat. So you are going to see kind of a same massing of U.S. government resources uh, into, um, you know, particularly civil society to help us uh, really um, target corruption at the source. Um, I would say almost, almost total or probably equal to the level that we saw with terrorism, you know, um, 10 years ago and 15 years ago. Uh, so I, I personally am I'm very high on, you know, on getting civil society involved. And, and I actually was was very early on still in the FBI was was seeking out civil society to have those discussions because civil society at its at its at its core, at its best 
especially in corruption, you know, uh, and also as somewhat in transnational organi organized crime, is is talking to people who are potentially good witnesses. They're they're getting, you know, um, uh, they're getting the stories of the victims. You know, um, uh, they're representing those victims. You know, in to their governments um, uh, as you know, um, the reason why, you know, things need to change, the reason why laws need to be implemented. Uh, and so they are an incredibly important part of uh, really finding the stories of the local person um, that makes um, doing cases, criminal cases, so important. Because as much as, as, a, as an investigator, as I love data, data doesn't make a case for me. You know, papers and financial documents without a witness to explain them doesn't make a case for me in court for me to get a conviction. I really need that human that human story and, and civil society really brings us that human story because they're on the ground and it's their country. Now, obviously everything we've been saying so far has been predicated on the assumption that both the journalists and the law enforcement agencies are operating in good faith. Um, sadly, we're not being joined today by any corrupt officials or um, dishonest journalists. Um, none were available. Um, but uh, Drew, I mean, it is obviously not a trivial matter, the point that if you're going to operate, you know, in collaboration to some extent with law enforcement, we need to recognise that not all law enforcement agencies are on the side of the good guys here. Um, how, how do you ensure yourself against you know that kind of essentially almost being sucked into you know collaborating with what would be you know to in many states essentially a mafia organization just happening to be one wearing uniform yeah well i mean this is what we deal with all the time i mean everybody who comes to us has a uh, has an intention for why they're coming to us and they all want something us to do something and something to happen um, and those intentions are, are seldom um, completely pure. Um, and so consequently, you know, I, it, it, regardless of where you're working, there are good law enforcement people everywhere. I mean, there, there are good agents at the FSB, you know, um, there, are, there are good agents everywhere. Um, and so, um, you know, you, it's, it's really a matter of building relationships with people over time uh, to, to develop those kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, people you can trust and you can work with, you know, to greater extents. I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it, law enforcement is a very difficult job and, um, you know, there's not enough law enforcement people in the world. They, it's, it's so badly underfunded. Um, it's ridiculous, uh, you know, as is journalism. And, um, and so consequently, you know, you look for ways that you can um, efficiently get stories out and those stories can have impact. And that really takes developing relationships to go far beyond, you know, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the typical type of, you know, relationship you might have with somebody. So um, in, in the world, you know, law enforcement is often forbidden to talk to us, but they do. And we've had law enforce, enforcement give us whole case files and, um, you know, it's because they felt that there was a benefit to be gained, you know, that we could do something that they couldn't do. Um, in some cases, they gave us records because they couldn't understand what was going on. You know, our, our first Russian laundromat was really uncovered by, you know, uh, law enforcement in Moldova who had the bank records but couldn't interpret them. And so we ended up interpreting it for them and they ended up using that very effectively. So, you know, there's a lot of ways you can informally work with, with these types of organizations. And during that process, you start to suss out the motivation for why people are doing it. Um, you know, and in the end, you know, you do get manipulated sometimes. And, um, you know, um, and in the end, we'll take data from anybody, you know, we, <laughs> You know, we've taken it from, you know, organized crime and from, from some very nasty people, but it goes through our filter to make sure that it's, you know, that there really is truly a story there and that it's in the public interest to tell that story. So in the end, we really don't, we don't judge, uh, you know, it's, um, and we just try to um, make sure that if we are being manipulated, that we are getting a story that the public needs to know and that we mitigate any harm that's done.
I mean, Karen, obviously for you, the same issue works in reverse. Um, you know, you've, you've said that, that the FBI is being more cautious in its dealings with journalists, um, which I'm sorry to hear. One thing I've always enjoyed about going to work in, in the States on a story is how open um, law enforcement agencies and others are to talking with journalists, which is certainly not the case in the UK, where there seems to be a general presumption that all journalists are scoundrels, which may in the UK not be an unreasonable assumption, who knows. Um, but I mean, I suppose in, in, in reverse, how do, how do law enforcement agencies ensure themselves against the fact that, that, that the journalists they're dealing with are, you know, bona fide journalists? I mean, we're, 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 we can all name, you know, what organisations that look like news organisations, but actually don't, don't really function as them in anything but name. Um, well, that is tricky business. Uh, because um, you're right, uh, we we have to balance, as I said, freedom of the press. But you know, in some respects, uh, we don't. You know, the press has as a as a category, you know, and as a um, as a as a job has expanded over the last several years. You know, you have you know news organizations that um, you know have come online. Um, that, uh, you know, um, don't have, you know, the individuals who are reporting don't have their traditional journalist credentials, for example. Um, and uh, you have, you know, people who are, are putting out news, of course, that might just be on the internet. They have an internet channel and they're putting out news that way. And, and I personally have been the, the, you know, the victim of a story that was written by somebody that, that I, I don't know if, you know, I don't know what their credentials as a journalist are, but they certainly had an audience to report information on me that was, was completely and utterly inaccurate. Um, and I, there's no, no recourse I have to, to go back and, and, and undo that story. So, you know, um, you know the, the press office and the FBI gives you the opportunity to vet out, you know, who are, who are truly legitimate journalists and, and who aren't. Um, um, but when you go into the world, like I have and, and, and many other FBI agents have, and you, you, you give a talk at a conference or something like that, um, you, you have to be cautious. You know, you have to be, you know, you have to be concerned that, you know, the person who comes up to you and says that they're a journalist and, and may have journalist credentials, um, you know, is, is legitimate journalist. And generally, though, the, the way I could always tell was by the questions they asked. You know, are, are they asking me questions that truly, you know, are, are collimation or are they trying to ask me questions that that are trying to to trap me and in giving information that that, um, you know, goes to the, the storyline that's being spun by one side of the spectrum or the other. And uh, just to add, Oliver, that, that it's it's very confusing nowadays to assess journalism because there's all sorts of hybrid organizations that are out there that may not. That, that look like news organizations, but may not follow the same ethical standards of traditional organizations. And there's organizations like Bellingcat, you know, uh, and others that, that are really just hybrids of activism and journalism. And so it's, it's hard to interpret those organizations. Some of them like Bellingcat are very good and have, you know, very, very good standards, but, you know, they, they won't behave in the same way a traditional journalism organization does. And that makes it difficult for people to assess them sometimes. So, I mean, Karen, you're now in civil society, um, uh, working with Anti-Corruption Action Centre and others. Um, has this given you a different perspective on cooperation between law enforcement and, and you know, outside actors? Has this made you think it, it, there should be more of it? Or, 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 you know, I'm just wondering if it's, if, if it's changed how you view these issues. Um. Yes, uh, it's changed how I viewed these issues in a way that I, 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 have, I really have learned to appreciate the fact that there's so much talent and knowledge that's out there in civil society and, and investigative journalists that, that law enforcement doesn't take advantage of. And I don't mean that advantage of in a bad way. Um, you know, I mean advantage of in that they have skills and talents that law enforcement could really use. I mean, 
you know, um, for example, Bellingcat, you know, I'm, I'm currently teaching a class um, uh, to, to law enforcement, um, and we brought uh, Bellingcat, a, a Bellingcat um, uh, journalist on to teach with us because they have an incredible um, wealth of knowledge on utilizing open source databases um, uh, you know, to, to do their stories, but also to, for example, track photos where, you know, and track other information on social media that would be beneficial to an investigator who is investigating corruption and is trying to recover um, assets, uh, assets purchased with the legal proceeds um, uh, that they can use, you know, more effectively use social media, you know, and, and what gets posted on social media. As an investigator, you know, if I needed information about what was posted on social media, I would go to an analyst who would look for that information, which was, they do a great job, but they're not me who knows the case the way that I know the case and knows the evidence the way that I know the evidence. And so I really think, um, and I'm encouraging um, and, and, and pushing at least in, in my, you know, capacity as a, an instructor and a mentor of law enforcement now that I'm retired, um, uh, using and working with the tools that journalists have developed because they, they really, really have, and there are many experts out there, you know, for example, on Bitcoin and, and some of the other, um, you know, up and coming and, and uh, developing areas of, of money laundering, for example, that, that law enforcement just just doesn't utilize. We tend to think of ourselves as being the experts and only using our own expertise. That's a really interesting point, Drew. I'm wondering, does it work in the other direction? You know, I know a lot of us journalists can be a bit um, snooty about our own skills and, and perhaps we're not, we're, we're not giving law enforcement the credit that they deserve in, in reverse. Uh, absolutely, I mean, you know, um... You, you know, the, the, the nice thing about journalism is you are kind of, you know, you're paid to learn and you're paid to try new, new ways. And so that, that keeps us, I think, a little bit open to, to new ideas. But I mean, I think organizations like Bellingcat have really changed the way things are, are done. And, you know, um, as far as law enforcement, I mean, we, we look down on law enforcement because we always say, oh, well, you know, they'll subpoena to find out how many inches in a foot, you know, um, and, and, you know, so... But, but uh, I think that law enforcement is in the, in the process of changing radically as well. And, you know, some, some of the new technologies that are coming online, I think is going to make it really interesting to a, a lot of us. We all have to adopt. It's a new world. Um, the, the uh, you know, the, the stakes are getting higher. Corruption is far, far more problematic than anybody really understands it to be. It's far more uh, uh, pervasive. Then pe people realize, and everybody's going to have to work together to effectively uh, deal with this. And we have to learn from each other. And that's why we believe in regularly meeting and talking to law enforcement and sharing, you know, procedures and ways that we do things. I, you know, I wish they would share more sometimes, uh, but I think they will. Um, excellent. So, uh, Karen, we've just got about thirty seconds left. If you could ask a ver answer very briefly. Um, how, how you think people, things are going to look in about five years' time, um, particularly in the light of Joe Biden's latest announcement? I think in five years' time, what we're going to see is a, a radically different view of, of the corrupt actors that are basically stealing money from, from, from the poor in this, in this, on this planet. And I think it will be for the better for all of us, journalists and law enforcement. Look at that. Thanks very much. And thank you very much to both of you. And thanks very much, everyone listening. This has been great. And I hope very much to see you all in person next year in Kyiv. We co-founded Safe Dnipro and Safe EcoBot project to make the air we breathe cleaner. And one of our goals is to link big political corruption to environmental problems. Raise awareness of Ukrainians so that they clearly understood that corruption kills us.
literally. My goal is to ensure a future where civil society in Ukraine is an effective and safe stronghold that fights corruption and expedites reforms. I want to ensure that no more lives are lost among people who simply want to live in a better Ukraine. On researching how corruption in any part of the globe affects almost every one of us living on Earth. For example, when we investigated the cross-border uh, smuggling mafia in Central Asia, we were amazed to find out that not only had they earned hundreds of millions of US dollars, but they had spent a significant chunk of their illegal income in countries like the US, the UK, Germany and the United Arab Emirates. Maybe this is why renting an apartment is so insanely expensive in London nowadays. My personal goal in fighting corruption is to try and stop just one person from abusing their position uh, and using it to, to harm the rest of us. If I can just stop one person from doing that, I think that that would count as a win. Obviously, it would be great if we could end corruption altogether. But, you know, let's start small. And then, you know, if we stop one person, two people, maybe, you know, we'll turn around and realise that we've ended corruption altogether. But first of all, let's just stop one person. We strive to build a society in Equatorial Guinea, my home country, where people can live to the fullest of their capacity, of their potential, where people can live with human dignity. In 2017, we exposed the illegal voters management system at the presidential elections. There is a high probability that it was used to coordinate the vote buying. Because we knew that such a phenomenon exists, three years later we and the civil society paid even more attention to vote buying at the parliament elections. As a result, uh, so many cases were reported or filmed all around the country that it caused huge protests and those elections were annulled by the Central Elections Commission. We've made a significant progress in the case of Kata Hanzu. A group that carried out the assault is already behind the bars. Another person who ordered the attack and uh, the other who served as a middleman are in custody and on trial. Both were very influential in Kherson and uh, the one that ordered the attack was a dear regional politician. Probably he was the most influential in Kherson region. This is the first time in Ukraine that a person of such power is facing sentence for political murder. And this is not only an example of our fight but also an example of our ability to win. This is the Tekpridniprovska test belonging to a major Ukrainian oligarch, Renat Akhmetov. Recently, under the pressure of civil society, they built a new filter on one of its energy blocks, investing an unprecedented amount of a quarter billion Ukrainian hryvnias. I like to think I've exposed corruption, um, some pretty egregious scams in, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, have I stopped them? I'd be lying if I said I had. Uh, to be honest, it turns out that you can expose scams um, and no one does anything about them. But I think I've helped ordinary people to understand a bit more about you know, what's really happening, what the world is really like. And um, that's something I'm proud of. Uh, the next step, obviously, would be for governments to do something about it. But, you know, that's not happening yet, just yet. There is a growing um, awareness there is a, an increasing willingness and commitment by the youth, but also by generally members of our society to become more engaged, to become part of the fight, to hold accountable those that through their corrupt crimes have deprived an entire society for four decades now of fundamental development, basic rights, and freedom, basic freedoms. There is one example when we were able to actually expose corruption and describe what was happening. It's in Slovakia and the project we called Kochner's Library. Kochner, Marian Kochner, is a businessman of Slovak origin and the lead suspect in murder case of assassination of our colleague Jan Kuciak and his fiancée Martina Kuchnirova. Uh, during the murder investigation, the police collected almost 70 terabytes of data and we as a journalist, we got hold of this data and it included a cell phone of the lead suspect, Marian Kochner. 
uh, the cell phone contained encrypted communication between him and Slovak judges. This was the case when we were actually able to expose the corruption within the judiciary system in Slovakia and probably the most detailed case I ever worked on that was dealing with corruption. We heard incredible and highly personal stories of anti-corruption fighters across the globe. I'm very thankful to those activists for investing their time, because without their effort, without their sacrificial work, all those countries, including Ukraine, would look way less optimistic. But let's move on to a somewhat more optimistic subject. Yesterday we spoke not only with politicians but also with artists because um, we heard from the go away uh, band which uh, made some noise here and i want us to go back to trend ukrainian music today and uh, give it up for dj crystal the youngest dj for a short break
Thank you, DJ Crystal, for this Ukrainian vibe and among the best works of the international competition of posters, which you have just seen on your screens, were also political plots about lycocracy, about intervention in the elections. This is also going to be in the focus of our following panel. The moderator of the panel is Orko Vazovska, head of board at the Civil Network of War. Hello to everyone. This amazing video showed us that democracy is not a state of being, it's a process of becoming and we have to fight for it day by day, especially between elections. Global trends show an incredible rapid movement from uh, transit democr democracies to authoritarian system uh, of government. When a society without long history of democratic election is loyal to the isolated facts of abuse of rights and freedoms, sooner or later uh, this process may become irreversible or very painful.
Elections are often a marker of maturity of both citizens and the political elite, uh, and the ability of the experts community to respond actively in a timely and impartial manner. Today, I have incredible speakers. During this panel, we have to talk about global trends, solutions, and how the stakeholders in this process may be useful for each other, how the stakeholders on the international and local level may to fight together. Uh, that's why I have to, uh, to, to talk about a few things about, about my speakers. Uh, first of all, it's Ken Wallach. He is co-chair of the uh, Commission of Presidential Debates, which has sponsored the presidential and vice presidential debates since 1988 in the USA, and serves as the chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy. He is a member of the advisory committee for the US Agency for International Development, Mm, and I believe that we will have many feedbacks about global trends and situation in different parts of the world in democratic uh, processes. Uh, Peter Urban, he is one of the world's leading electoral uh, management experts, one of a few international ever called upon to direct national election for other nations. He has previously been the chief electoral officer and election commissioner of Kosovo and Afghanistan. Today he is a principal advisor of the IFAS, and in 2008, Peter was knighted for his contribution for furthering freedom and democracy around the world. Uh, next speaker, he is to be represented uh, offline, online, Alexander Schlick, special representative of Svetlana Tikhanovska on elections, and he was a head of electoral department of, of OEC ODIR till this year. Uh, at the same time, he managed and oversees election-related activities across the OEC regions many times and many years. And the next one, uh, last but not least, panelist during this discussion will be Alina Zahoruyko. She is a People's Deputy of Ukraine, Servant of People Party, Deputy Chairperson of the Verkhovna Rada Committee, and uh, Head of Subcommittee, Chairwoman of the Subcommittee of Elections, Referendum and Demo uh, direct democracy of the committee. So, my first general question to you, and I hope that each of the panelists will talk not more than five minutes, because we are going to have very dynamic discussions. Uh, from another hand, I believe that all of us are on the same page. That's why that discussions will be not about principles, but about deeper uh, topics and uh, tools how to protect and defend democracy. So my first general question to you as a high-level expert will be about global trends and threats to best electoral practices. Public opinion in if, uh, is a new religious, uh, but electoral technologies professionally manipulate it. Money in politics is often a uh, compelling obstacles to honest people running in elections. Citizens, sorry, citizens do not focus for a long time on complex state building process, but they want to solve complex problems with simple solutions. That's why the first question is very easy to ask, but very difficult to answer. Is there any hope that democracy will win? So my first uh, panelist, I hope, will be Ken Wallach, because your global view for this question will be very valuable for us. Please, Ken. Olga, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And first, I would have to make a shout out to Opora, um, uh, which has made such extraordinary efforts, not only in Ukraine, but throughout the region. And I want to thank you very much for, for that work. Um, I am sure most everyone at this gathering uh, has heard politicians, pundits, scholars and donors assert that elections do not a democracy make. Uh, it is a maddening to hear this argument for two reasons. First, it is a straw man, since I have never heard anyone make the case for equating democracy with elections alone. Second, the argument seems to intentionally or unintentionally undervalue the importance of elections. So by the way of introduction to this panel discussion, Let's remind ourselves of the significance of elections, a process that even autocratic regimes find it necessary to carry out, although they work very hard to predetermine its outcome. 
it is worth repeating that democratic elections embody numerous international, political, and human rights covenants. They reinforce the understanding that state sovereignty belongs to and flows from the people of a country, or is stated by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the will of the people shall be the basis for the authority of government. Elections, therefore, are organized explicitly to ascertain and honor the people's will as to who should occupy elected office and govern in the people's interest. It is ironic, therefore, that most of the autocratic regimes that seek to manage elections for their benefit are signatories to these same international instruments. The challenge is who and how do we hold them to account? Elections are singularly important because they are exercises that best demonstrate how government treats and respects its citizens. That is because they reflect how most every democratic institution functions. And beyond election management bodies, these institutions include the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, the security forces, the media, political parties, and civil society. In short, elections serve as a stress test for nearly every institution in a free society and for the compact between citizens and the government they represent. The first principle for democratic elections is inclusiveness, both for citizens who want to ex exercise their right to vote and for those who seek to be elected. This extends from the choice of a legal framework and the development of a voter registry to candidature requirements, election competition, and the ability to vote. The second principle is transparency, meaning that the process surrounding elections op is open to public knowledge and scrutiny. In short, the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information. These concern the right of electors to gain and share knowledge and opinions necessary to form their will and of contestants to communicate freely to the public. It also concerns the freedom of the news media to cover issues they deem to be significant to the public debates surrounding elections. And electors and electoral contestants must be provided with information about electoral procedures so that they may exercise their rights. Transparency also includes the ability of contesting parties, the media, and civil society to witness and verify the integrity of the campaign and the voting, counting, and the results tabulation procedures. The third principle is accountability whereby effective and impartial remedies are provided for violations of election-related rights. Finally, the inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability principles come together to illuminate public confidence in elections. If public confidence in the parties, the election authorities, the judiciary, security forces, and the media is shaken, the legitimacy of government itself will be placed in jeopardy. And it is important to note here that many of the growing number of protest movements and in some places, people power revolutions were not prompted by economic, but rather by political issues, and more specifically, by seriously flawed or fraudulent elections. Ukraine experienced this twice over the last two decades. Conversely, the prospect of democratic elections has served as a means to secure peace agreements in societies in conflict and to usher in democratic transitions. During the next hour or so, we will explore new challenges to democratic elections and how best to confront and overcome them. While Ukraine has come a long way since its earlier post-independence polls, certain problems continue to plague the electoral process. And I will conclude by just saying that I spoke over the weekend to Mary O'Hagan, who was NDI's former longtime resident director in Kiev, and many of you know and respect Mary as I do. I asked her for her message to a Ukrainian audience. She said that for any democracy to function, transitions of power have to be tolerable for the great majority of citizens. They have to believe that their rights will be respected even if their preferred party loses. For Ukrainians, that means organizing like hell to protect the integrity of elections so that voters can evaluate the process based not on who they believe should win, but rather on objective norms and standards. Uh, an important message, not only for a Ukrainian audience.
Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you, Kel. Ken, and please stay with us because we are going to continue to talk with you about everything. And the next speaker will be Peter Erbron. I believe that the, your general view uh, as an international expert, but uh, you have to, you stayed here for many years and you saw many electoral circles in Ukraine and you know very well Ukrainian history for this independent period. How to protect democracy? And will democracy win all over the world? Well, I would start out by giving a little bit of hope uh, to our discourse. And remember the time seven years ago when the revolution of dignity happened. At that time, thousands of brave Ukrainians took to the street to demand their right to a genuine democratic future. Many sacrificed their life in pursuit of this goal. It clearly now rests upon the rest of us, also today, to honor this and strive to strengthen democracy in every way. For many Ukrainians, the pace of post-revolution reform has not met their expectations. Disappointment prevails on, for example, ineffective battle against entrenched corruption, much discussed these past days, and stalled judicial reform. While these challenges are real, and indeed a priority for Ukraine to address in the years ahead, we must also recognize and build on where there is progress and genuine success stories. And electoral reform is indeed such an era, area. In the video we just saw, we saw the Economist uh, Democracy Index. And I'd just like to show what the Economist actually says about electoral reform. The orange line is the global trend. The red line is Ukraine. But if we look at elections as a reform area, we see that it has over the past years performed extremely well compared to even the global trend. Competitive and genuine elections are an essential building block for resilient democracies all over the world. For some reason, I should say for some nations, they are the means to a democratic transition. For others, they measure the health of long-standing democratic traditions. So it's important for us to look at these numbers and remind ourselves that we have a great responsibility in front of us. Despite significant political obstacles and ongoing conflict, occupation, and indeed a pandemic, Ukraine has, from an international perspective, generally performed well in the electoral reform area. If we look at a few very important highlights, which also reflects well in the international community, Ukraine removed its Yanukovych era election commission and has now installed a hard-working, neutral and progressive election commission which works every day closely with all stakeholders, the RADA, international society, civil society to improve elections in Ukraine. Ukraine dismissed its substandard old election laws and election systems and adopted a modern omnibus electoral code and introduced new ways in which the elections would be held much closer to European and international standards. Ukraine held elections in 2019 and 2020 that were deemed some of the best in Ukraine's history and which indeed led to a peaceful and orderly handover of power all the way from the presidency to communities all over Ukraine. So while the economist may say that global democracy has a very bad year, we do see here in Ukraine statements, as you can see here, from the European Parliament that genuinely recognizes that great progress has been made in Ukraine. While it is clear that global democracy is struggling, we gather today in a country that pulls the global trend on the quality of election up. There is indeed much work still to be done to propel this reform area forward. It is important for the international community to take a deep breath from time to time and recognize the historic progress here. We must highlight sustained electoral and democratic reform in Ukraine and make sure that these are well noted beyond the borders. This pushes back on the autocratic playbook, which equates democracy to chaos. 
It reminds the global community, especially those who aspire towards greater self-determination, that a democratic life is both attainable and sustainable. Important, Ukraine's electoral achievements reflect ambitions of the millions who continue to courageously take to the streets in Belarus, Russia, Myanmar, and beyond. It is also the success story that autocrats fear as it gives hope to their own citizens. Ukraine is hence a true beacon for many of the countries that aspire to do better on electoral reform. Challenges still remain, and we'll be discussing those further today. We definitely need to look for strengthened political parties and representation in general. We need to work on modernizing the electoral institution itself by implementing the CEC's excellent five-year strategic plan. We need to further strengthen the legal framework and conduct even better elections in 2023 and 2024 towards proving long-term maturity of democracy in Ukraine. And lastly, we must protect politics and elections against disinformation, cyber attacks and interference by both domestic and international spoilers. We must also be careful with introducing new technologies such as internet-based voting, which might, seem, which might be very vulnerable against such. But all in all, I think we're here today and we can recognize the fact that electoral reform has actually made some significant step forward as long as we're also well aware that challenges remain. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your very deep statement about everything and about solving the problem, how to solve the problem and about hope that Ukraine can be a leader in this region and can be a good example for our neighbors how to fight for free and fair elections. And Alex knows very well how Ukrainian history with, with elections looked like and now he's fighting for democratic election in Belarus. So Alex, say us a few words Will we have democratic Belarus? Uh, thank you Hello, very much welcome. for having me. The short answer is yes, we will have democratic Belarus. I have no doubts about that. And uh, I'll give you a longer answer as well. I think that the struggle that we are in in Belarus since August last year and from before that as well, is such a lasting one exactly for the reason that we are looking for only peaceful and democratic solutions to the current crisis. It is the deep conviction of mine that it is only through the good elections that we will be able to resolve the uh, crisis in Belarus and to build a new democratic country. I think that uh, looking at the trends around us and globally, I think this also gives me hope for the future of, uh, of my country, of Belarus. I can see that the elections are getting better technically around the world. But I think that we, uh, if we look back about 10, 20 years ago, a lot of the technical issues that we have been noticing back then, and I was working as the, you know, the international observer back then, a lot of the technical issues were resolved by now. What we are facing now is consolidating the progress made, but it's also about not forgetting that politics is deeply ingrained in the electoral process. Let's not lose sight that there is a fight in every election. So in a way, I don't think that we should see the and anticipate that the elections will be the moment of national reconciliation that will leave everybody and every single person happy. No, not at all. But the elections are always and the only peaceful way to resolve the conflicts that exist in the society, whether we like it or not. And that is exactly why we are insisting in Belarus that the elections will be the only way out of the current crisis. I will mention to you one thing in connection to Ukraine. I know very well the path and how long and winding that path is towards democracy and improved elections in our neighboring country. The propaganda in Belarus and in some other countries keeps saying, oh, do you want democracy to result in things being just like they are in Ukraine? 
they have been looking at the, the difficulties that the Ukrainian society and politics has been facing for a number of years. And these messages from propaganda, let's face it, they were resonating with some people. But by now, the progress that Ukraine has made, especially in terms of the electoral reform and holding democratic elections, allows very many people in my country, in Belarus, to say, yes, we actually do want things to work at least as well as they do in Ukraine, at least in the elections. So I think uh, for us in Belarus, it is important to always remember, and I call on our neighbors and others as well, to remember that the fight for democracy has no borders. When the Ukrainians are going out on the streets, um, as they did seven years ago, they did that for their neighboring countries as well. When Belarusians are protesting and are still struggling, they're doing this to uphold the democracy, not only in our home country, but they're doing it for the principles that we all share, that are common for all of us who want the brighter future for ourselves and our children. And with this, I'm ready to continue the discussion. Thank you, Alex. And Alina uh, is a leader in Ukrainian parliament because she is fighting day by day, week by week, month by month, for best, best practices in legislation. When we are talking about electoral code, during the last two years, we had more than 50 committee meeting or a working group meeting in a committee platform uh, when different experts try to find the common solution how to, uh, to have best norms in Ukrainian election legislation and you are uh, the leader in this process and the most responsible MP when you fight in, in the uh, parliamentary hall uh, uh, one amendment per another amendments uh, during committee or uh, plenary session meetings. So uh, give us a chance to understand, is it a difficult fight or you have enough support from your uh, p party in the parliament and civil society and international experts? Will we have the best electoral court in this region during the next uh, few weeks, uh, sorry, years? Thank you, Olya, for your question. First of all, I want to welcome all my colleagues and Olya, you know, uh, your question already sounds quite optimistic. It sort of answers itself. I will definitely get to that. But first, I want to mention that indeed at today's forum, we are discussing some current issues and they are urgent not only today, not only in the present perspective, but also in the historical dimension, because uh, every process, be it development, be it stagnation, is a certain story. And I want to go back to history for a moment, to political science, which defines democracy as a political regime. One of um, uh, classic political scientists, um, David Easton, uh, defined a political regime as a presence of formal and informal structures which function, which somehow interact among themselves and come up with solutions which are later implemented in practice. And indeed, the existence of um, formal institutions is important. For example, multi-party elections, when there is more than one party taking part in the elections, this is also an aspect of democracy. But are those formal institutions enough to show democracy? No, not always. Why? Because alongside those formal institutions, there are certain informal, I would even say, breakthrough institutions. And those are exactly um, uh, the ones that we are talking about today. We have undermining institutions like corruption. And when I speak about corruption, I don't only mean bribery, but there are also a lot of other phenomena, such as nepotism, and favoritism and other phenomena which uh, are reflected in the development of the democratic regime. But at the same time, uh, provided the availability of formal and informal structures, the political regime itself is impossible without 
the main thing without its actors, without the people who directly shape the opinion, who affect the decision making. And when it comes to this aspect, of course, I would like to um, name uh, such primary actors as civil society and the international community. They show us best practices, they show us uh, standards, they show us what we need to strive for, and we then advocate that. Uh, and the such organizations advocate that and lobby for that, and uh, decision makers eventually um, fulfill them if there is a will to do that. And you know, if we look at this story in the Ukrainian perspective, I want to say that we are celebrating 30 years of Ukraine's independence this year. This way was uh, quite a dynamic struggle for democracy for us. We should remember the three revolutions that we uh, had. Mm. They are the very events which prevented the spread of this autocratic regime. And those events actually showed that Ukraine has an active civil society capable of influencing processes. And one of the examples that uh, I would uh, bring up uh, when it comes to improving electoral legislation, actually those were the changes which helped Ukraine uh, gain 8.25 out of 10 points in the category electoral processes and pluralism uh, in the study by the economist uh, which Peter has already mentioned today and this is a great example of course elections are not the only thing that stipulates democracy but this small aspect is a contribution in the development of Ukrainian democracy overall so of course I would like to urge all the stakeholders the government the society organizations non-governmental organizations the media to establish a constructive dialogue because that is the only way that we can hope for democracy uh, getting more developed uh, and for the amendments to the electoral code. Thank you. And the next circle, we are going to talk about prevention of, of authoritarianism. The crisis of liberal democracy and authoritarian regimes is difficult to effectively resist through political and diplomatic methods. Elections as a peaceful way of transferring power is it itself sufficient. To what extent is electoral democracy able to prevent authoritarian leaders from gaining power and what can be the means of counteraction? And my first question uh, will be to Alex, because uh, now uh, in our region you are fighting for free and fair elections. From another hand, we saw this authoritarian regime for many, many years, elections by elections. How to prevent such situation in other countries? Thank you very much. I think it's a, I'm glad we're starting from me because this is an unfolding process in Belarus. Taking a look back 27 years ago, let's remind ourselves that Lukashenko came to power through rather democratic elections. At that time, very few people could have anticipated, very few people did in fact anticipate how autocratic the regime would become and how tyrannical it would become by this point in time. But what we're dealing with right now is exactly the fallout of the repeatedly falsified elections. I think that what, we, what we're looking at since last August is how elections as the process, as an institution in a democracy, has taken again the center of the stage in the public opinion and in the public perception of what democracy is actually all about. Uh, I will remind you that, for example, that Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, the elected leader of Belarus, has stood for elections last year with one simple message. And her message was not that I will be the good president. Her message was very, very simple. I am running to become the president to hold good elections. Her plan was and still is 
to hold good elections as soon as the opportunity presents itself and as soon as we start the transition to the to democracy so i think we we are indeed uh, a quite a unique in a quite a unique situation right now in belarus that we all know intellectuals professionals people who know the world and the processes elsewhere we know and ken is very right elections is not the only thing in the democracy we know that for a fact but for our immediate struggle today starting from last august something that started from the deeply fraudulent and obviously falsified elections we do put elections into the center of the fight for the for democracy we do it not to prevent the authoritarian leaders from coming to power we do it because we know that the elections is the only peaceful way to get rid of the bad government once we do that we will have the hope that no matter who we elect in those democratic elections we will be able to get rid of them as well peacefully calmly and democratically that is the logic and the idea behind our current struggle thank you alex and my next question will be to ken wolok uh, you know we have another place in the world myanmar uh, where the people are fighting for democracy through elections, but the army people decided that they are not going to uh, to expect that the results or to accept the results of those elections. And we had a COPE there, and whole international society, time to time, said something publicly about deeply concerning uh, position, but what we have to do together on international and local level to support Myanmar's people, to support Belarusian people and other other. Well, uh, Olga, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I will come back to it in a second, but I wanted to begin where Alex left off. I think the, the Belarusian um, political class, the, the Belarusian Democrats, small d Democrats, made an important decision in recent years. There was a time when they boycotted a fatally flawed election process for fear that they would legitimize a bad election. They decided that that did not achieve any discernible results. And they learned a lesson from Democrats in other countries that you participate, you use whatever political space exists, not to legitimize a flawed process, but rather use whatever space exists to legitimize itself, to legitimize those forces themselves. Um, and that was the great lesson. And I think the Belarusians demonstrated that they were able to win using this strategy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the regime used very, very, very traditional means to stifle the, the, the opposition and the ultimate winners of the election. The role, I think, of the international community under these circumstances is not to support the electoral apparatus of a country, but rather to build democracy and to empower citizens to participate in the process, um, to use it to legitimize themselves and to expose the process for what it is. There are times when that can succeed. We remember the Philippine People Power Revolution, remember the sit in Chile, the referendum for the plebiscite, we remember in Nicaragua in 1990. There are times when citizens, including in Belarus, can overpower uh, the process, overpower the, the, uh, uh, the unfairness of the process and succeed. If they don't, they are in a much stronger position to continue the democratic struggle after the election and to organize themselves for the next electoral contest. In Burma, we have a situation now where the regime is one where it's using all the traditional means uh, to brutalize their own citizens. Ultimately, the international community has a responsibility to support those that are engaged in the struggle, not only in the country, but those who have left the country over the border in Thailand and elsewhere. Um, as it is going back to what the situation was prior to the election process that brought the National League for Democracy to power. 
we're going back to old methods of supporting an opposition so it does not atrophy, that it can continue to fight, to share information, to organize, and hopefully through international sanctions and other means, there will be, again, a return to a situation where they can begin to organize normally and ultimately prevail in a democratic process. Thank you, Ken. Next one will be Peter. So, to what extent can elections organized in conditions after the end of armed conflict be assessed in terms of regular peaceful standards for the organization of fair and free and elections? What we as society, international society, local civil society have do before, far, far before that elections, or how to protect the human rights and political rights on Donbas, on those territories which are under Ukrainian government control to have their own self-government? Thank you very much for this important question. Obviously, the situation in Donbas is absolutely unique and will require unique uh, solutions if the peace process gets going again. But there is much that can be learned from the history of post-conflict elections lessons that we should examine as we look for uh, solutions moving forward. It's very important to see elections as a part of a peace process, not as an event in itself. And often it does give hope because it can establish new government, but at times it also represents great risk because it can exasperate previous disagreement between the opposing sides of a conflict. And therefore, the elections held in post-conflict scenarios are dramatically different than our everyday standard election that we are used to, and we need to look at them as such. In post-conflict elections, we often see former combatants facing off in a democratic contest instead of as enemies in the battlefield. And it is fundamental that the electoral process itself and the electoral outcomes are trusted by all involved, all sides involved in such elections, and therein lies the true, the true challenge. And therefore, when elections are held post-conflict, it often requires many more measures that ensure a higher level of transparency, a higher level of scrutiny, a higher level of justice, and hence a higher level of integrity in the election itself. One example of uh, such measures is uh, indeed uh, much higher level of domestic and international observation required because we must show that the electoral process is done with integrity. Therefore, responsible post-conflict elections often take much more time to prepare. If we look at history of Dutch elections, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Eastern Slavonia, it often takes a year or more from the time that we take the decision there must be election to election day. It's very seldom the three months that we can hold an election in most countries, which is everyday standard elections. So we need to do much more. Special legal frameworks are needed. We often need significantly more funding. We often need to look at joint election management constructs where all sides have some say in how the election is being held. And we need to look at special evaluation of these elections so that they can be trusted afterwards. And here national civil society has a very, very important role, not only as the watchdogs and as observers, like your organization does so well, but also in advocating for peaceful, well-informed, fair and effective processes leading up to these elections. And that is national, society, uh, national civil society on all sides that must do this. Internationals also traditionally takes a much bigger role in post-conflict elections if called upon. Clearly, they will often field election observation, as we see in Ukraine also, but sometimes this is far more robust than we see in normal elections. But internationals also, at times, are called upon to make a significant contribution to the actual management of the election if former opposing sides cannot agree on how these elections should be held. And at times, internationals do raise significant funding and help make sure that the technical uh, assistance and the necessary resources are 
um, available for this. There are many historic examples that Ukraine is already looking at, and there's been numerous study trips to places around the world. One that I was very close to was Eastern Slavonia, where we saw one example of international intervention, namely a UN-led transitional administration, which was called upon to hold an election, bring governance back to the area, and this area, in this case Eastern Slavonia, was after a good election return to Croatian rule and is today a productive part of, the, of Croatia and a part of the European Union. So uh, the most important thing I think in this regard for all of us, civil society, international players, legislatures and so forth, is to be mindful of that elections held after, after conflict are far more complicated and far more risky and therefore they require special attention. Thank you, Peter. Allow myself to actually clarify the question to Lina. Is it possible that Ukraine might have authoritarian regimes? This history shows that it is rather complicated to establish it because the society uh, apprises at the moment when actually not all instruments of authoritarian regimes have been used. Fortunately, we have and we had leaders who gave up using force against their own people, how it happened in 2004. No matter how it was, still there was a political consensus to go to, for the third round and to have a repeated second round voting during the presidential elections. Is it possible for Ukraine to have authoritarian leaders or the society is already more mature to stop this movement? If not, what kind of preventative measures we should already take against such opportunity, which can potentially arise? Olya, thanks for the question. Well, I cannot, I wouldn't want to say yes, but we can still talk about preventative measures. By making a short uh, trip uh, back to history, we saw that starting from 1970s, the whole world was in the wave of optimism about democracy developing. There was the so-called third wave of democratization. And the optimism actually did not justify itself. In some places, partially it worked. Some countries managed to reach consolidated democracy. Some countries reached consolidated autocracy. And uh, we are asking ourselves questions. How did it happen? And where are these countries now? Well, the practice. Uh, Talks uh, uh, tells about uh, these countries as being in the gray zone and having some sort of hybrid regime. And uh, why have some countries not managed to achieve this consolidated democracy? There are lots of factors here. These factors are both endogenic and exogenic, both internal and external. And uh, we even see that when we observe and analyze the events which are happening in the neighboring countries. And, uh, it is important to note here that for the countries to leave the gray zone or to fully avoid that uh, uh, situation, you have to ask questions and reflect. There is a certain deciding feature in all these hybrid regimes when leaders allow certain competition, like either they pretend that they allow this uh, competition, that's also possible. But I think that this hybrid regime can be uh, uh, covered if we actually do elections, if we have ballot boxes, when enough people come to elections, when they uh, are united by an idea, when there is stronger position. So this is a chance for hybrid regimes to uh, actually move forward and make a step towards democracy. And uh, Peter has already mentioned uh, some good examples of peaceful transfer of power via elections. There are also worse examples that Ola mentioned as well. But uh, in the end, this can be also said about Ukraine, that the elections themselves, they are actually not a thing in itself, and they are not the magic bullet. 
because the information that people obtain also influence voters' choice. And now we have an impression that the world lives in some disinformation flow, misinformation flow. We are going to talk about that in more detail. And probably the founding factor in this whole story for us, for Ukraine and for neighboring countries should be uh, actually, the rule of law in the widest possible understanding, clear procedures which would be understandable, transparent, open, inclusive, and along with that, we also need clear distribution of uh, work among all three branches of power, because when the executive doesn't work or the law enforcement doesn't work well enough, when the judicial power is not independent, and no, then in this case, elections remain exclusively a smokescreen and uh, saying or claiming that elections are a solution to all problems, of course, then it's not something that we could do. Uh, for the breach to the next topic, but I have to react somehow uh, for your, uh, to your words. And I'm happy that in Ukraine it's possible, I can imagine the same in Belarus and Russia, unfortunately, that representatives of presidential party, MP from the fraction from presidential party, said that strong opposition is a tool as a check and balance system against authoritarian regime. Very smart, very smart. So the next one, uh, the next topic will be about misinformation and disinformation. Uh, participatory democracy and the freedom to form political will in the context of the increasing role of misinformation and social networks. Public opinion has already been used to manipulate by gaining access to citizens' personal data. Can we hope that the will of the voter is formed independently and reflect internal beliefs, because somehow algorithms from social media give us a chance to know only that information or um, political advertising which are targeting to us nothing else, and somehow we can, as voters, be excluded from the real field how to adopt our position during elections if we have the, the misinformation in social media. Uh, is any possibility to solve the problem through legislation or it's a huge philosophical discussion how to be because it's a freedom of speech at the same misinformation uh, it's a huge problem that's why let's try to find the solution in this area Kenneth, can you give us a chance to understand what is going on uh, through your experience your organization uh, NET, NDI, uh, and U the USA had the same problem during last few electoral circles. Okay. We didn't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. I muted. Yeah. The purveyors of disinformation come largely from four sources each operating with different motives. They are autocrats who use it to garner support and discredit civil society and the political opposition. They are external actors with the epicenter being Moscow, Beijing, and Tehran, who employ disinformation to pollute democratic discourse, skew electoral outcomes, and more broadly discredit democratic systems. And they are political competitors in a democratic space who want to gain political advantage. And they are apolitical actors who are motivated by monetary gain. Uh, we should remember that during the final three months of the 2016 presidential campaign in the United States, the top 20 performing false election stories generated more engagement on Facebook than the top performing stories from the major news outlets. And those stories originated by, from websites whose IP addresses originated from the small Macedonian town of Veles. They are a band of mostly poor, non-ideological young people in their teens and 20s created false news industry, making clickbait fortunes. 
disinformation campaigns have proven to be effective. First and foremost, because fake news has been shown to travel faster and deeper uh, than the regular news or even facts, uh, fact checking responses. And disinformation tends to reinforce or play upon the predisposed views that many citizens have of government. When recent polls show that a majority of citizens in democratic uh, societies have little trust in government or are dissatisfied with their democracy, it is easy to understand how different disinformation can have real impact. And now there are many theories on how to combat information manipulation. Disruption tactics include regulating social media platforms, establishing norms and standards for online behavior, and blocking content or platforms. Uh, exposure includes verification systems, such as a facts checking and counter messaging campaigns, such as the work being done by Stop Fake in Ukraine. Competition usually involves government or corporate communication efforts aimed at countering disinformation nar narratives. Uh, at the same time, support for independent media, both online and offline, and literally uh, literacy efforts, which are being carried out in uh, Ukraine, promotes the supply and the consumption of information that's accurate. One thing is clear, however, and there is no silver bullet to disinformation. All these approaches must come into play because it is not enough to fight bite for bite. Disinformation is cheap and ubiquitous. It would be like fighting a fire hose of disinformation with a squirt gun of truth. Ultimately, a whole of society approach is needed in countries under attack, backed up by international networks for the development of norms and standards, advocacy and peer learning and support. These global networks, like many of their local counterparts, include governments, intergovernmental organizations, journalists, educators, religious labor and business leaders, political parties, parliaments, and civil society groups of all stripes. And ultimately, I will say, the success will also depend on the performance of democratic institutions that can overcome the current crisis of confidence in politicians and government. That is a longer term struggle, but no less important. These institutions must deliver for the many and not the few. And that is perhaps the best antidote against disinformation. Thank you, Ken. Alex, in authoritarian regimes, somehow Telegram channel as in Belarus, WhatsApp as in Jordan, and many, many other uh, examples when uh, there is only one field for freedom, for free com freedom and for free communication between society and opposition, it's social media. But in Ukraine, the social media, the Telegram channels is a source of problem and misinformation. How to find the golden standards uh, or golden border to have freedoms? but do not have a source of the problem for democratic society from that side? Excellent question. And if I had the answer, I'd be a millionaire by now. But <laughs> I'll speculate a little bit. First, importantly, I think, yes, indeed, social networks, particularly Telegram in Belarus, uh, is the source of uh, credible information, op uh, information that is um, important for the citizens of Belarus right now, not least because there are virtually no media outlets in the traditional sense left in Belarus. You have all seen what happened to, to .by, uh, literally a couple of uh, weeks ago. This is unprecedented. This is the website that, has, that had the reach of 60% of uh, citizens of Belarus. Everybody on a, of any political persuasion would be starting their day from looking at the news on that website. It doesn't exist anymore, but that's just a development of what's been going on for a while. So yes, the Telegram channels are there, but you'd be surprised that, or maybe you won't be surprised. We all understand that people who are reading the Telegram channels, and those are millions of people in Belarus, they do not need the persuasion 
they already stand firmly on the democratic principles, very, most of them at least. What we need is to reach out to the people who don't read the Telegram channels. So I think what is being done right now, and that is actually happening as we speak, every month, several hundred thousand leaflets are printed out and distributed in the small towns and villages of Belarus. And we're going back to 100 years ago on how to reach out to people, not only because they, the Telegram channels don't reach them, but also because we know that the people who we need to convince that democracy has a value, they actually don't even use the internet. So I think uh, we shouldn't be forgetting about uh, the people who are not online when we're discussing about the problems that the online sphere creates. What I want to highlight as well as the key issue, one of the key issues in my mind about the um, misinformation, disinformation. I feel that in the case of Belarus and especially last week or so, the key issue is not presenting false information to convince people about something. The issue is about shifting focus. Take a look at what's going on with the Ryanair flight right now. The propaganda of Belarusian regime and of uh, the propaganda in Russia is highlighting, is focusing very much on was Protasevich, the journalist who was taken off the, the airplane, was his uh, girlfriend, was he in uh, the east of Ukraine and what was he doing there? Frankly, we all know that he was there as a journalist. And in the end of the day, it doesn't even matter at the moment. The focus should be kept on the fact that Belarusian regime is becoming a threat to international security and that that person has been taken off the airplane illegally and is most likely being tortured right now in prison. So in the end of the day, the disinformation is not about convincing us about something. It's about shifting focus from what actually matters in the, in the heat of the moment. And carrying on from what Kenneth was saying, I think it's a, it is extremely important to remember that disinformation and the use of data in the elections is not just about the information. It's about the atomization of the electoral process. We used to have an elections, elections that were about finding compromises. We all knew that you cannot have the brand new house at the same time that I would have a brand new car. Let's agree that you will have a smaller house than you want, and I will have an older car than I want. And in the end, we can coexist. But when we atomize this process, because we are, our private data, our personal preferences are used, then that's the recipe for us to be disagreeing after the election. Because you're not going to get the bigger house. I'm not going to get the, the best car I want. And coming to an election with the perception that we will all get everything that we want is creating the problems for the future. So I think we need to think of this not only in terms of uh, what, what information we consume and what information gets presented to us. But just to repeat what I agree with fully was uh, Ken, the democracy needs to deliver for many, not just a few. And then we can actually have a meaningful discussion about having compromises in the elections. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and next two speakers, please, five minutes. And then we will have the final round per one minutes. Okay, uh, Peter, can a political position be freely formed in condition when informational bubbles targeted political advertising form our idea of political life and processes? Who are the source of decisions? So the short answer is the individual citizen. I completely agree with all the measures that Ken outlined, but one important factor runs across this issue, and that is education. A great philosopher once said that democracy has to be born again for every generation, and education is what gives birth to democracy. And I genuinely believe that is one of the most important aspects of us fighting back on this, um, on this issue. Our ability as individuals, as societies, to critically process the ever-growing onslaught of information and disinformation will profoundly influence the health of our modern democracies throughout the world. And that is also what we call the older democracies, which are seriously impacted by this uh, also. 
with the technologies that continuously evolve, nations must carefully consider what skills, values, and rules their electorate should have to responsibly use these powerful communication tools rather than being used by them and by the algorithms. Through our nearly 35 years of experience around the globe, IFAS has found overwhelming evidence that effective and systematic civic education on how to live in a democratic society fosters much greater democratic resilience also against disinformation. We can do so through interactive training that strengthens fundamental skills such as digital literacy and critical thinking. And we must offer students, citizens, the tools they need to be mindful consumers of the information that they will, no matter what, be receiving. Uh, one such example is uh, that IFAS at this very moment works in with, with 70 universities all over Ukraine, Georgia, and Armenia to offer modern civic education through a semester-long course. And I find extreme relief in some of our work focusing on the next generation of citizens and seeing that through civic education we are capable of building um, young adults that come out as voters and are far more resilient against disinformation than we have uh, than we might be um, at this moment but while such uh, growing efforts are promising i do believe that much more must be done to respond to today and tomorrow's threats against democracy and to maximize the global positive impact on effective civic education and all other forms of education this is key to building democratic habits and expectations among all citizens to offer healthy governance that they will embrace and carry with them throughout their lives. So my pitch would be for investing in the next generation while also using a multi-pronged approach where we do all the things that other speakers have highlighted. Excellent. Alina. Alina, we are choosing an easy path of uh, adding some legislative um, approaches um, or uh, we are uh, shaping this among the older generation as well. Of course, I am an advocate of the second option. Mm. Because we definitely need to increase the legal and legislative culture of our citizens. We need to work on education because this conscious choice is made based on the uh, information available to the person. But of course, we're going to also use the other way that you have mentioned. This is the issue of developing legislative initiatives and amendments to the electoral code of Ukraine. And the uh, question of elections is closely tied to uh, the issue of uh, information and democracy. When I looked at the issues of information and manipulations, I immediately thought of this uh, uh, phrase, if you think you're not being manipulated, it means you are working with pros. This is not just about electoral campaigns. The, uh, when we generally observe all information events that are taking place, we often get the impression that we are being manipulated. Of course, there are a lot of different information channels. As a voter in Ukraine, uh, uh, in the first place, I can look at a multitude of channels to obtain certain information to make a conscious choice. But there is also uh, uh, the, uh, the flip side of this coin. When 
and the authorities can look for certain information through voters. And knowing certain preferences, lifestyle and thoughts of a certain voter, they can shape a certain information field where there will be no alternative opinion, where there will be no place for such uh, dissenting opinion. Of course, we need to fight against that. I also want to point out, um, Ole, you and I already talked about this. We already talked about um, um, this information. We had a round table dedicated to this issue. And one example that we discussed in Ukraine was the example of the most recent electoral campaigns um, when there were widespread fake social uh, surveys or even smear campaigns. And today our task as decision makers is to come up with clear mechanisms and rules. But on the one hand, those mechanisms need to ensure uh, the ability to clearly promote your ideas, your slogans, but on the other hand, they need to restrict those manifestations of disinformation. And wrapping up my presentation, of course, I want to particularly highlight the uh, educational activity because education is what actually helps us make the right choice, the conscious choice. And this is where civil society organizations get actively engaged. This is the activity they uh, partner with us in. And going back to my previous statement, uh, we as authorities and civil society need to work together closely to come up with effective mechanisms that will fight against this information. I'm a very democratic moderator. That's why we, uh, we have only uh, one minute per each panelist to answer the last question, the last circle of the question. So how to strengthen the uh, electoral institutions and elections as institution? I know that you have many, many ideas, but only three, the main targeting objectives for Ukrainian civil society groups, our MPs, and other. I hope that our experience will be fruitful for other countries. Ken, please. Sorry, unmute, unmute your phone. I'm sorry. Um, we're marking in 2021, 15 years of a global recession. Let me just speak briefly about a larger sweep of history. If you look at the world 40 years ago, there was Soviet occupation that stretched to the borders of Western Europe. Latin America was dominated by military juntas. Um, in dictatorship or military regimes, we're in control in much of South and East Asia. And also Africa, in 1960, between 1990, only four African heads of state step down in a peaceful way after losing an election. That figure since 1990 uh, is more than 50. Two things have changed in the world today. The first, people are in a demanding mood. They want to put food on the table, and they also want a political voice. And second, there is an international democracy architecture that did not exist 40 years ago. This architecture includes governments, intergovernmental organizations, civil society groups, election monitors like Opora, democracy NGOs, political parties, parliaments, development agencies, election management bodies, and media groups. I think the great challenge for us is to how to harness this architecture, how to make it, strengthen it, and make it work. It is not perfect but it exists today that didn't exist 40 years ago. Thank I think you. it's a great challenge, but there is something to work with today. And it's all of our responsibilities to help build and expand this democratic architecture. Thank you, Ken. It looks like a guideline, not as three solutions. Peter, your turn. I think that Ukraine has shown the way in how we might be able to better realize electoral reform around the world by the extreme level of openness and collaboration that exists between all involved stakeholders in our reform process here. I have never witnessed anywhere else in the world over all the years 
an environment where civil society, legislators, international implementers, donors such as USAID, UK aid, government of Canada, everyone collaborates closely with each other towards a common goal and that is to improve elections for Ukraine. So my advice would be openness and collaboration and I think we must make sure that we continue to having that here. Thank you, Peter. Alex, your turn. I'll focus in this last minute on specifically how to help the progress of democracy and elections in Belarus, not globally, but in my home country. I think what I'm calling for is the assistance and the support to put to use this whole architecture that Ken just mentioned for the success of the democratic transition in Belarus. I think there are two reasons to do that. First is that it's the right thing to do to support the democratic struggle in Belarus. And the second reason is that it is actually a good investment. And it is a good investment because we know how to hold good elections and we are ready and we want to join the democratic world. In, the, in fact, I'm deeply convinced that the last nine, 10 months have shown that the people of Belarus are already Democrats. So we need to find a ways to put the this architecture of support to democracy globally to make sure that the people of Belarus bring along their country and their government. Thank you, and with Alex. this appeal, I end. Thank you, Alex. Uh, final but not least. Mm. Thank you, Olya. I definitely know that we don't have a universal recipe, but we do have three key things that we need to fight for. The first thing is the fight against political corruption. The second thing is the development of civil society. And, um, of course, uh, establish a clear practices through legislation. Thank you very much for your high assessment of our work. And only in cooperation can we achieve good Results. work hard and thank you all my panelists because it was amazing words from different parts of the world and our experience is good for our neighbors. Thank you. Next to me, there is one of the partners of the Conference Zero Corruption, Roland Kovac, who is the director of the program, which is advised by USAID and is implemented by PACT in Ukraine. Thank you for joining us and for the support of this brilliant event. Thank you for having me and thank you for the Anti-Corruption Action Center. Thank you for all the partners and thank you, you know, of course, for leading us through these two days. Oh, it's a pleasure and uh, it's still us. I think it's very important that in the country which actually claimed their oligarchization as the main anti-corruption strategy of the whole state, uh, that th th this is the first conference of such level organized without oligarchs. And Roland, uh, why did PACT, why did Engage program decided to support such independent from the oligarchs, oligarchs free uh, platform for dialogue? So this whole event started off about two years ago 
with some ideas that Hanna Daria uh, had, and we were discussing it, what would be the way for Ukraine to show its face that it really wants to show to the world, and especially what civil society in Ukraine would like to communicate about what are the changes that are happening here in the country. And then we realized that this is really the one place a conference by civil society which cannot be contaminated by any sort of dirty money. Civil society is the one that operates transparently and openly in this country and we wanted to demonstrate that to Ukrainians and to the rest of the world that it's possible. And it's a uniqueness, unfortunately still a uniqueness in Ukraine for, for the conference of such level. But let's say it will be a trend setting, trend setting a new way of discussing uh, geopolitics and democratic development. Civil society with European partners, with progressive Ukrainian politicians and with free media, independent media who, who help us to, to send this message uh, across the borders. This would be fantastic. If a one time event is not a trend, mm -hmm. if it happens the second time, it's a pair. <laughs> when we talk here the third time, three years from now, then we can talk about the trend. But certainly it would be very important for Ukrainians to understand that there is ways to do things differently than before. And obviously the revolution of dignity had helped to recognize that it is possible, but it happens day by day. Once the conference is over, the job is not done. Quite the contrary. When we talk here again next year or next next year, and we can say that Ukraine is a home for homegrown civil society that really is a role model for not just in the country, but the rest of the world, but certainly in the region, then I, I will be happy. I do believe that we uh, meet each other in such formats not for, the f not for the last time. And talking about future and how we can become even better. We are living in these times of hybrid threats for democracy, disinformation, system corruption, and law, uh, law wars. Um, what formats of dialogue could meet this, uh, these threats? Um, what would be the efficient answer to these threats? Uh, maybe uh, different conferences, different forums, just miss some moment, miss some, some topic, do not cover some topic. What should be uh, visible, what should become visible next time when we are talking about uh, democracy in action? So the first thing about this conference, which uh, two years ago when we begin, began to discuss it, it was going to be a very traditional conference conference, which of course uh, works in a certain setting, but in the post-COVID environment, we learned to actually interact with each other online and also sometimes offline, but most importantly, in real time. And I think what really is the uniqueness of today's event is that we're able to do real-time discussion from different parts of the world and with those who are, we call citizens, those who really benefit all of the reforms, all of the changes. And contribute into these changes. We, we heard the voices of uh, the uh, anti-corruption activists from, uh, across the world, from across the world. And that's, I think, is the crucial thing t to preserve for, f for the future too. How to... So strengthen the voice of citizens. How to regularly interact with citizens. Not only strengthen their voice, but first listen to them. Hear what they want us to do. Hear what they want you to do, first and foremost. And really reflect on their demands. So what do active citizens want actually in times of a pandemic? How a COVID pandemic influenced uh, your strategy in Ukraine, your action plan? Because I know that uh, Doluchaisa Engage, Engage program uh, really engages citizens in all regions of Ukraine. What have changed during the last one and a half years? So first of all, COVID of course had impacted everyone not just us, not just Ukraine, but, stop. but the rest of the world. Uh, and it has, it's not yet over, we should be clear about that. But what has changed is, is that there was a really rapid learning process for the whole of the world, and it's true for Ukrainian civil society organizations too. Uh, and this sort of adaptation, since we are extremely demand driven, uh, is the adaptation that we would learn from ourselves and we would reflect on our programming as, as well. So to, just to give you a very specific example, most of the anti-corruption institutions have been focused on certain topics before the pandemic started. Now, if you look around, 
all around the world, anti-corruption organizations, both government and non-government, are keeping a very close eye on public procurements of public health services, medicines, obviously vaccination, there's a race for vaccines around the world, uh, which leaves a further grind, of course, for mal, uh, uh, behaviors. But this is what organizations, citizens, and, and the governments can keep control under. David Stulik today uh, told during the panel that we are a, bit, a, bit, a little bit lacking the view from a side because we are in Ukraine very concentrated uh, on our internal processes. But you, as a Hungarian originally, already work and live in Ukraine for 10 years. How quick is our adaptation system after the revolution of dignity? Could you just remind us to what extent have we changed during the last seven years or ten years, which, which you, in which Ukraine you arrived and where do you live now? Sure, actually it's more than ten years wow. <laughs> that I'm here uh, and I can tell that, that uh, the events of 2013 and 2014 and not just the revolution but what unfortunately happened afterward and Ukraine still grapples with it uh, also provided a, a, a huge impetus for changes in the country and just to give you examples, 10 years ago, when I would be discussing environmental concerns with even partners of Ukraine, it would be on the back burner. It would be not the most important thing, as they would say. Now you go around in cities of Ukraine and everybody is on their electric scooters. Uh, you go to villages and they are sort their, their uh, communal waste, things that 10 years ago they would say, we don't have waste. Um, uh, inclusion, diversity, it was not a topic, it was not even a discussion point 10 years ago. And now we have the strongest women leaders in Ukraine. Ukraine is leading the region uh, in supporting people living with disability, leading the region uh, for people uh, uh, with uh, different sexual uh, orientations. So it's much more, more comfortable country now? It's certainly a much more comfortable country for a European. Uh, and I'm not sure about being a Hungarian, it's much more comfortable. No. Uh, this is one thing that's... My last question was actually what Hungarians for me. could learn from, from Ukrainians. Uh, is there anything? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> in, in my country, uh, a lot of the, the people who I meet with when I go home, when I can go home, um, they actually ask what was really the recipe for, for Ukrainians. Um, and all that I can say is that they work together from different walks of life. Uh, there was no taboos and there were no sacred cows. Uh, and by doing that, they were really able to develop a vision and make that vision happen, at least on the short term for now. Thank you so much. Thank you for this view from the side and thank you for being inside of this fight, standing together shoulder to shoulder with Ukrainian anti-corruption <laughs> anti activists. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Ina. Now, I want to give the floor to the following uh, panel discussion. It's moderator Lena Halushka, who is the member of the Center for Fighting and Country and Corruption. And the topic is strong legislative response to strategic corruption as a hybrid threat to democracy and security globally. everyone for listening to our intense two-day solutions marathon. My name is Elena Halushka and I have the honor to moderate today's discussion with the distinguished guests, members of parliament from Ukraine and other countries on both sides of the Atlantic. We will discuss today how the legislators should respond to strategic corruption and other hybrid threats posed by, by the kleptocratic regimes to democracy. Defending democracy requires strong leadership, unity, and trustful cooperation, especially when your enemy is the kleptocratic regime uh, ruling 
authoritarian states. Dirty money, terrorism, disinformation, they disregard borders, especially when kleptocracies aim to use them to erode democracies from the inside. Not only successful examples of established democracies, but even more their alliances, their cooperation, and their potential to cherish transitional democracies and help supporting the reforms threaten autocrats much. Within this fight against kleptocracies, an important role lies in the hands of the legislators. So what can the lawmakers do domestically and internationally to tackle subversive activities of the kleptocratic regimes? To talk about these challenges and more important, to seek for the solutions, we have a panel of powerful speakers. I am honored to present to you on the stage we have Madam Anastasia Radina, Member of Parliament at the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, Chairwoman of Rada Anti-Corruption Committee. Online, Senator Sheldon White. Uh, online, Mr. Jan Lipavsky, Member of Parliament of the Czech Chamber of Deputies, Vice Chairman of the Committee on Defense and the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Hello. Hello, thank you very much for joining us online. Um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, U.S. Senator for the Rhode Island. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you so much, Senator, for joining us. Um, we also um, will have um, Mr. Laurinas Kaschunas, member of the Seimas of Lithuania, chairman of the National Security and the Defense Committee, who will join us a little bit later because they are having right now an important voting in the parliament. Also, we are having the pre-recorded addresses by Mr. Richard Skois, member of the Seima of the Republic of Latvia, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, U.S. representative from Pennsylvania. Uh, so, let's basically move to our discussion. Senator Whitehouse, I won't be the first person during this a uh, two-day online intense solutions marathon who will address the issue of the super um, active anti-corruption and anti-kleptocracy developments that are currently happening in the US. Just a few days ago, President Biden for the, for the first time ever officially declared the fight against corruption as the core national security interest. He stated, among other things, that corruption provides authoritarian leaders a means to undermine democracies worldwide. White House estimation is that the acts of corruption sap between 2 and 5 percent from global GDP. That's a lot. Um, Senator Whitehouse, you are one of the anti-corruption champions in the Senate. You are defending and advancing anti-corruption legislation. In order to implement President's memorandum, different, basically all governmental institutions will be engaged in the um, implementation of the anti-corruption measures. So please, could you tell us what are the priority steps the Congress intends to take in order to implement President Biden anti-corruption memorandum? Well, thank you. I would say that there are three principal steps. One is to um, make sure that we support the international initiative that uh, President Biden announced. Um, we don't have a date for it yet, but we want to make sure that it has the support of Congress, um, that voices in Congress uh, that support the anti-kleptocracy work uh, are heard there, um, and that we show the president as much support from the legislative branch as we can. This is a battle that many of us have been fighting for a long time, and to have the president treat this as a national security priority is really, really exciting. <laughs> to put it mildly, President Trump didn't see anti-corruption work as a national security priority. The uh, second thing is that we are starting anti-kleptocracy working caucuses in the House and in the Senate. The House of Representatives announced theirs 
and um, we will be announcing ours in the Senate. Uh, Senator Cardin and I are the two Democrat leads, and we are still working with our Republican colleagues to determine who the Republican leads will be, and then we'll have our own announcement. So at that point, both sides of the Capitol will have an anti-kleptocracy caucus, and I think that will be helpful. The third and final thing is that we were able to pass uh, the legislation to clean up American shell corporations, what's called the Beneficial Ownership uh, Disclosure Law. Um, it was a long battle, but we finally got it passed, and I think uh, both Republicans and Democrats who supported it are very proud of it. And our task right now is to make sure that the Treasury Department and the Department of Justice work together to implement the legislation with regulations that are as strong and forceful and effective as they can be. So those are our three primary goals, and they all fall under the overarching principle that you have described, which is that, in effect, there is a clash of civilizations in the world, and it's between rule of law and non-rule of law, whether it's criminals or kleptocrats or autocrats, the non-rule of law world is a danger to rule of law, and we need to stop subsidizing it and stop aiding and abetting it by giving it access to rule of law facilities and refuge, uh, particularly for ill-gotten gains. So thank you for convening this, and I'm delighted to be a participant. Thank you very much. Senator Whitehouse, you basically mentioned the establishment of the um, anti-kleptocracy and anti-corruption bipartisan caucus. Uh, and uh, we indeed very much look forward to its launch. Um, uh, it will be launched um, as it was announced um, basically in two days already, on the 10th of June, at least on the side of the House of the Representatives. And uh, we think that um, the very fact that the support against corruption has the bi bipartisan support um, in the Senate is a very important, not only for the US, but basically as the signal for the whole world and for the countries in transition, countries like Ukraine, that there is the big um, fight against anti-corruption, which is not limited to specific borders of the specific country, but it's gonna be the global crusade for, uh, as fighting against corruption. And we have, as I already mentioned, we have a pre-recorded video but co by Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, who is co-leading this anti-kleptocracy caucus initiatives from the side of the House. And he is also a co-chair of the Congressional US-Ukraine caucus. And let us see his address and uh, the, the goals and objectives of the fight against corruption that um, he communicates from his side. Hey everyone, Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick here, and I'm glad to be joining you today for the Zero Corruption Conference. And was pleased to be invited after meeting with a delegation of anti-corruption advocates in Washington, D.C. last month. This panel's topic of a strong legislative response to systemic corruption is as pressing now as ever. Systemic corruption remains a threat to democracy and security across the globe. Corruption is not beholden to one political ideology we're to one nation's borders. It spreads knowingly and unknowingly around the globe. Dirty money impoverishes everyday citizens from its nation of origin, and it strains the vitality of a nation's economy. The good news, a cooperative international effort is being waged to fight back against systemic government corruption. As the co-chair of the Congressional Ukraine Caucus, I have strived to strengthen the partnership between our two nations. A strong uh, partnership between the United States and Ukraine is critical and matters now more than ever. I will also be spearheading a new bipartisan caucus, the Congressional Caucus Against Foreign Corruption and Kleptocracy. This caucus will educate and mobilize members of Congress from both parties on the cross-jurisdictional nature of corruption and identify bipartisan opportunities to work together to end kleptocracy. The caucus is already working on new legislation that cracks down on those benefiting from corrupt schemes, especially when they are taking that money overseas. And I assure you, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle understand the challenges that Ukraine faces, and we will continue to provide the necessary resources and support, and we have your back. God bless you. 
we are very grateful for such an inspirational address by the Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick. Indeed, corruption makes countries vulnerable to the external malign influence. Um, Ukraine's successful democratic transformation is Putin's biggest nightmare. Ukraine's potential to cause tectonic changes in the whole region scare Putin, uh, uh, Russian's President Vladimir Putin very much. So apart from the occupation of Crimea and the conventional war on the east of Ukraine, the Kremlin actively orchestrates the aggressive anti-Western and anti-reform propaganda, disinformation campaign in Ukraine, which is obviously financed by the means of the strategic corruption. Um, among the biggest horns and those that disseminated the uh, propaganda um, uh, were the TV channels associated with Putin's crony Viktor Medvedchuk. Um, these TV channels actively attacked the reforms and the reforms as the personalities. They were aimed at delegitimization of the people who lead the reforms, as well as the, the, the deliverables of the reforms in the eyes of the society. Uh, fortunately, these TV channels were recently shut down. However, this took place only seven years after the Russian aggression started. Madam Radina, um, you are leading the anti-corruption committee for the last two years, but your anti-corruption work is not limited to that. You've been actively involved in the advocacy of the establishment of the new anti-corruption institutions. So you are very well aware, not only on the level of a person who knows about the reform. You were the doer, you were those who pushed this reform. Right now you are part of the parliament. Please tell us what Ukrainian lawmakers can do in order to strengthen Ukraine's capacities to tackle Kremlin's strategic corruption and the malign influences they try to perform in Ukraine using this strategic corruption as the tool. Uh, thank you very much for your question, Olena, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be part of uh, this very distinguished panel today. Now, uh, in the Ukrainian context, there are two key elements to combating, to combating strategic corruption. One of, uh, one of that is having a uh, robust, effective anti-corruption infrastructure uh, system of organizations who would be in a position to independently investigate, prosecute and deliver justice to cases for high-profile corruption. Another very important element is to have a strong counterintelligence institution that will be ready to deal with uh, threats coming from, uh, from Russia, or let's call things what they are. Both these uh, tasks are now, or successful implementation of both of that uh, tasks are now in the hands of uh, lawmakers. Although Ukraine has a established anti-corruption infrastructure, uh, working since uh, 2016. Now, as a result of recent decision of the Constitutional Court, we have a legal gap in operation of our key institution, which is National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Uh, the task of lawmakers now is to adopt new law on National Anti-Corruption Bureau, independent investigative body for tackling high-profile corruption, and to make sure that no vested interests that are still active in Ukraine have any loophole or opportunity to interfere, take under control operation of this institution, or have an opportunity to influence this institution through influencing uh, selection of its new director. As I'm seeing it, our key task in the parliament is to uh, make sure that legislation provides for a uh, crucial role of independent experts and decision maker of on who will be the next head of uh, anti-corruption bureau. And uh, without any exaggeration, this simple question, who selects the head of anti-corruption bureau, the answer to this question will define the future of anti-corruption fight in Ukraine for next seven years. Uh, as to other tasks of uh, Ukrainian parliament, we have to deliver on the reform which Ukraine expected for uh, generations. Uh, now we have a unique chance to finally reform our still, let's be honest, KGB-style security service into 
modern NATO style uh, counterintelligence institution. Uh, this draft law is in the hands of the parliament now and uh, as I'm seeing it our key task is to make sure that uh, state security service is no longer a law enforcement bodies where uh, where uh, no, no longer a uh, law enforcement body where sensitive cases just drown and never re-emerge before the court but instead uh, to make sure that SBU is a uh, NATO style counterintelligence institution without any uh, oppressive functions as to uh, interfering with human rights or law enforcement. Thank you very much. It might sound quite simple but we know very well that it is a super important and super complicated decision and the task. So we uh, indeed have to say good luck to the lawmakers who are pushing for the real reform of the security service of Ukraine, as well as the really independent uh, operations of the new anti-corruption infrastructure, because literally Ukraine's success will depend on the outcome of these reforms. Russian kleptocratic influence is now highly discussed in Czech Republic. Czech government recently came up with a statement that Russian intelligence officers were engaged in 2014 deadly warehouse explosions. As a result, Russian diplomats were expelled from the country. Czech media organizations reported the subsequent rise of the Russian propaganda related to the case, especially in the social media. So what we see again, that the kleptocracies are using a combination, a wide range of different instruments when they target a specific country. Mr. Lipavsky, what is being done in Prague now in order to strengthen country's resilience to malicious influence of the kleptocrats? Uh, thank you very much for this question and thank you very much for being invited to this very nice conference and forum on, uh, on corruption. Uh, primarily, I see corruption as a phenomenon that weakens society and the state. And the weak society is hardly able to defend itself against all sorts of threats, including hybrid threats. And what, what we can see uh, uh, in Vrbetice Kos, uh, but what you can see in many different countries, including Ukraine, it's a typical information warfare, spreading uh, spread of disinformation and uh, sometimes connected to hacking, cyber warfare, sometimes connected uh, to uh, international politics, uh, sometimes even to war. What Czech Republic does uh, to, what the Czech Republic does to counter uh, these influences? Uh, we have created commission on hybrid threats in uh, our parliament, uh, we convene regularly and uh, debate the state uh, of preparation on different levels. Uh, we, uh, and by, by the way, this commission was also very active in COVID-19 because uh, there's a lot of disinformation. It's a different topic, but same problem. Uh, we have a, a s approved governmental strategy on strategic communication, so-called STRATCOM, because effective uh, strategic communication of state, it's uh, helps uh, to fight disinformation and to put the positive narrative into uh, into media space. Um, so th those are the very specific issues uh, the Czech government deals with. Uh, I'm opposition MP, so uh, I could also criticize my government, but uh, those are the very uh, very few years of results we are able to achieve. And. Um, also, uh, the corruption creates uh, the environment where these uh, bad players, rook player, rock players, uh, can effectively work. So um, uh, it has a material and a psychological component. Uh, one thing is that you lose uh, through corruption uh, your resources, and. Uh, the other fact is uh, that it destabilizes the whole society. So the psychology uh, of living under a corrupt government is uh, less tangible, but to a certain extent also very dangerous. 
Thank you very much. Um, the situation indeed with this warehouse explosions is quite complicated and it had um, a very wide media uh, coverage uh, among the international media. And while commenting on this Czech development, the EU observer wrote that the expulsion of diplomats known to be linked to foreign intelligence seemed to confirm long-held fears that the embassy, Russian embassy, has acted as the hub for Russian covert operations. And it is believed that other countries in the region may face similar problems too. Basically, foreign covert operations are considered a real threat by Lithuania. This is reflected in the country's 2017 uh, national security strategy. On top of the list um, of the threats uh, mentioned in that strategy, is conventional military threat coming, f th which might be coming from the Russian side, foreign covert activities aimed at undermining Lithuania follow, and then we have also threats to the transatlantic unity, corruption, terrorism, they are also there on the list. Mr. Kashtunas, could you please tell us how this strategy is being implemented right now in practice and what are key further steps that Lithuanian lawmakers plan to take in the nearest future? So, hello, everyone. Everyone, thank you very much for, uh, for the attention, uh, for the invitation to this uh, conference. I just still have some, some, some ideas which we would like to, to share with you, of course. Uh, as you see in, in, in almost every country, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Russia has weaponized uh, almost everything in all domains, uh, military force buildup and project, projection information warfare, economic straightcraft, including energy and financial tools, build, build up of a fifth columns and our activities and adv adversaries against Lithuanian and our Western state and societies. And of course, uh, corruption is also one of the uh, of, 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 uh, of the weapons. So uh, what we already did and what we are trying to do and what we are planning to do, uh, because uh, the pr problem is that the influence can spread uh, not only using uh, all traditional uh, leverages, but also using an investment, uh, using uh, economical leverage. Lithuania, in two, 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 four years ago, adopted very strong law of investment and acquisition screening. I would say is the most uh, strongest investment screening man mechanism if you compare with whole mechanisms which exist in European Union countries. Uh, I even, even can say what it could be a good example for other EU countries uh, to to uh, like like a model like a model uh, which which helped us uh, to isolate and to block uh, some investment uh, from some third countries, not only Russia but also China, to our uh, strategic objects. So this the idea of this law is uh, to create the uh, governmental commission which uh, gets the whole information about po possible uh, uh, investors and if investors links uh, creates a situation what uh, there are some links with the regimes we are not independent uh, the investments can be blocked and i can also uh, say what, uh, for example, uh, some plans of some companies linked with Russia to build aircraft repair facilities close to NATO air policing mission near in Lithuania uh, uh, was rejected. Also, we tried to create a big data center in Lithuania. It also was uh, rejected. Uh, what we did uh, uh, just a few weeks ago we uh, also elaborated on this law additional things and uh, it's uh, we are talk now we're talking about 5 5g network and and possible uh investments from uh third countries and here we are talking about about china so we we created uh, the situation now with non-eu non-nato uh, producers uh companies 
cannot participate in Lithuanian 5G network development. So we already did that. Uh, so uh, uh, Russian or Chinese companies uh, will not be allowed uh, allowed uh, to do that. Uh, and I, I would say it's it's quite effective, uh, effective instrument which can be used by other countries. And of course, Lithuania is ready to share its 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 experience. Uh, what is interesting in this context, when our government or commission blocks with some investments, <clears throat> some uh, companies trying to use EU law to overcome Lithuanian national regulations. And there is some, uh, there are some conflicts here uh, because of freedom of, of, of capital, freedom of, of, of movement of, 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 of goods, of, of uh, uh, services. Sometimes it's, uh, this EU law, EU rules uh, are used uh, to overcome Lithuanian uh, national regulations. But of course, uh, we still, uh, we still uh, 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 our, our decisions are strong and we are ready to defend in, 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 even in the courts. Uh, another thing what we are planning uh, planning to do, I would call it uh, Lithuanian FARA. Uh, what I mean? Uh, a negative impact on the national security of Lithuania may be exerted not only by hostile intelligence and security services, but also through other entities of third countries, including business enterprises and their groups lobbying entities, non-governmental organizations, and organized criminal formations. In order to mitigate these risks, we are planning, it's just a plan, and we will start a discussion to establish an obligation for such entities to disclose their relations with their clients, funders, and final beneficiaries. So we think what it's time, uh, the time has come to talk about transparency and openness on financial assistance received from the third countries. So uh, such kind of examples of regulation is in the United States, in Australia, in Israel, where recipients of financial assistance from foreign countries have the obligation to openly declare the sources of their fun funding. I, I, would, I, will, I will say it will be hard discussion, we know it. We will talk only about non-EU and non-NATO countries uh, entities and connections with non-EU and NATO uh, non-NATO countries. But of course, and sometimes, of course, these ideas uh, uh, will raise a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of uh, discussions. But we are ready for that, and I hope it also will bring uh, uh, more transparency in in in, in Lithuania and uh, understanding who is who in Lithuanian. Uh, media, in Lithuanian, uh, NGO, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, these two main ideas which I would like, wanted to, uh, to, to, to bring to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Kaščiūnas. It really sounds as a very ambitious plan, and we also wish you good luck with implementing it fully and uh, basically entirely. Um, another country, which is the neighbor of Lithuania, Latvia, um, was very vulnerable to this, you know, economic instruments of the kleptocratic malign uh, influence just a few years ago. And um, Latvia was pretty vulnerable to financial crimes and money laundering. These are the tools that the kleptocracies are very often used in, uh, uh, using in order to erode um, uh, democracies from the inside. But uh, these threats were considered and, and treated by the country very seriously. And over the last two years, they have achieved progress uh, in fighting against corruption. And we will have the pre-recorded video from Mr. Richard Kols, who will tell us more about the achievements of their fight, as well as their to-do list. Good evening. My name is Richard Skols. I'm the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Parliament of the Republic of Latvia. Um, dear participants of the conference, uh, dear organizers, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to participate at your conference. I very much value this opportunity to express my thoughts and views on the issues you have set forward uh, for today's discussions. Unfortunately, due to the Parliament's intense uh, work. I wasn't able to join you uh, live 
and, and to discuss. But nevertheless, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for allowing me to um, give a, a food for thought uh, for your discussions uh, from my point of view on the topic you have put forward. Corruption is perhaps best described as malign force which perpetuates poverty, sows insecurity, and robs the world's most vulnerable people of desperately needed public services. It drains resources that are aimed to help citizens and weakens our collective security and the sovereignty of nations. It can manifest in many forms, from criminal acts like bribery, extortion, and embezzlement, to highly questionable but sometimes legal practices like nepotism, patronage, and crinism. Pick any country in the world, a representative democracy, a one-party state, or a military dictatorship, and you will find a common threat. They all are grappling with problems that stem from corruption. In the worst cases, corruption costs lives. An estimated 500 billion of funding destined for health services lost to corruption every year. We know that corruption in the health sector kills an estimated 140,000 children a year, fuels the global rise in antimicrobial resistance, hinders the fight against the HIV AIDS, and has hampered the ability to respond to COVID-19. Corruption has been a driving force behind some of the deadliest conflicts in recent history by helping create conditions in which these conflicts can thrive. It perpetuates poverty, inequality, and injustice, wastes funds that could be spent on development and security, and facilitates the operations of extremist groups and organized crime syndicates. We cannot overemphasize the corrosive effect corrupt activities have on our societies. Corruption erodes trust in public institutions. This is especially concerning at times when governments are grappling with the economic, health, and social impacts of the pandemic. For Latvia, Eurobarometer surveys on corruption throughout the years are a stark reminder of how relevant the problem still is in Latvia. They also show that the government needs to do more in prosecuting high-level corruption cases and reduce the tolerance of corruption to obtain public services. The high level of tolerance against corruption and the low motivation to report instances of corruption is affected by lack of results in government efforts to punish corrupt officials and bribers. However, in order to successfully combat corruption, it is important not only to fight corruption, but to invest in prevention and education of society. Some of these self-destructive practices stem from our Soviet occupation past, where bribery and blats, tit-for-tat systems were normalized into every, everyday practice and skill of survival. Some of it makes us look closer at our own backyard. It is not a pleasant look and makes us consider some hard truths about ourselves before we can move forward. They do say that you have to recognize the problem before you can start solving it. So a little history. Latvia's financial sector was heavily shaken in 2018. There was a risk of country being added to the so-called grey list. What did we do? Authorities imposed strict measures on financial industry, which at one point handled as much as 1% of US dollar flows. In the ensuing cleanup, we replaced our bank regulator, anti-money laundering watchdog, and central bank governor, froze suspect cash, expelled suspicious shell companies, and opened a raft of criminal probes. The parliament expanded the role of the Financial and Capital Market Commission to cover anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing, and imposed beneficial ownership requirements on local limited companies, foundations, unions, farms and fishing enterprises, partnerships, and other entities. In recent years, Latvia has adopted several legislative reforms aimed at strengthening the efficiency of the anti-corruption framework. The criminal legislation has been amended to align the offenses of abuse of office, bribery, and trading and influence with international standards. The adoption of the whistleblowers law for the first time provides a holistic basis for the protection of whistleblowers. The capacity to investigate corruption cases has improved. 
The Latvian justice system has been continuously improving its quality and efficiency, notably through a number of measures, among them training and consecutive judicial map reforms. The legal, ref uh, the legal framework for media ownership transparency is in place. As regards the transparency of media ownership, the law requires providing information on the existence and change of beneficial owners. It has taken serious efforts in the literal sense of the word, demanding in-depth and trust-based strong international cooperation, basing on effective and binding legal frameworks. And this truly is the only way these kind of efforts succeed. There is no way around it because if there is, that's where you usually find the corruption. The tougher restrictions have pushed the flows of dirty money into new countries and over different channels. It really is a never-ending battle. And relax at your own risk because it is always too early for Latvia too. So challenges remain regarding the prosecution of corruption cases and their adjunction in courts, where proceedings often remain lengthy. Work is ongoing on legislation to improve the transparency of lobbying and to strengthen the regime to prevent conflict of interest. It is never just a matter of passing an appropriate looking law. It demands change in the mode of our thinking and our approach, individual and societal. In conclusion, history has taught us that no system is entirely future-proof and vigilance and innovations are constantly required. The legislative landscape has continuously developed in line with our awareness of understanding of the corruption risks. All of you will know the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus, constantly having to push the boulder up the hill, only to see it roll back again. I've heard it said that countering money laundering and terrorist financing is, in effect, a Sisyphean task. But that is to suggest no progress is possible, when in reality the right tools and the right amounts of cooperation and collaboration will bring us a very long way indeed. If Sisyphus had modern tools and the support of others, the task would have been imminently achievable. So this said, we all realize that corruption will remain a problem. The question remains, are we ready to fight it, truly fight it, not only at the national level, but international level? And if we are, truly are, the cooperation, cross-border cooperation, should be activated, deepened. And since we're having this discussion today, at a conference that is held in Ukraine, in Kiev. Ukraine, as a country, will have and has our support when it comes to delivering reforms, particularly in the area of rule of law, fighting corruption, and that is something that comes without saying. Not only in words, but in practice, we are ready to send our experts to help in improving the legislation procedures and to overall, to tackle the cancer that is in true word meaning corruption is. And once again, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and I wish you a very, very productive conference. And good luck to my uh, fellow colleagues, panelists. We are very grateful to Mr. Kols in absentia. And basically with his speech, he made the transition between our two key blocks of the discussion. So we are moving from the uh, discussion of the domestic measures that are being done in order to protect our countries from the kleptocratic influences to what we can do internationally, how we could cooperate more and better in order to be much more effective in opposing the autocracies. Um, and uh, with regards to this, Senator Whitehouse, you have voiced an ambitious plan to do. Um, what would you expect from your counterparts, like for example the members of parliament from Ukraine uh, and other countries as well, in order to fight against transborder corruption and kleptocracy jointly and more effectively? Well, um, one very narrow point and then one much broader point. Um, the narrow point is that I worry a lot about Nord Stream 2 
and the opportunity both for Putin's petropolitics um, and for uh, corruption to flow through that pipeline just as much as uh, gas might. Um, so I think that's something to keep an eye out on specifically. Uh, more generally, I think it's time that we reach an international understanding that providing aid and comfort to those who support kleptocrats and criminals by allowing them refuge in rule of law countries for all of their money and pelf, stolen goods, um, that's got to be brought to an end. And we should have a similar degree of international distaste uh, for that and a similar uh, amount of international resolution against that that we now have for things like child labor. Child labor was once seen as a local problem. And then we realized, no, this has to stop. And there are multiple international sanctions for uh, countries that allow child labor to be used to manufacture goods. Uh, it turns up in trade negotiations. It turns up in international security negotiations. It turns up, uh, I hope, in a new uh, generic uh, treaty on uh, anti-kleptocracy. And the reason you have to do this internationally is because wherever you allow a leak, that is where the dirty, dark money will flow. So we really have to make sure not only that the leading economies of the world are uh, performing at acceptable levels, uh, and I'm embarrassed that the United States was not performing at acceptable levels and we're stepping up our game, uh, but the world's impatience with us is justified. Uh, but now I think we're back in the game, and it's equally important that we reach out and make sure that all of the nations that provide this kind of aid and comfort to kleptocrats and to kleptocracy and to corruption uh, have to be sanctioned for it. We've got to clean this up as a global matter in the same way that if you had an infection in your body, you would treat it across the board, you'd prescribe antibiotics, you'd make sure that you excised the rotten parts and allowed the body to heal. And um, our international body politic is being poisoned by this and we have to fix it. Thank you very much. Basically, you already touched upon the issue of the Nord Stream 2. Um, that was on the list of my questions, absolutely, because we here in Ukraine are super concerned with this project. I mean, uh, when the Nord Stream 2 becomes fully operational, this would untie the hands of Putin for further offensive in Ukraine and will make Ukraine pretty much vulnerable to Putin's blackmail. We have already seen um, the, the statement um, at the international, I guess it was Russian forum, um, where Mr. Putin said that should Ukraine show goodwill, then they will keep the uh, transit of gas through Ukrainian territory. Obviously, goodwill would mean that Ukraine needs to give up and forget about our Euro and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. So, uh, Senator Whitehouse, I have a follow-up question to you. Uh, what do you think the transatlantic community should do to stop such kleptocratic projects as Nord Stream 2? Well, it's, uh, it was discouraging that the uh, Biden administration appears to have given at least a partial sign off to the project by lifting the sanctions. Um, they have said that um, part of the uh, understanding that was reached in return for doing that is that they will demand more support for uh, Ukraine um, from all of the European partners that we work with. Uh, but I agree with you. If First of all, it's bad enough that Nord Stream 2 supplies hydrocarbons into a world that is already burdened and threatened by climate change. Um, but it's not only hydrocarbons that will flow through that pipeline. It is also political pressure. It is also opportunities for corruption. And it is also the uh, will, the malign will, of Vladimir Putin. So I think uh, there are a lot of reasons that it's very important that the European community get together and make sure that we do everything we can to stop the project or at least inhibit it in so many ways that it's only a hydrocarbon pipeline and not a corruption, kleptocracy, and malign power pipeline as well. Thank you. 
Uh, indeed, one of the spheres where strategic corruption is especially huge, the projects are overly expensive, and the danger towards the national security is super huge, is energy security. And uh, Mr. Lipovsky, you've co-signed an, op an open letter uh, of opinion leaders calling to stop Nord Stream 2. Um, also, you voiced a sharp criticism an, uh, against another geopolitical energy project um, in Czech Republic, specifically the possible Russia's engagement in the building construction of the nuclear power plant. So I have the question, what do you think, again, that will be similar to, to, to the question um, I, I put to Senator Whitehouse, what do you think the lawmakers could do internationally in order to tackle projects like this. We have already heard the experience of Lithuania that they are um, establishing the database of the investors that have the links to these kleptocratic regimes. And um, maybe you have the other solutions being developed right now in Czech Republic. Thank you very much for this uh, very good question. Uh, regarding the nuclear power plant project, I spent almost one year to explain uh, to my government that Russia and China has to be excluded from the process, from the procurement process. And only after the Verbechitsa revelation that the two agents of GRU, maybe more of them, uh, basically detonated two of uh, our ammunition stores and killing two people, the government acknowledged that uh, Russia will be excluded from the process itself. So it was uh, the, uh, the group of people around our president, Miloš Zeman, who pushed the Russia into, into this affair. And um, uh, if the state uh, listens to experts, to security services, to institution design to protect its interests, uh, there, will, there wouldn't even be never ever considered Russia to build a power plant because you can build a nuclear power plant with US, with South Korea, or with France, with democratic uh, countries and with countries who respect our, uh, our way, how, how we live, not with Russia and China. They do not respect it. What we can do uh, internationally? Uh, this, is, this is quite a hard question, but we have to listen to security concerns of our partners uh, we share NATO membership or who would like to join NATO, which, uh, which is the case of Ukraine. And I'm a big supporter of Ukraine and NATO membership, actually. So uh, that's something I would like to, uh, I would like to mention. Uh, looking at the, uh, at the case of Nord Stream or even some other uh, infrastructure and energetic projects, they are already a big source of corruption, political corruption. We can see it from Austria, the former chancellor of Germany is a board member of Nord Stream. So definitely Russia knows how to buy influence, how to use this tool uh, to push their agenda uh, into, into European politics. And um, I think I, I very welcome that uh, there should be connection between money and rule of law. I would like to see that the U European Union would connect the money uh, from EU budget with the, with the state of rural law in, in, in countries. It's, it's especially uh, sensitive for, for Poland or for Hungary. And uh, also I welcome, and I am a big supporter of Magnitsky Law Initiative. Uh, I'm pushing this initiative here in Czech Republic. EU has done something, but it's EU, it's, uh, a lot of states has to agree. Uh, we know that there are different interests, especially uh, Hungarian side blocks uh, using this tool. But this is something, Magnitsky law, uh, it's also designed to tackle with corruption. Um, uh, look at the case, uh, it was basically a theft of big money, which led a uh, multi-billionaire to uh, switch from the world of big finance to the world of human rights because he lost those money because there is no proper rule of law in Russia. Uh, ergo, there, there's a corruption. So those are two very specific uh, things I've mentioned to answer your question. Uh, and I hope um, this will uh, give some solution in the future. To these, to these um, thank you very much. And as a Ukrainian, I have to say a, a separate gratitude to, to you for mentioning uh, 
membership perspective for Ukraine in NATO, because cooperation is indeed crucial and uh, uh, could be a real practical um, a leverage of reforms advocacy. When Ukraine started doing the reforms back in 2014-15, um, we heard a lot from the former officials of the Central European and Baltic states who did reforms then, there, uh, in late, late 1990s, early 2000s. All of them said, literally repeated one message, that the EU and NATO perspective helped a lot in, on one hand, consolidating the reformers, uh, and on the other hand, warming up the hunger for the reforms in the society, especially with regards to quite unpopular reforms like the social ones or the pension reforms, with regards to Ukraine, the most unpopular reform, less in the society, but more with the political class, is fighting against corruption. Um, Ukrainian civil society organizations recently urged NATO allies to, provi to provide us a Ukraine-NATO compatibility plan, which would be Ukraine's route to NATO membership. Yesterday, we had the whole panel discussion uh, and we had the presentation of the policy paper um, done, uh, prepared by the new Europe Center, uh, one of the co-organizers uh, of the conference, where they made very, very clearly all the arguments why NATO will also win from having Ukraine um, as the part of it, not only Ukraine winning from joining the NATO. And I have a th therefore a question to Madam Radina. Um, how could Ukraine's Western partners help the reformers to, to facilitate the pace of the reforms? And uh, um, Ukraine's model, Ukraine's example, um, should not be for Ukraine only, but this could also be used for the um, other countries who are regional democracy trendsetters, like Georgia or, or Moldova, for example. Thank you very much. Without any exaggeration, that's probably my favorite question. I have to say that. I think now we are in a moment of time when international community has a, a perfect opportunity to do real difference in promotion of uh, rule of law reforms and in protecting sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, the best way to do that now would be to uh, compile together with uh, Ukrainian sites a list of reforms, commitment to which from Ukrainian sites will also mean commitment of international partners to uh, promoting further integration with, uh, uh, of Ukraine with NATO. Now, why do I think this is a uh, perfect solution? Let me take some time to remind you as to how visa liberalization action plan with the EU helped do literally miracles in promotion of rule of law reforms in Ukraine. Uh, since 2014 and by 2016, 147, uh, if I'm not mistaken, reforms were implemented under uh, visa liberalization action plan. Why was that? Uh, let me say that uh, Almost all elements of anti-corruption infrastructure were established as part of implementation of visa liberalization action plan. Now, why was that tool that successful? Because a uh, number of elements came together. First, the population wanted and had a, a clear request on visa-free travel with the EU, which actually meant that the politicians had to deliver on this popular aspiration. At the same time, the population had also a clear demand for rule of law reforms and the plan itself was very clear and had a clear connection between implementation of reforms and getting the end point or results of uh, visa-free travel. I think the same can be, uh, can be now repeated with a compatibil NATO compatibility plan for uh, Ukraine. The moment is unique without exaggeration. Now we are at a time uh, when Ukrainian population, majority of the population actually wants to see Ukraine in NATO as part of effort to ensure uh, security for the country. Uh, politicians, many of them, have sincere commitment to work towards, uh, towards further integration with NATO and uh, uh, President of Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky, is, uh, is uh, taking a leadership in that reform. So having a plan was understandable, predictable, 
endpoints uh, of commitment of foreign partners to uh, work on a open door policy and further integration with Ukraine in, for Ukraine into NATO would be a solution that will empower rule of law reforms but also help pro-reform actors in the government to work from within using that leverage. Uh, and let me also take some time for uh, thanking uh, Senator Whitehouse for the initiative that he described. Uh, now we are at an international situation when no developing country can actually uh, fight its corruption on its own for uh, one simple reason, uh, that proceeds of national corruption end up sometimes very comfortably in developed countries. So it's only by combined international effort that we can, uh, can put an end to that sanctions against corrupt regimes, uh, make in strengthening international anti-money laundering framework, having uh, proper measures to address activities of domestic enablers of foreign corruption are among few steps that had to be taken very seriously, both domestically and in on international level, if we are serious and sincere in our uh, commitment to uh, fight corruption globally. Thank you very much. Um, basically, let me make uh, probably one step back uh, to uh, the membership action plan and the prospects of the EU membership um, for Ukraine. Uh, because Lithuania's president has recently signed a declaration to support Ukraine's membership uh, in the EU. And Lithuania's foreign affairs minister declared that the country will help Ukraine to get a NATO membership plan. Uh, in addition, your country is hosting Ukraine's reform conference just in one month. So we indeed, as Ukrainian reformers, feel such a support and the mobilization of the international community with regards to pushing for U Ukraine's reforms agenda. And we are indeed, uh, as Madam Radina mentioned, grateful for the international community for supporting Ukrainian reforms. However, Lithuania is also defending democratization actors at another, not less or even probably more important front line today, which is Belarus. Kidnapping the plane to detain opposition journalist Pratasevich still seems like a, an action movie, but unfortunately this is the horrifying reality. Knowing that in the neighboring country the plane could be stopped and the opposition journalist could be detained is, is not a normality, but that's our reality. And chilling video of him clearly um, with, with the scene wounds on his wrist and praising Lukashenko is absolutely a propaganda video. Uh, Mr. Kaschunas, what do you think? What the West could do more and better in order to stop the dictator and what the foreign lawmakers could do jointly uh, to support Belarus democratization actors? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I will be back on, on, on NATO a little bit, and then I will continue on, on, on Belarus. Uh, you know, uh, we became a NATO members in 2004. If uh, five years, uh, uh, in, in, for example, 1999, if you would ask some parliamentarians in some Western European countries with a question, do you uh, imagine Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia be, being uh, members of NATO or EU? Uh, everybody will, uh, most of them will answer, oh, it's quite difficult, it's a big challenge, uh, and we ask why, and one of the reasons and the explanations was, in, especially when you're talking about NATO memberships, but uh, the Baltic states are undefensible, uh, I mean, uh, because of big Russia neighborhood and so on. And I remember very good that uh, in, 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 in that days, in that years, uh, uh, later on Asmus wrote an article, don't give uh, a Russia informal veto power on NATO enlargement. So uh, what happened here in Lithuania 20 years ago, uh, should, uh, should I, ho I wish it should happen here in, in, in Ukraine. But the most precondition, the biggest precondition, uh, nobody should have informal veto power to block NATO enlargement. No, should be no elephant in the room. Uh, every nation which decide to be the members of one or another organization should have a sovereign right to do that. 
Russia shouldn't have uh, nothing, a possibility, no possibility to block, to veto the, the membership. It's a main precondition when we start to talk about uh, uh, future processes and future trends. Uh, when we are talking about Belarus, uh, of course, the situation is uh, very difficult. To understand Lukashenko, normality is not the term already. That's, 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 that's absolutely the conclusion. Uh, he has no, no red lines. Uh, the only red line is uh, Mr. Putin, but if he allows him to do, he will do. Uh, Lithuania is paying the price for, the, for the, our strong position on, on the Lukashenko regime for, because we are supporting Belarusian Democrats, a position we are created even the help of opposition in, in Vilnius, in our capital, we are paying the price. Paying the price, first of all, we, uh, illegal migration started, and of course, all the time of the provocations, what you already uh, um, uh, talked about, and, and, and so on. What we can do? Of course, we should uh, think about real sanctions package. The real sanctions package. Uh, it is the same uh, case uh, on Russian when we are talking about sanctions. Sometimes it looks like what EU implements in sanctions, which is like more face saving, but not uh, real sanctions. Real sanctions, it means when you know who is who in the Russian regime, when you know where is uh, Lukashenko's pockets, when you know where is the business structures which supporting him and they are very close to him, and to put all these. Uh, objects, all these entities into the sanctions list. Uh, what sometimes happens in EU, some countries have some links with one, one company, with one person, and so on and so on, and we're trying to take out these persons or companies from the sanctions list. So uh, we should not allow that. We should have uh, the real, real sanctions package. And it will, should, I, I would say it's the biggest, biggest, uh, uh, biggest, uh, like aim a direction, the correct direction which we should go 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 go, go ahead to 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 implement real 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 sanctions. And you know, historical uh, uh, history shows that uh, when uh, when Lukashenko is under the, under the pressure, he starts to negotiate. He starts to make some uh, you know some m moves. For example, I would call it this selling selling the political prisoners. For example, in 2010, he, he released some of them when you decided to lift out some sanctions and so on to bring bring back the rules to uh, some corporation levels in the EU, and so on. Uh, and and, and it's, 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 first of all, it should be pressure and so it should be sanctions. So uh, it, it, it is what we should do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Basically, we have five minutes till the end of our, our discussion, and I will make a bold step because I will open the last um, round of our discussions, but I will ask you to be super brief. Since this is the solutions marathon, we want to talk and we want to highlight the solutions. And therefore, I would like to ask each uh, panelist to say uh, one, key best practice which um, other countries should learn from your experience with regards to ta tackling strategic cor corruption and uh, closing the holes for um, enablers. Senator Whitehouse, the floor is yours. Well, I think the worst avenue of corruption is through anonymity. We are working to try to get rid of dark money in our United States elections but the corrupting effect of enormous special interest dark money in Congress is evident uh, all around us. So we have a local experience of it as well. And of course, internationally, it contributes to an even worse state of affairs in which truly evil forces in the world are sanctioned and supported by rule of law. So get rid of dark money, uh, provide transparency, the more the better. Thank you very much, especially for sticking to this one minute uh, timing. Mr. Lipavsky, what's your take? Um, transparency is the word. Uh, transparency in money, transparency in who means who, uh, transparency in, in many other ways. It's easy to say, it's very hard to implement it. 
uh, it usually means that we have to change many laws and create basically big systemic changes, which is quite hard. So uh, I admire everyone who is able to find good solution how to make something transparent in the world of politics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mr. Um, Mr. Kaščunas. Maybe I will repeat myself, but I will stick to our uh, investment and acquisition screening mechanism. I think it, it is a good practice, which, which comes from Lithuania. You know, uh, we, when we managed uh, just two weeks ago to, to ban Chinese companies from 5G network, you know, can you imagine how big lobbyism was and so on? Uh, so it means but we were not so much dependent on Chinese in strategic sectors and it, it, it helps us to, to have a free hand, it helps us to be independent. The same I will say, let's say in the other sectors like energy, uh, transport, uh, 15 years ago we were totally dependent on Russia here. We were 100% and uh, dependent on gas from uh, in our gas sector. Now we in, in implemented reforms. We Should I try others? We and and, 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 build, uh, and made the unbundling gas in our prospect. gas sector. Senator Whitehouse. We, 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 we get yeah. back our infrastructure and now we have a competition in gas sector. We have LNG terminal and this law of investment, investment screening helps us to avoid uh, uh, unsafe and secure investment in our strategic sectors and i think it's 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 a good good idea for powers to thank you thank you so much for that madam radina well i think i will not be able to limit myself to one solution because ukraine is actually bursting with solutions but i will limit myself to two. First one ukraine shows how developing nations can uh overcome the challenge of implementing comprehensive reforms uh, that uh, last for uh, decades and never deliver by establishing small institutions like independent anti-corruption infrastructure that uh, start delivering in just few years and by doing that send a message to whole state system that rules of the game are changing and therefore uh, empowering other comprehensive reform and fueling comprehensive reforms like reform of the judiciary or reform of the prosecution that's one and second ukraine has a unique solution how to uh, prevent vested interests from taking control over newly established institutions and this is by implement uh, by involving independent experts nominated by international com uh, international parties development partners into decision making on leadership of key newly uh, established institutions and therefore establishing from the start that these institutions are independent and in a position to deliver result which I referred to in my uh, previous uh, success story. Thank you so much. I want to say a huge thank to an interesting and a really uh, intense discussion to our distinguished guest speakers, Senator Whitehouse, Madam Radina, Mr. Kaščunas, Mr. Lipavsky, and Mr. Kols and Congressman Fitzpatrick in absentia. So we all agree that it's impossible to advance democracy within one specific country anymore. Defending democracy requires strong leadership, unity, increased cooperation, and braveness to oppose autocracies. Advancing democracy requires bold creative solutions and readiness to think outside the box, like how to close the loopholes for enablers, how to look for the leverages to promote reform advocacy, how to strengthen sanctions mechanism, how to support reformers in the transitional democracies, how to fight anonymity and ensure the real transparency. I really hope that today's discussion will be a modest contribution to transatlantic joint efforts on tackling against kleptocracy. Thank you very much and uh, stay with us because we continue. Corruption is probably the most known word in Ukraine. But what do Ukrainians think about corruption? Let's have a closer look at the data from the recent anti-corruption poll to find the answers. For 75% of Ukrainians, corruption remains one of the top concerns, while 63% believe it is highly prevalent in society. Simultaneously, Ukrainians are intolerable of corruption. The share of those who think it should not be justified hits 75%. When asked about corruption, most of 
Ukrainians think first of all grand and political corruption hidden in the offices of the deputies and top officials. Still, the share of those who think that the prevalence of corruption throughout governmental bodies, with the exception of police, has dropped. But in real life, the share of those who admitted to have faced corruption personally during the previous 12 months fell to 16%. COVID and less contact among people oust traditional person-official interactions. Across the country, experiences of corruption differ from obelisk to obelisk. Only in seven obelisks, respondents reported increased levels of corruption, while the rest claimed the same or lower levels. Who has the will to overcome corruption? Citizens, media, and NGOs. However, many are discouraged as they feel anti-corruption fatigue and think their efforts are futile. More than a half vest responsibility for countering corruption in the president and his office. Ukrainians are increasingly confident that this is the responsibility of the specialized anti-corruption bodies like the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecution Office, National Agency for Prevention of Corruption, or the Higher Anti-Corruption Court. Feel this is incomplete? Get a bigger picture at engage.org.ua. We have just two panel discussions remaining until the end of Zero Corruption Conference, but they are at least the most long awaited. Now it is the time to pass the recommendations to the evaluation of results of this international forum. Next to me, there is Hanna Hopko, who is the head of the conference Democracy in Action. So, Hanna, how do you evaluate the results of work during these two days in the studio, beyond the studio? Well, actually, I would like to thank our charming moderator Inna Borzilla because these two days holding all of us uh, energetic, uh, uh, actually, thanks to your professionalism and all those complicated questions that you asked the uh, participants. And I would like to tell you that these are participants from over 40 countries, those who also physically arrived. There's over 80 different speakers in our conference, and I can only imagine how with these two days of such marathon, which lasted for a long time, you actually put through all the answers. Sometimes I saw you actually ask some sharp questions to the representative of German Foreign Ministry about Nord Stream 2, and that was actually the task of our conference, that open conversation, what hybrid threats to the democracy are and how to counter them, because this is a serious issue, and we see that not only in Ukraine, but also the Western countries, they already suffer from disinformation, propaganda, strategic corruption, and uh, legal wars. And uh, here it is important to join efforts. What I would like to say is that 30 years have passed since the restoration of Ukrainian independence, and this is the first uh, zero oligarchs conference. I believe that this is also a great achievement of our civil society. These are powerful CSOs like Center for Country Corruption, the, team, the whole team which worked. Uh, New Europe Center, a globalistic strategy, 21st century, century Center, also the Center of Environment, Law and Human, OPORA, Center for Civic Freedoms. We have a long list of people who invested not only for several months. Uh, they actually showed that Ukraine is able to be its trendsetter. Are you happy with the messages that we received from both sides of the Atlantic from our partners? Which is our mood for the agenda of other international forums which are soon going to happen. Well, here we have to say that next week we're going to have important meetings. There is NATO summit, there is G7 summit. We also know there's going to be a meeting of Biden and Putin. And there were questions to the President of Moldova, to Vice President of the European Commission, to NATO representatives. How do you combine and join efforts? And what's the most important is that here Ukraine proposes a solution, because very often we are blamed that, yes, there is corruption there, but it was important for us to re remind everyone that cor corruption is also there in the West. Many officials uh, do not shy away from dirty money. All the dances from the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, who now uh, has obtained a post in the supervision board in uh, Rosneft. This is an example how authoritarian regimes and Putin buys not just the loyalty, but actually infiltrates its representatives. And also our Czech representative was talking about the consequences of such erosion of values. 
values, and I think that democracy in action is not just about statements. It is about the readiness to protect human rights here and now. And when representatives from the Department of State, Magnitsky and Bill Browder, clearly talked about the importance to put more pressure on the Tan regime so that they had to pay high price and so that they would be unwilling to perform reprisals over civil activists and journalists. I think that is also very important. You have correctly pointed out that we had partners from both sides of the Atlantic and our panel on legislative changes. How do you strengthen this cooperation to limit the influence of dirty money on the approval of decisions in this civilized uh, country? So Western democracy pointedly showed that, showed that. I think that Ukraine, which has been countering Putin's aggression for an eighth year uh, in a row, from cyber attacks, propaganda, fakes, to disruptive activities of the fifth column, we have shown that we can manage. Plus, the presidents of Moldova and Georgia as trendsetters of the region. And I would also like to thank New Europe Center for their study about the vision of 2030, NATO, and the achievements that are already there in Ukraine. I would like to, uh, to thank Institute of uh, Mass Media, Telekritika, Detector Media, for the studies they also performed about Russian propaganda. Because this is an example how Moscow tries through propaganda, both in Ukraine and other countries countries of the Eastern Europe to actually uh, put the society against the West. In several hours, our conference is going to be over, and more field work will start, uh, work in various institutions, analytical work. What are the next steps of your team in search for answers for hybrid uh, threats to the democracy? As my colleague and supporter says, Daria Kalnyuk, actually, I'm very thankful to her for these two years of such close cooperation, first I would really like to write letters of thanks, because this is huge thanks to the congressmen who participated online, to all our speakers, to Samantha Power, but we already have plans of following events, because I believe that our first forum on such international level, protection of democracy, or how do you restore the power of democracy, the attacking power, the preventative power, is also an important contribution to the idea of US President Biden of Global Democracy Forum, and here Ukraine has shown that we are not just in the forefront, we are actually at the forefront of decision-making, which we have already worked out in these two days. We have several more ideas about climate, uh, protection of environment, education, because we saw it uh, in the example of disinformation, what's happening to the critical thinking in people. So I believe that this is an annual conference. It's the first time that it happened uh, so widely. We actually planned to have it in 2020, but we postponed it due to the pandemic. We believe that it is very important that this is the first conference, you know. It actually turned out to be rather powerful uh, from the point of decisions that we voiced. Uh, for the following conference, I hope we are going to have more energy and less organizational hassle, which was really going on 24-7. What kind of ambience was behind the curtains? We have just one minute left because apart from side events, apart the main track, the newsroom solution studio, we had lots of interesting meetings in the coolers. Well, not just in the coolers, we had additional side events, as you said, which were going in parallel to the key conferences. It was a close conversation in Belarus, how to help them so that they could have democracy's victory there. This information, how to coordinate the work of various agencies, uh, reforming the defense sector, uh, which um, uh, Transparency International was doing. But actually, I'm immensely thankful to all people who worked and who are now probably dreaming of having a rest, but who are preparing these media reports. And a great thanks to God for the strength and for the fact that this conference uh, showed its capacity, showed the capacity of Ukraine to set trends, to form the agenda, to openly talk about the problems that we have in the West has and what's most important for solutions. And I thank you for being daring enough to initiate and to hold this high-profile event. And I thank our participants of the conference who have waited until the panel dedicated to oligarchs and fighting oligarchs, because a unique feature of this event is the absence of any oligarchs oligarch funds, oligarch resources for this conversation. This is oligarch free. And the moderator of this panel on the oligarchization, this is Brian Bonner, who is the executive director and editor-in-chief of Kyiv Post, our media partner.
Good afternoon. Good morning in America. Uh, Brian Bonner, chief editor of the Kiev Post. Uh, we are a media partner for this conference, proud media partner. The Kiev Post uh, is, and I want to thank Hannah Hopko. I'm glad that her dream has come true with this conference, this marathon conference. But the Kiev Post, uh, I'll do a little promotion first. We are Ukraine's English language paper since 1995. So we've covered the oligarchs since the beginning. And in a stroke of great timing, we have four new videos on our website about oligarchs. We have all of our oligarch coverage under a thing called Oligarch Watch. So I will start. We have a terrific, terrific panel of experts here. So I'm going to talk as little as possible and get them on stage. But let's first set the stage. Out of the, who are the oligarchs and why are they so dangerous? Out of the wreckage of the Soviet Union, a group, of, a small group of mostly men acquired the greatest assets. Some, some said stole, but others say it was all perfectly legal. In any case, they got great deals. Uh, they acquired massive amounts of wealth that transferred uh, non-transparently, non-competitively. And to keep this wealth, uh, they built influence, uh, they, you know, they built media empires around it, they influenced state government, they infiltrated state institutions, they built this entire apparatus to keep their powers, to keep their privileges. Uh, periodically there have been attempts to take back what was privatized and sell it competitively for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. All those efforts have gone nowhere, but we, you know, in Ukraine, the consequence, why is this so important? The consequence of, of living in an oligarchy or living among oligarchs is very obvious. Economic competition is stifled, foreign investment is weak, billions of dollars that could have been paid to the uh, taxes to improve schools, pensions, etc., instead goes offshore, and rule of law is, is completely flouted. There's been no convictions of anybody for any serious financial crimes or even murders in, in, in Ukraine's 30th, uh, almost 30 years as an independent nation. But there is stirrings here, and it's the, the activity is happening in America. Joe Biden uh, has recently come out and declared fighting international corruption is a matter of U.S. national security. And he's laid out a fairly detailed blueprint. Uh, and in Ukraine, President Zelensky has declared war on the oligarchs and has actually named the 13 oligarchs, defined oligarchs, and submitted a law to limit their influence. So we'll see if anything comes of, of uh, this flurry of activity. And we have our experts here to, to help us make sense of it all. I want to start, uh, well, first of all, I want to introduce our experts, and then we're going to start with... Uh, with Casey Michael. Uh, Casey Michael is an investigative journalist, author of the forthcoming book, American Kleptocracy. I guess you can't buy it now yet. Uh, I'm anxiously looking forward to reading it and to seeing if he's going to uh, go uh, uh, down the line in, in nations and, and write about their kleptocratic developments. We also have Karen Greenaway, who I've heard speak before. She's a longtime FBI supervisory agent, now an independent expert, very good on the, on the topic. She knows uh, how to investigate cases and, and can tell us uh, uh, maybe, hopefully, what are the best strategies. We also have Matthew Murray uh, of Columbia University Harriman Institute with us, and the only Ukrainian, as it turns out, on the panel beside me, the, uh, the famous Daria Kalinuk. Uh, executive Director of the Anti-Corruption Action Center. So I want to start with uh, Casey Michael. Uh, Casey, you are there. Right here. When can we buy your book, by the way? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. The book will be coming out November 16th, but please feel free to pre-order my book online from your favorite bookseller. Uh, as I've told everyone, I'm happy to buy anybody who pre-orders the book uh, a round of drinks uh, as a thank you. So you can go online and do that uh, at any time. Uh, and Brian, I'm happy to begin uh, the, uh, the talk right now if you'd like to go ahead. Let's do it. I know you have some visuals, and I think we need to cue them now or whenever you want. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that would be 
That would be great. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks to uh, everyone, obviously, Yaku, to, to Daria, to Hannah, to the entire team. This is a wonderful conference, a wonderful presentation. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I am an American journalist that writes on illicit finance, transnational money laundering, uh, among a range of regimes, a range of organizations, and a range of individuals, including most especially the oligarchs we will be discussing today. Obviously, if people think of kleptocracy or what we now consider kleptocracy, you think of regimes in Moscow or, or Baku or maybe Kazakhstan as well. But clearly, there are figures and there are elements in Ukraine that are worth paying attention to. And those are, of course, the, uh, the oligarchs. The first visual here uh, details the rise of the oligarchs in Ukraine and in Russia over the last 30 years. And before I continue, I, I do have a few slides we will be discussing today. The slides do have a fair amount of information on them uh, that I will be going through. But if anybody wants copies of these slides, of these visuals, please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to share them as well and to go into further detail uh, as well. But this first slide that you can see details the rise of the oligarchs. Now, as, as Brian just said, we can really point to the late 1980s, early 1990s, the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and the rise of what we came to describe as democratization in the 1990s. While that was happening in the political space, in the economic space, we also had uh, the privatization of significant state assets through things like uh, loans for shares programs and voucher programs. And as you'll see on the slide there, that brought together two entities, two movements, and two broad spheres. That is the businessmen on one side and organized crime on the other side. So while you had the democratization, the liberalization of the politics in places like Ukraine, you also had the increasing um, uh, gaining of significant state assets from a small number of businessmen who were increasingly working very, very closely with organized crime. And that gave rise by the late 1990s into what we would describe as this cast of oligarchs. These figures, some of whom we'll describe in detail in a few minutes, that then began affecting uh, policy in Ukraine, in Russia as well. I do want to highlight one moment. Um, you know, as you can see here, there are oligarchs all across the post-Soviet space in Russia, in Georgia, uh, in, um, uh, in Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan as well, and also here in, uh, in Ukraine uh, as well as in Moldova. These are a few of the key figures I wanted to highlight. You have a couple of Russian oligarchs. You have Abramovich, who's now in London. You have Friedman, who spends a lot of time in run London as well. You have Ivanishvili, who is helping steer a lot of Georgian politics. Obviously, the oligarchs in these countries still very important very, very influential. Uh, and then in Ukraine, you have three names you might be familiar with. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Mr. Fertash, who is in Vienna right now. We have Mr. Kolomoisky, who uh, some of you may be familiar with. We'll talk about him in a moment. And then you also have Viktor Medvedchuk, who I'm sure I don't need to explain, was recently uh, sanctioned by the Ukrainian government. He may still be in Ukraine. He may not. If anybody knows where Mr. Medvedchuk is, please let me know. I'm happy to, uh, to take a look. Uh, we can go to the next slide, though, as well. The next slide, uh, when it comes up, details how these oligarchs access Western financial system. So they've made their money, they control their assets, but they don't want to keep their money in Ukraine or in Russia or in Kazakhstan or in Azerbaijan. They want to get it out of the country and keep it safe. And this is how they do that. You have oligarchs at the top. Below them are what we have called as enablers. These are the Western professionals, the Americans, the Canadians, the Brits, the French, the Swiss, the Germans, et cetera, et cetera, that help the oligarchs move their money, hide their money, and then spend their money wherever they want, however they want. And there's a whole range of figures and professions that do this. You have accountants, you have consultants and lawyers, and these consultants and lawyers also help transform the reputations of these oligarchs. They're no longer oligarchs. Now they're successful businessmen. Now they're moguls. They're no longer corrupt figures. Uh, you have shell company providers, trust providers, uh, real estate agents, especially banks and financial institutions, all helping the oligarchs move their money. And there's one key tool that they use to hide that money in the West, and that is anonymity. They make sure the money is no longer connected to the oligarch. It's no longer dirty money. Now it's anonymous money, but it is still connected and controlled by the oligarchs. And they do this across another range of industries, all 
perfectly legally. This is all perfectly legal in the West, in the US, in Britain, in France, et cetera, et cetera. This is private equity, hedge funds, uh, real estate, art, auctions, luxury goods, all of it. You can buy anything you want. You can invest as much as you want perfectly legally and perfectly anonymously. And I, I do want to highlight one key role. You'll see lawyers right in the middle. The lawyers are connected to the anonymity. They're connected to the shell companies. They're connected to reputation laundering. If there is one key profession that plays a key role in laundering this money, moving this money, and transforming these figures into philanthropists and businessmen and moguls, uh, it is the lawyers that play that key role for the oligarchs. So we can go to the next slide because I only have a few minutes left. Um, I have two examples that I wanted to talk about that my book goes into uh, much further detail about. But I wanted to just highlight two figures, two key Ukrainian oligarchs that, again, I'm sure everyone is uh, wonderfully familiar with. The first is Mr. Igor Kolomoisky, who is still uh, not uh, sanctioned by the Ukrainian government, but he is sanctioned by the American government. He was sanctioned by the U.S. a few months ago for his massive corruption while running Privat Bank. So the details of Kolomoisky at Privat Bank, he allegedly stole $5.5 billion, but he could not keep that money in Ukraine. So where did he move his money to? Much of it went into the U.S., and much of it he did perfectly legally. Now, we know much of this because of the wonderful investigations in Ukraine as well as in the U.S. And I just want to uh, highlight one of these the parts of this network. You can see on the map, uh, Privat Bank, he had to take the money out of Privat Bank, move it into Cyprus, into Privat Bank Cyprus, which then moved to the shell companies in the British Virgin Islands, which are, again, part of Britain. From there, he moved it to accounts in Deutsche Bank, which is a German bank, which is just a horribly corrupt bank that worked with anybody and everybody, who, you know, regimes, oligarchs, dictators, everybody around the world. Deutsche Bank is just a, just a truly corrupt bank. But from there, they went to shell companies in the U.S. in the state of Delaware. Delaware is right in the middle of the map, you can see. And from there, the money is anonymous. The money went to a number of other American states, investments in buildings and steel plants. Um, these American states had no idea the money was connected to Kolomoisky. They did not know it was connected to a Ukrainian oligarch. But Kolomoisky still controlled the money, still controlled those investments. And he hid hundreds of millions of dollars across the U.S. And you'll see in the state of Florida, he also worked with a number of Americans who are now uh, facing charges in the U.S. because of their work with Kolomoisky. This is one of the many, many, many instances and maps of how oligarchs in Ukraine and Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan move their money, hide their money, and launder their money across the West, including in the U.S. And this is my final slide. This is about another Ukrainian oligarch, Mr. Dmitry Fertash, who is currently in Vienna. He is wanted by American authorities for large-scale bribery, and he is supposed to be extradited, uh, flown to the U.S. to face charges, hopefully soon. Uh, but two years ago, Mr. Fertash had an idea. He moved his money, he laundered his money, but now, how is he going to spend his money? And one of the ways that he spent his money was on American lawyers. And he identified two key American lawyers that could help him access the highest levels of American political power, uh, how to access the White House under President Donald Trump. And you'll see on this, uh, this slide right here, he used two lawyers, Victoria Tinsing and Joe DiGenova, both of whom are very, very close to a figure named Rudy Giuliani, who you may be familiar with. Rudy Giuliani was and still is Trump's personal lawyer. Fertash used them to access uh, Giuliani. He used them to access Bill Barr, who was the attorney general under Trump, uh, to say that uh, if Mr. Trump, if, if President Trump lifted the invest investigations into Mr. Fertash, that Mr. Fertash had uh, dirt, he had information on Joe Biden. So he wanted to make a trade, give information about Joe Biden and remove the charges that the Americans have placed on Mr. Fertash. Now, Fertash had a couple other areas that he did as well. He had other figures to access President Trump, and he also had access to pro-Trump media 
to push this messaging, to push this rhetoric, and to push this idea that he had damaging information on Joe Biden that Donald Trump could use. Now, obviously, that didn't work. President Trump was impeached because of this network, and these efforts fell apart. And obviously, President Trump is no longer in power, but instead, Joe Biden is, which is not good news for these oligarchs at all. But this slide in particular shows now the oligarchs are no longer accessing just the financial systems in the West. They are increasingly accessing the political systems in places like the U.S. as well, which makes it that much more important that the U.S., the, uh, the Ukrainian authorities, other partners, uh, other investigators, and other governments around the world increase their focus on and efforts to target these oligarchs to make sure they don't have access to these financial systems and certainly don't have access to the political systems either. So I'll turn it back to you, Brian. There was a lot. I think now is a good time to go to Karen, and by the way, Matt and Daria, jump in, because uh, I want to, I know we're distant, but we, we can still pretend like we're at the same table and have a conversation. Uh, Karen, there's only one, I mean, there's a, actually a lot of problems I see here. One is, uh, Kolomoisky's not charged with any crime or convicted of any crime. So well, what, I, it's hard to take any of this seriously, and I don't know how law enforcement can stop the flow when he's not convicted of anything. I mean... Secondly, I mean, uh, you know better than anybody that, I mean, there's been no uh, convictions of, of, of anybody uh, for financial crimes or even uh, top murders in Ukraine. So it looks like we're in a situation where it's very hard to take uh, Zelensky's uh, fight against oligarchs seriously when there's nobody charged with bank fraud and $20 billion bank fraud. And at, at the same time, you know, uh, Casey mentioned Delaware. It's also very hard to take uh, uh, U.S. efforts, current efforts, uh, to fight international corruption seriously when we still have all these uh, laws, anonymity, dirty money flows, uh, non-transparency. So maybe I'm missing something. Is, that, is there really something happening here, some sort of coordination that is going to lead to a cleanup? So uh, thank you, and thank you to the organizers for uh, including me on this panel. Um, so let me just kind of set the stage for you uh, a bit. Um, and thank you, Casey. That was a really excellent overview of, of how we got to where we are with these, with these, with these, um, what we called, uh, because I was in, in Russia in the early 1990s, um, uh, business many who have now become, as we label them, oligarchs. Um, from almost the outset, uh, you know, um, those governments that saw the rise of these individuals um, as, as a challenge uh, in the West uh, because of their, um, you know, quick access into, um, uh, or I should say, quick insertion into the U.S., particularly the U.S. financial system, um, you know, we relied on law enforcement, and I was one of the people who was relied on to to referee what was becoming this um, collusive control over the economies in the former Soviet Union um, uh, and, and the states, uh, former Eastern Bloc, um, uh, to the exclusion of legitimate investors. Um, uh, so from my own experience, I can tell you before I joined the Bureau, uh, trying to work with businessmen out of Florida who, who wanted to invest in um, Russia and Ukraine, um, but they were locked out of those markets because these businessmen walked forward and, and, and used the control that they had through organized crime, as well as their connections to um, the legitimate, you know, um, arms of government to scoop up these, these, um, these what could have been far more productive uh, enterprises uh, all across the spectrum. Um, and, and, as a result, you know, we expected that law enforcement people like myself would be able to to simply, you know, look at these guys, you know, conduct a criminal investigation the way that we did against organized crime in the United States and, and the way the Italians did in Italy and then very successfully clean this all up and, and it wasn't going to be a problem. But what we didn't do um, uh, is we didn't give law enforcement the resources. We didn't give them the laws. 
uh, and we did not give them the political support that they needed to do that job. Uh, and I can tell you that by the time we got to the early 2000s, already there was there was almost no appetite in, in, in my own country and in the EU to address this problem as a law enforcement matter um, or to, frankly, address this problem at all. And so as a result, what we ended up with was we ended up with um, uh, trying to work through, you know, um, you know, individual law enforcement officers, you know, in different agencies who who would who were willing to put the resources, you know, to doing that type of work uh, to try to address this massive, this massive, massive what was really a crime problem, um, and uh, um, and the way that we did it was we 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 labeled it as you know going after the upstream, you know, uh, uh, we being the downstream, but going after the upstream problem. But of course, law enforcement in those countries, you know, um, you know, for the for the officers who were good, uh, you know, many of them uh, who who wanted to make a difference, who wanted to prevent the wholesale looting of their own of the resources in their country, were often either you know removed from their positions. That was the best case scenario. Some of them, you know, were fired, um, and and some of them were actually murdered in an attempt to try to do the cases and bring the prosecutions um, that would, you know, at the very least, you know, slow down this ever increasing land grab for for anything of value um, that really belonged to the citizens of these countries and should not have been at the exclusive control of a few individuals. So, you know, so what happened is that, you know, by the time that we came around to the last five years or so, um, that, uh, there was very little respect within, frankly, the U.S. government, the EU government for law enforcement initiatives to go after these individuals. Uh, and um, and in fact, as you saw in the last four years, in particular, you know, law enforcement agencies like the one that I work for were at, were which was only in the last four years, uh, whereas agencies like, you know, NABU and, and some of the other um, law enforcement agencies that were trying to tackle corruption in these countries had been facing this same kind of, you know, attack for before it was really come came down on on the FBI in particular. Um, were were you know disenfranchised and pushed to the side or pushed out of of doing the work in some some of the same ways that our colleagues back in the 90s and 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 early 2000s were pushed out of of the law enforcement agencies that were in these countries that were trying to do these cases so as a result you know what what you ended up doing what we ended up doing is doing the cases that we could make which which were those cases that were there was very, you know, there was good jurisdiction in the United States. Uh, or I, I also want to uh, point out, you know, the the work that Spanish the Spanish did in in their cases. Uh, Jose Grinda Gonzalez was a and is a fabulous prosecutor in Spain who really took on a lot of these individuals um, using some excellent, you know, Spanish legislation that's out there. Um, that, uh, but we were individuals. We were we were a, a squad, you know, of of agents, you know, fourteen agents. Um, or two case agents relying on, you know, um, the system as it exists to exchange evidence with countries that really were not interested in doing doing any kind of, of cases against these individuals because so many people benefited, you know, at least in the short term from the money that was flowing out of them, and they really just didn't care that long term impact that they were going to have on all of our economies. So, so. The good news is, is that you know we have that backing now with the with the president of the United States. Uh, we are seeing huge changes in the EU in, in in recognizing you know how detrimental it has been to our political systems to allow these individuals to to migrate out of their you know collusive control over the economies of places like Ukraine into um, essentially political actors 
um, sometimes through, you know, getting elected in the countries that they're in, you know, um, and so other times by manipulating legislators in the countries that they're in, to, as Casey very um, uh, adequately pointed out, to, you know, um, it, being players in our own political system and political systems in, in Europe, uh, which affect the policies that get implemented um, to, to try to um, uh, break apart individuals and this, you know, individuals from this exclusive and collusive control over these economies. Okay, Karen, it sounds like uh, the bad guys are several steps ahead of law enforcement. What would be the, I mean, just quickly, what would be the right strategy then? I mean, it seems like, I mean, Kolomoisky is facing lawsuits over bank fraud. Does it puzzle you why he's not facing criminal charges in Ukraine? Or do you know the answer to that already? Oh, I know the answer to that already. And the answer is to that already is because um, Kolomoisky and, and ind individuals like him um, have had the ability for the last 20 years to, you know, directly influence how Ukrainian law enforcement does their job through collusive and corrupt activity. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, earlier today, I, Artem Sitnik, the head of NABU, was on a panel, you know, um, and, and it, it was directly, it was correctly pointed out that he spends as much time fighting off these, you know, daily attacks on his legal and political tax in his organization that they do spend on doing their job as investigators and, and um, you know, trying to bring some justice. That being said, they're phenomenally successful for what they, what they um, are doing. But, you know, before that, we had a prosecutor general's office that, you know, consistently went through ups and downs um, in terms of opening and closing cases against individuals, you know, you know, like Kolomoisky. You know, um, uh, you know, there was never a, a, a level legal playing field where there was an understanding that, you know, that office in particular, you know, um, was going to be left outside of the political system in order to do their job independently. They never had the ability to work independently. And so, um, uh, so as a result, if I'm a case agent in the US uh, and I need to collect evidence in Ukraine, I don't have a partner in Ukraine that I can work with to collect that evidence. And so the case isn't gonna get done. And I had many cases, as did colleagues of mine who did this work over more than 20 years, where we could not take the case anywhere because we couldn't rely on, on our partners in those countries to collect the evidence for us, not because some of them didn't have the will to do it or the capacity to do it, but because they didn't have the legal um, and, and political support in order to do their jobs independently and do them the right way. Thanks. So the state is weak uh, compared to the opponents that it's up against. I know solutions, solutions, solutions are supposed to talk, and maybe I want to hear Matthew's voice. Uh, Matthew, if, if law enforcement can't catch him, is there, uh, and nobody's actually committed a crime in the sense that they've not been convicted of it, is there a way to, you know, the assets aren't going to be coming back, so they're going to have them. Is there a way to sort of civilize or make oligarchs competitive, get them to obey the rule of law? Uh, I mean, what, what would be the solution if, if they're so much more powerful than the state? Thank you, Brian. That's a great question. And I, I, I do want to um, address it right at the top here because um, the solution set will include both better law enforcement and better rewards for legal behavior. We, we cannot address this at systemically embedded risk of oligarchy in Ukraine or in other countries without uh, coming at it as a both a law enforcement issue, but also as an economic growth issue. And I will, I'll talk about that in a moment. But let me first congratulate Daria and thank Antec for this terrific two days of work. And indeed, I think you've captured the, the, the um, 
the, the moment politically very well. And, uh, you know, yesterday the conference opened with President Zelensky acknowledging that oligarchy is a national security threat. Uh, Administrator Samantha Power of USAID then went on to describe how, from the U.S. perspective, um, Russian oligarchs uh, uh, aiding Ukraine oligarchs are, are attacking democracy and the rule of law in Ukraine and other countries. And she carried the welcome message from President Biden that he is the first U.S. president indeed to elevate um, fighting corruption uh, and fighting oligarchy as a core national security interest of the United States. And so the question becomes, how do we use this emerging political consensus and political will to engage in what may be transformational change around this issue? And, you know, I think that's going to require two things. It's going to require better root cause analysis and understanding of how oligarchy has become embedded in, in this case, the system of Ukraine, and then better uh, diagnostics around what the solutions should entail. And so I'm going to spend just a couple moments on, on each of those issues. Um, and I'm going to pick up first where, where Karen uh, very aptly described what happened in the 1990s in Russia, where, and, and in Ukraine to some extent, um, the, the roots of oligarchy lie with the, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the transition from communism to capitalism. And at the time, as a community in the West, we, we perhaps did not recognize that, that capitalism is not some monolithic entity. There are different types of capitalism. There's big firm capitalism, there's state capitalism, there's entrepreneurial capitalism, and then there is something that is called oligarchic capitalism. And oligarchic capitalism uh, began to take roots in, in both Russia and Ukraine in the early 90s, not only because of the legacy of central planning and state control of the economy from the Soviet Union, but because of czarist traditions uh, in, in the region. And as you all know, under the czars, um, private property was not legalized. Um, boyars and their, and the czars and their boyars basically um, extracted rents from the serfs and from the peasants in the, in the region. And uh, they developed what are known as extractive institutions rather than inclusive institutions. And so those very deeply rooted historical tendencies in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, shaped an environment in which an oligarchic economy was able to take root in, in, these, in these countries. And oligarchy, though it has nominally features of capitalism and private property on paper, generally speaking, is based on the idea that governments design policies to protect the interests of a narrow few, uh, to actually encourage informal economic activity uh, uh, and, and prevent, uh, create high barriers of entry to genuinely uh, entrepreneurial, honest, and competitive companies. And so um, as this took root in the, in the former Soviet Union and in Russia and Ukraine in particular, uh, it became very hard indeed to isolate um, this phenomenon and, and use the rule of law uh, such as it was in this region to enforce private property rules. And instead what happened was that uh, uh, private property became a relative rather than an absolute concept. And so um, on top of that, of course, um, we have Putinism. And Putinism has created a geopolitical imperative around this because in, in Putin's oligarchy, um, the... Um, you know, the, the, the top uh, leaders of the country have taken control of the key economic sectors, the key law enforcement agencies, and they need to survive. They need to expand in order to survive. You cannot confine Putin's oligarchy within the borders of Russia. So starting in the early 2000s, they began to export their methods, their corrupt methods, very successful at home, 
to try to take over energy sector and, and other major sectors in, in Ukraine and the region. And this, was, this became uh, driven to such an extent that, in effect, they've, they've tried to, by this time, create an alternative to the Western-based liberal economic rules-based order. And they're trying now to export oligarchy as an alternative form of governance throughout the region. So between what you might call the czarist roots of oligarchy and the geopolitical drivers of oligarchy, we now face what political scientists call the iron law of oligarchy. And the iron law of oligarchy simply stands for the proposition that dominant political and economic groups will always find pathways around good reforms, even the most well-intentioned reforms, and will attempt to deform uh, the, the economies of their, of their resident countries and perpetuate their power. And so now the good news is that in Ukraine in particular, while this oligarchic economy took root, there's also very many green sprouts everywhere you look of an entrepreneurial economy. And the, the features of an entrepreneurial uh, economy are quite distinct from those of an oligarchic economy. First, entrepreneurs uh, have a stake in economic growth. Oligarchs have a stake in, in economic control. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs introduce a dynamic kind of equilibrium where um, when, when, they, when their private property is protected and their uh, conduct is rewarded, they can grow entirely new companies, they can create new wealth, and they can, um, you know, breed a uh, new workforce. And so everywhere you look in Ukraine, I was there just a week ago, you can see signs of entrepreneurial growth. And they, so now the question becomes, as President Zelensky, with, with U.S. support, begins to look at a systemic solution to this question, yes, of course, he needs to regulate the oligarchy uh, more, more uh, strictly of course he should take antitrust actions against them. And he, he, of course the law should be better enforced. But in, at the same time, it's absolutely essential to grow the entrepreneurial economy by rewarding good behavior and also trying to isolate the, the bad social behaviors that come with oligarchy, including criminal behavior and attempts to treat eco economic activity as a, as a game in which everybody's just trying to divide up the government pie. Um, the, the, the real opportunity for President Zelensky and the future of Ukraine is to, is to stop the interference of government in the economy and allow entrepreneurs to grow um, their assets, uh, be able to you know, gain new sources of financing be able to trade their assets on public markets and be able to, you know, in the process, create a much more inclusive type of capitalism based on more democratic institutions. So if, if, we, if we look at the root causes and we look at pathways for solutions, I think the news is on balance good for Ukraine because of the, the strength of the entrepreneurial spirit in the country and of course, this is what the Maidan was about. Uh, the Maidan has, you know, was at one level a revolution that was uh, intended to, to, to protect the dignity of small business and entrepreneurs. It was the first revolution in history over free trade principles. And so, uh, you know, the roots of the Maidan um, are, have spread and they need to be nurtured and cultivated by the current uh, government and business community. Matthew, thanks for giving us some hope. We're down to 15 minutes. I have to get Daria here. We've talked about Zelensky's uh, de-oligarchization proposal, proposed law. Can you walk us through that? And, you know, I know you have a visual here. And also, I mean, you and I have <laughs> been on this issue for, for many years. Should we be hopeful or is this just more PR? Uh, you, you know, uh, Matthew's uh, talking about entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurs can save Ukraine, but all of these oligarchs, they uh, claim that they are entrepreneurs. 
And it's a big issue how to distinguish oligarchs from actually entrepreneurs who are paying taxes and who are not interfering into politics and who are not interfering into the media space. That's a big issue, and I think the good thing about the presidential draft law, which I suggest we put in the visual here, is that there is a first attempt actually to say who is an oligarch. And according to the draft law initiated by President Zelensky, uh, th it, there has to be at least three out of four. Um, Darius visual here, sorry. Darius. Yeah, Darius visual, please put in the screen. There we go. Uh, it's, it's complicated, but uh, Actually, uh, it's, it's not that much complicated. Basically, an oligarch, according to a draft law from President Zelensky, is somebody who interferes into political life, takes part into political life, um, particularly finances, political bodies or politicians, uh, someone who controls media, and someone who um, has a monopoly, uh, either directly or through companies which he or she controls, merely he. Um, and uh, the fourth um, uh, 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 thing is that uh, an oligarch is somebody who has uh, wealth more than $87 million. Uh, so f three of uh, four of these things make a person an oligarch. And then uh, Zelensky suggests that National Security and Defense Council has to gather together and decide who from uh, uh, all these uh, entrepreneurs who are saying they're entrepreneurs uh, have to be into the register of oligarchs. So, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky suggests to have the register of oligarchs, uh, which I don't really think will help uh, uh, to de-oligarchize uh, Ukraine. Um, and he also suggests that those who are in the register uh, have to declare their assets as uh, public officials do and they are prohibited, they will be prohibited to finance uh, political parties. And those top officials in Ukraine, in judicial system, in law enforcement system, in, um, among politicians, uh, they will have to submit to this register uh, every single communication with such oligarchs. So, good intentions, good we have the discussion about oligarchs, good that President Zelensky sa says that oligarchs are the national threat, uh, but I think that something we are missing here, uh, and there are some serious risks, uh, because the National Security Council has a huge discretion. Uh, they can gather together and decide who out of all these out of all these oligarchs who are saying they are entrepreneurs are actually oligarchs and who are not. So, for example, Renata Akhmetov, whom I consider an oligarch, is going public and saying, I'm an investor. But will Renata Akhmetov appear into the register? Uh, what's, uh, I, I think President Zelensky will likely uh, want to put first uh, Poroshenko into this list of oligarchs. I believe uh, he probably have to be in the list, if all oligarchs have to be in the list. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it will be up to President Zelensky to decide who will be first uh, and who will be never in this, um, uh, in, in, this, in this list. I think Viktor Pinchuk doesn't want to be there as well. Um, I think Igor Kolomoisky, well, Igor Kolomoisky is probably the one who doesn't care. He is already uh, mentioned by uh, Anthony Blinken that he is an oligarch. Uh, he's been sanctioned by the U.S., he's been investigated by the U.S. and Ukraine. Uh, so uh, he, he, he is the one who probably uh, is happy. Well, I'm an oligarch, and now you guys are also oligarchs officially. Uh, so that's an issue here. Uh, and I'm a bit concerned with this initiative, which doesn't include the work of Anti-Monopoly Committee, uh, who has actually to make uh, uh, real competition for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. For those who are willing to do business fair and compete with each other, anti-monopoly committee has to work. But you don't see fines against Renata Khmeta, for example. Um, you know, we, we, we see that the monopoly is in media business. We talk today a lot about disinformation. But if we look who owns Ukrainian media, these are all oligarchs. And they are monopolies of our media as well. So to clean up the media sector, from oligarchs is also through the work of the anti-monopoly committee. Nothing on that in the presidential draft law and nothing on that from President Zelensky. So I would want our president actually to focus on institutions when he is trying to deliver results. And judicial reform. 
We talked so much today about the judicial reform. Gianni Bucchicchio, the president of the Venice Commission, came here, spent two days, met all leadership of the country and told, well, we worked for you. We made the list of recommendations how to do your judicial reform, reform right, how to make sure that businesses here in Ukraine trust to judges and they can protect their investments, they can protect their businesses. Just do the reforms. Just don't do the way how you are trying to do that in the parliament. Simply uh, make sure that foreign experts, international you know, um, experts uh, who are non-biased have crucial role in selecting of self-governance bodies in the judicial um, uh, uh, branch of power. So basically I think this is what is missing and I hope that this uh, conference, this panel will help to deliver a message also to President Zelensky that this sounds nice, the register of oligarchs, uh, but the way how you do that right is actually building institutions. And the last point I want to make here, as I'm the only one Ukrainian and I'm happy to have all other Americans here sitting discussing about the oligarchs, um, the problem is of with oligarchs is not only in Ukraine. And let's be honest and fair about Ukraine. We have criticism about Ukraine from Western partners and we as civil society, we are sometimes very happy for this very practical criticism. You have to uh, fight oligarchs, you have to build rule of law, you have to build strong institutions. But listen, oligarchs penetrate Western financial system, Western legal system, use Western lawyers, Western PR firms in order to attack us to attack good institutions. And if you look in the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, to uh, whom uh, Karen referred, it was attacked by uh, Firtash lawyers, Joe Diginova and Victoria Tutsing. And also FBI was attacked by these lawyers, American lawyers uh, hired by Dmitry Firtash, who is sitting in Austria. So the question is now to Austria, is the EU member state. But how come the EU member state cannot simply execute the international agreement to extradite Mitra Firtash for already seven years? You know, that's a big question. And we, we can say a lot about each EU member state. We can say a lot about Great Britain. We can say a lot about the US, how these jurisdiction, jurisdictions are used by our oligarchs in order to whitewash their reputation, in order to whitewash their, their in order actually to have a good lifestyle there and penetrate their political systems. So in the fight with oligarchs in Ukraine, the West has to clean it up as well. And this is the frank conversations, this is the sincere conversation. And I'm happy that President Joe Biden is saying right things, let's start saying doing. Right things, but he represented Delaware. You know, <laughs> so, uh, you're right, I mean, the, the Dimitro Firtash, the even the Austrian Supreme Court ordered him extradited, and he still found a way to start the case over again and, and stay in Austria. Well, we have, we're down to the uh, lightning round here, so we already have solutions. Demonopolization, Karen, international cooperation and, and strengthening law enforcement. You know, Matthew talking about uh, policies, government policies that encourage economic growth competition that sort of uh, dilute the power. But I want, so I want, I want everybody to have their, their, their final word. Um, you, you don't have to answer this question, but I mean, I'm, based on what Daria said, do these labels really help or is this just more cosmetic? Uh, does this sound like a cosmetic fight? And then, uh, but the floor is, is, is yours for the final word. And since we haven't heard from Casey in a while, let's start with Casey. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Brian. I mean, I, I know we only have a few minutes. I just want to echo everything Daria just said about the West cleaning up its own backyard, its own shop. I mean, Daria is exactly right. American officials, European officials, they can come to Ukraine as much as they want. They can recommend policy solutions. They can recommend personnel changes. But unless the anonymity is ended in real estate, unless the anonymity is ended in trusts, unless the anonymity is ended in shell companies, these oligarchs do not operate only domestically. They don't operate only in Ukraine. They are international figures. They are transnational figures. As we've seen with Fertash, as we've seen with Kolomoisky, as we've seen with Akhmetov, as we've seen with Pinchuk, they access Western financial systems. They access Western political systems to their advantage, and they do it perfectly legally. Now, I do want to say on a final option optimistic note, it has been an incredible two weeks in the U.S. to watch the Biden administration finally come out 
and specifically address kleptocracy and corruption as a national security threat. And I don't think it's any coincidence that that timing lines up with what we've seen from President Zelensky and the Zelensky administration itself. There is finally momentum. There is finally room for optimism. Uh, and I can't wait to see where things go from here. So thank you, Daria. Thank you, Brian. I'll end there. Karen, do you see, do you share the optimism? Um, I do share the optimism because, as I, I, I said earlier today uh, when I was speaking with some of the other presenters, by making corruption a national security threat to the U.S., we are elevating it to the level of terrorism. Uh, and when we did that with terrorism in the, in the early 2000s, the U.S. massed a significant law enforcement, intelligence agency, Department of Defense resources towards tackling that problem. Um, and so um, I look forward to seeing the U.S. do the same with this, you know, with the problem of corruption so that we can do, as Daria has rightly pointed out, clean up our own house. Um, because without us, these oligarchs would not exist. Let's be honest. Without our financial system, without our lawyers, without our, you know, our our, our ability to manipulate, you know, um, the news through media control, you know, um, and and the airwaves and and the insidious ways that um, these individuals and the governments that are behind them in some of the cases, when I'm, I'm particularly talking about Russia, for example have been able to, you know, dumb down the U.S. standards and the EU standards for everything from journalism, you know, to um, uh, to our financial standards. And we need to start treating these individuals as exactly what they are, that they are not here to play in the capitalist system the way that true capitalists are. They are there to play in the capitalist system to line their pocket. And they intend to and continue to use countries like Ukraine, countries like Moldova to exactly do that. They are not there to be the you know true economic players that you know we've we've pushed our own corporations and our own investors in that direction through through in part through exactly what Daria said, which is the antitrust laws that we've enforced, the environmental laws that we passed and enforced, um, you know, and the tax laws that we passed and and enforced. All of those have to be brought to bear on these individuals so that we start expecting them to be true economic players, um, not just trying to trying to dethrone them through criminal investigations. Matthew, you got a minute. I'm sorry. Okay. For time management. <laughs> First, let me say I, I do agree with respect to Ukraine completely with Daria's point that the focus of all future reforms not needs to be on institution building. And it also needs to be on, you know, uh, dismantling those structures in existing institutions where oligarchy is embedded. And so that, you know, that the focus, yes, of course, there are individual oligarchs. And yes, of course, many of them should be in jail. And, and, and that should happen in the natural course of events. But the real uh, heart of the, the reform challenge is to build the new institutions that will reward an entrepreneurial economy. On the larger question of how this fits with both the United States and let's say global economics, um, it does need to be said that globalization, um, as it has taken place over the last three decades, um, has both been fueled corruption and is now being fueled by oligarchic corruption. And so as the Biden administration turns towards the future, and it's very important that, to note that President Biden has said to all of his cabinet, please come up with a better solution set. I think we can look towards the possibility that a new vision of, of global economics will come out of this. Let's call it globalization 2.0, in which it is going to be based on the rule of law. Daria, do you want to talk? I will have more opportunities to talk. So I thank I, you for this panel. Yes, Let's do you, things everyone. with talk. It's a good conversation. We'll continue. But I also hope that there will be some actions as a follow-up actions to what we have discussed today. All right. Thank you all. Great, great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
прямо з дискусії до мене приєднується в студії Дарина Калинюк, виконавча директорка Центру протидії корупції. Адже до завершення нашого марафону залишається одна панель і вже можна підводити майже фінальні підсумки. Дарино, ви в вступному слові вчора говорили про і задавала такий тон очікування високий щодо конкретних дій, щодо планів, щодо спільних дій, об'єднуючих зусиль. Чи ви задоволені тими виступами, тими меседжами, які ми отримали від наших спікерів? Я задоволена меседжами, але я хочу перейти до дій. Треба починати з себе. Ми тільки що говорили про те, як побороти олігархів, і багато хто говорить, як потрібно побороти корупцію, є багато міжнародних форумів, є форуми класні міжнародні в Україні, і нас запитають, а чи дійсно ви перша неолігархічна конференція. Ми зробимо конкретну дію. Ми опублікуємо детальний звіт, хто нас фінансує, на що ми витратили гроші, і ми запрошуємо всі міжнародні форуми і в Україні, і за кордоном, всі міжнародні форуми, які будуть говорити про деолігархізацію, які будуть говорити про боротьбу з корупцією, про корупцію як загрозу національної безпеки, так як бути прозорими в тому, що їх фінансують. Ми хочемо бути транспарентні про те, як вони фінансують. Тому ми маємо зрозуміти, хто фінансує з агентами на національному та інтернаціональному рівні. Це буде Be our specific thing. We will publish our financial report, and we are ready to take action. So first, there is a gratitude, then a financial report, and then all sessions that uh, were um, part of our conference will be available on the conference website. But what about uh, the further work? What are your advocacy priorities at the level of Ukraine and the level of the international community? First, at the level of Ukraine, we heard a lot of strong messages about the judicial reform. I am very thankful full to the president of the Venice Commission who came here, who worked at our forum for two days, who had meetings with Mr. Razumko, with the president, and who explained that we as Venice Commission have uh, given, made very specific recommendations about purging the uh, judicial system in Ukraine. Just engage independent international experts in this cleansing process, the process of cleansing judicial uh, governance uh, agencies. Uh, he already said uh, that the current draft laws that are in the parliament are not in line with the recommendations of the Venice Commission. Uh, Let's do that. Um, I uh, have uh, suggestions to the Ukrainian uh, Speaker of the Parliament, to uh, Mr. Zelensky. Let's start the organization from the very first step of the right judicial draft laws. Let's have them passed by the end of the summer. But I also have an international advocacy goal. What is it? So my advocacy goal at the international level, you mean in the next week when those discussions will take place? I have this dream. I want corruption to be viewed as a threat to national security at the level of European Union by the end of this year, at the level of the EU, at the level of the UK. I want all countries of uh, developed democracy to uh, recognize that corruption is not just a problem of developing countries, of democracies in transition. This is a problem also of developed democracies. And it is a problem which ruins them from within, which undermines the ideas of democracy. We are interdependent in this struggle. Mm. In order to mm, restore the power of uh, democracy, we need to unite our efforts. So I expect Austria to recognize the corruption threat to its national security. I want Germany to do that. Let's work together. We have solutions here in Ukraine. Maybe not all of them are great. Maybe we have a lot of things to work on. But we do have things to share because while we do make mistakes, we also uh, take steps forward and our uh, conference called Democracy in Action. Let's take action together. We are acting together in Ukraine. Let's take action internationally together as well. Let's call a spade a spade and do uh, what we promised to do. Let's not just talk. I am once again thankful. Uh, just, uh, just a few words of gratitude. Yeah, I thank the Anti-Corruption Action Center. And you can keep thanking people. Yes, exactly. I want to thank uh, the people who made this uh, uh, 
uh, conference possible. This is invisible work, but this is fantastic work. First of all, I want to thank the uh, uh, Star Maze company, Talka Kavalov, who uh, actually made this happen, who brought this all together. We are happy that we are that we have such strong partners. Viktor Knizhi is our director, who has been here for the second day, who uh, controls our timing. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Action Center, Yulia Yulia Magyarolova, uh, have done a lot of invisible work. I'm very thankful to you, our volunteers, our communication partners, our partners. Without you, we would have a very hard time organizing this. So, great job. Uh, you did a lot of good things, and we are going to relax a bit today. Mm. I suggest that we start our final panel so that our team uh, wouldn't get nervous about this, and our panel will help us understand uh, uh, what the threats of Nord Stream 2 are, and what are the inconsistencies of this uh, project with the uh, Green New Deal, which is part of the um, agenda in uh, Europe and the US. So we are moving on to the next panel, and its moderator is Sergei Bukhrist, expert of the European Eco Forum and co-drafter of the EIA Strategic Environmental Assessment Legal Framework of Ukraine. Just in a moment. EU has been strongly criticized for giving green light uh, to the transportation of Russian natural gas to Europe via Nord Stream 2. Is this decision in line uh, with ambitious and pioneering European Green Deal and how the operation of Nord Stream 2 and supply of fossil fuels from Russia will help the EU to achieve the goal of uh, carbon neutrality until 2050? The public and uh, Many of those stakeholders inside and outside the EU take it and see it as a corruption at a strategic level. Non-governmental organizations are filing lawsuits challenging such corruptive and uh, illegal decision-making. Nord Stream 2 is also against the interests of Ukraine and makes the European continent dependent from Russia. Nord Stream has generated conflict between politics, economics and environment. Um, we have uh, a panel of uh, distinguished speakers here to discuss uh, the correlation between Nord Stream 2 and European Green Deal. Um, among the speakers, uh, Manuel Sarazin, who represents uh, Alliance 90, the Greens, and the, uh, he is the member of uh, German Parliament, Bundestag. Mikhailo Gonchar from the Center for Global Studies Strategy 21, and the center fo is focusing on global issues of energy sector development, energy policies and international security, development of energy relations with countries from the Black Sea, Caspian Bal uh, Baltic Sea, Central Asia and European Union. He is also a chief editor of the Black Sea Security Journal. Olya Melin Zabramna from uh, the international uh, NGO Environmental People Law, who has been practicing uh, environmental law uh, and def uh, defending cit citizens' environmental rights for more than 15 years. Uh, she is, uh, together with her colleagues, she is uh, the Goldman Award winner. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Schmidt, uh, who is a postdoctoral research fellow and project development scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, a senior fellow for democratic resilience at the Center of European Policy Analysis, and a fellow at the Duke University Center for International Global, Global Studies. From 2015 to 2019, Dr. Smith served uh, as European Energy Security Advisor at the US Department of State. And uh, um, uh, also, we have the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, Mr. Uh, uh, Jacek Zariusz-Wolski. Uh, and we also have uh, the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine on European and Euro-Atlantic uh, Euro integration, Mr. Alexei Ryabchin, 
who is an uh, energy and EU, uh, and EU Green Deal uh, advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, um, the Climate Policy Advisor to the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine. Uh, he used to, uh, to serve as the Deputy Minister for Energy and Environmental Protection of Ukraine, and he also used to be a member of uh, the Ukrainian Parliament from 2014 to 2019. And uh, the first uh, speaker uh, to contribute to this panel discussion is uh, um, Manuel Saradzin, and the question that I wanted to ask is, uh, well, obviously Germany is one of the main engines of uh, the EU, and therefore major EU initiatives like the European Green Deal are not likely to be successful without Germany's true commitment. For how long, in your view, Nord Stream 2 will be supported in Germany? The floor is yours. Um, uh, okay, then uh, while, 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 while we are waiting uh, for Mr. Sarasin to join in, uh, I think uh, the next speaker uh, pursuant to the agenda is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Poland, Mr. Jacek Wolski, uh, Zariusz Wolski. And the question is, uh, what is the vision on Poland, of Poland uh, in the correlation, in terms of correlation between these two projects, Nord Stream and the big, one of the fundamental uh, initiatives, the European Green Deal? The floor is yours. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Please turn on the mic. Okay, uh, now you hear me. Probably. Uh, just a small correction, I, I was European Affairs Minister, not Foreign Affairs. But now, what is relevant for the topic, I am Standing Rapporteur of the European Parliament for Energy Security. Uh, your question is, uh, how do we see this problem from, from, from Poland? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say that, uh, for first, um, there has been volumes uh, written and said about it about Nord Stream 2 um, uh, from the point of view of energy security because it is detrimental to the energy security uh, of the whole European Union, including and if not the most for the eastern flank of European Union, which means uh, I'm regard as Poland. Uh, second, um, on climate, uh, I would just quote uh, what was said in the in in the Congress, American Congress, by Secretary uh, for Energy Jennifer Granholm, uh, she said a few days ago, one of the reasons why this pipeline is very dangerous is because it is carrying the dirtiest form of natural gas on Earth with no security on methane emissions. So she dis distances herself from the from her boss, President Biden. Uh, so, so it, it, it is uh, detrimental uh, as gas, although gas may be uh, a transitional fuel uh, in, the, in the transition period, but this gas coming from Russia is exceptionally uh, dirty. And the second an environmental concern, which we do have, do have in Poland, but we share it with, 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 uh, with, with the Baltic, Baltic states uh, like Estonia, Litvia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and others, uh, Sweden, and Denmark, and Finland, is that it is on the, on the bottom of the Baltic Sea, uh, where there's enormous amounts of, of weaponry from the First and the Second World War, including chemical weapons, which may become uh, uh, moved and uh, become dangerous uh, because of the, of the laying of the pipeline, but also because of the of the of the of, of the exploitation. The third element is that uh, already now we know that Russia uh, is uh, will be guarding and, and 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 protecting the pipeline. It will be a pretext for the increased naval presence of of, of Russia in the Baltic Sea, and that leads me leads me to another than climate concern which is linked with the geopolitical side of it, because it is uh, extremely uh, uh, dangerous and, and, and harmful for Ukraine, for Belarus, for Poland, for Slovakia, 
uh, because it increases increases the dependence, uh, not only energy, which is obvious, but also uh, geopolitical dependence on on Russia, which has a very aggressive uh, attitudes, as we know. Uh, the next element uh, besides this, uh, um, uh, which is linked to geopolitical weapon, the gas being ge geopolitical we weapon, is corruption. A uh, long time ago, uh, the German doctrine of Ostpolitik used to say uh, Wandel durch Handel, which means change through trade. So it was saying more or less that uh, by trading with Russia, uh, Russia will change in a positive sense. Uh, what is happening uh, with Nord Stream 2, not only, but especially, is that it's the other way around. It is not only uh, supporting the kleptocracy and, and corruption system of Russia, but it is also fueling uh, corruption to, into, into another direction. We call it federalization of Europe. The political elite of Europe, in its part, is uh, captured is corrupted by this Nord Stream 2 link. So uh, to sum up, on all those fronts, uh, be it energy security, uh, be it uh, climate, uh, be it geopolitical weapon, uh, and corruptive, co corruptive uh, influence on Europe and uh, consolidating uh, corrupt, cor corrupt regime of Russia, this is uh, uh, an enterprise which is which is uh, fatal, detrimental, harmful, and should be stopped. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, we are we are back uh, with uh, uh, making it available for uh, to, to us to speak and participate in this panel, uh, Mr. Manuel, uh, Manuel Saracin, uh, again uh, Alliance 90, the Greens, member of uh, Bundestag. Uh, and uh, my question uh, to uh, Mr. Saracen is, Germany is one of the main engines of the EU, just repeat it, and uh, therefore the major EU initiatives like the European Green Deal are not likely to be successful without Germany's true commitment. For how long, in your view, Nord Stream 2 will be supported in Germany? Please, the floor is yours. So first I have to excuse for the setting Usually I want to sit in front of a bookshelf to show my intelligence, but I was totally stuck in traffic uh, in my hometown. So uh, you have to imagine now this is the intelligent bookshelf and not the family car, which, which I was driving just before. So excuse me for my delay. Yeah, uh, my clear sentence on this is, um, first I have to agree on what Mr. Zariusz Wojski just said before. Nord Stream 2 is a project which is feeding in directly into the corrupt Kremlin structures. Um, and uh, Germany should be more aware of that, especially as um, some famous German politicians are also benefiting um, of, uh, of, of this money, which is uh, made by Russian oil and gas companies. But the clear situation is like that. Uh, the German government from time to time is talking like it could be more critical towards Nord Stream 2 or even stop it. But in reality, the political will to push us through as fast as possible before the elections, uh, if possible, is quite big in the Grand Coalition with the leftist and with the uh, AfD, the right wing um, uh, nationalist party. Um, also, the liberals are in the parliament usually voting in favor of Nord Stream 2, although within the liberals it is quite disputed uh, because the foreign policy uh, group uh, within the Liberals is quite near to our position on that. And now we have this huge debate on a moratorium or a switch of mechanism um, in Germany, which um, might be perhaps bringing some results, but I fear it also might be mainly bringing time for finishing the building of the pipe. So the German political scene, except the Greens, is in the end a positive towards Nord Stream 2. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker on our panel is Mikhailo Gonchar, and uh, my question to you is, uh, can Nord Stream 2 undermine the European Green Deal and the global climate action? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for invitation to participate in this uh, phenomenal conference. Um, 
I prepared not only my speech, but uh, some slides too. Uh, because when we speak about uh, pipes, uh, oil, gas, we need more schemes, maps, for more better understanding. When analyzing a project, it is important to see not only what its initiators show, but also what they ignore uh, and try to hide. The Nord Stream 2 is such a project where there is something that is overlooked and something that is carefully hidden. Uh, as you know, um, greenhouse gases are not just CO2, dioxide carbon. Conventional natural gas, methane, CH4, helps global warming much more efficiently than CO2. Its greenhouse potential is from 25 to 84 times higher than the carbon dioxide potential. The harmful effects of methane emissions into the atmosphere appeared in uh, scientific research only in early 2000s. In Russia, uh, this has been highlighted in studies uh, by different institutions, uh, including uh, Arctic Antarctic Institution, uh, Oil and Gas Institution of Russian Academy of Sciences and others. In the context of the development of Arctic gas and oil fields, construction uh, of the Nord Stream pipelines, and natural gas liquefaction on the Yamal Peninsula. According to the uh, German federal government, the strongest argument in favor of Russia's Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2 projects is the greater use of natural gas as a transition fuel to achieve the goals of decarbonization and climate neutrality. Indeed, CO2 emissions from gas combustion uh, are on average one third lower than emissions from traditional coal uh, or oil combustion. That is by using gas from Nord Streams, they say, you can get a significant reduction in CO2 emissions in the atmosphere over Germany and the EU. These pipelines themselves do not emit anything into the atmosphere because these are sealed pipes that lie at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Uh, they do not have gas <coughs> stations that emit CO2 and methane. And, uh, uh, but this argument, frankly speaking, is false. Nord Stream 2 is only uh, 1,200 1, kilometers offshore section of the new gas transmission system from the Bavanenko gas field on the Yamal Peninsula to the German Czech border with a total length of more 4,700 kilometers. See this slide, please. I uh, take uh, some maps for all sections, uh, for every section of uh, this uh, route. That is, it is necessary to estimate the total effect of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not only because of the local effect in Europe, but also considering the entire pipeline route with dozens, dozens of compressor stations using natural gas as a fuel. After all, methane and CO2 emissions into the atmosphere occur in Yamal and on the route from Yamal Peninsula to Europe. Therefore, a certain uh, reduction uh, in CO2 emissions in Germany due to greater use of gas from Russian streams will respond to additional CH4, methane emission, in Yamal and together with CO2 on the route to Europe. Because methane in tens of times more aggressive than carbon dioxide, the overall reduction and greenhouse gas emissions uh, seems questionable. Given the order of magnitude more aggressive methane compared to CO2, this means that the positive effect of reducing CO2 emissions in Europe will be completely neutralized 
by the negative effect of increasing CH4 and CO2 emissions in Yamal and over the gas route to the EU. It's a very important remark. Load figures uh, for reducing CO2 emissions uh, amid uh, tacit agreement with increasing emissions of more aggressive CH4 as a wrong way to achieve the Green Deal goals for Europe. After all, the Earth's atmosphere is the same, both over Germany, Yamal, uh, Finland, or United States. Therefore, the argument of supporters of Nord Stream 2 about the environmentally friendly project at least are incorrect and, frankly speaking, false. By the way, the German Institute uh, for Economic Research believes that to achieve the EU's climate goals by 2030, it is necessary to have uh, the share of gas uh, in energy balance and by uh, 2040 to abandon it altogether. A recent report by the scientists for the Europe, this is a new group, new established group, uh, consists of um, the Germans, Austrian, and uh, um, the scientists from Switzerland too, um, notes that given the same emission, no, 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 conclusion may be later, no, not, not so quickly. <laughs> Please, return slide. Um, a recent report by the scientists for future notes that the given methane emissions from natural gas production and transportation, expanding its use could have the same negative climate impact as well as the use of coal. What does Nord Stream 2 look like in this context with 50 years life cycle? 50 years. It's correct slide. Uh, scientists in Russia itself uh, are also sounding the alarm about increased uh, methane emissions from the Arctic due to industrial activities to develop oil and gas deposits. A feature of Yamal, as well as most of the Arctic coast of Russia, is the saturation of the permafrost layer with methane hydrates. Methane hydrates means a very, means a very unstable ice-like mixture of methane and water. Mm. Global warming has destabilized the permafrost in the Arctic. It has begun to melt, and with, uh, it is the permafrost deposits of methane hydrates have begun to degrade, releasing large amounts of methane into the atmosphere. Looking at the satellite monitoring, you see this uh, uh, satellite um, photos. Uh, okay, one minute. Uh, monitoring data of the European Space Agency, local anomalies of high concentration of methane in the atmosphere over the Yamal are due to increased anthropogenic emissions in areas of active gas production and transportation. It was, uh, next slide please, last slide. It was in the Yamal in 2010s that the phenomenon of cryovolcanism Unusual for Earth, a period caused by the natural explosive uh, of methane from permafrost and simulated by the industrial activity of Russian companies in the fragile Arctic nature. Therefore, my last point, development of the Arctic gas and oil fields and the construction of long distance transcontinental pipeline infrastructure by Russia is a global environmental and climate crime. The accomplices of this crime, unfortunately, at the European end of the pipeline, are several German federal governments, led by Angela Merkel, during whose chancellery the first Nord Stream was put into operation, and now she tries to complete the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. What a pity. Thank you so much. I will Thank you. Uh, of course, th this is the first inter intervention that we expect from you, but obviously there will be some also around discussion, <laughs> around uh, the, the, the panel uh, discussion as regards uh, 
uh, extra reflection to, 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 to the issue. Now uh, I would like to give the floor to Olya Melinzabramna with an NGO uh, perspective. Uh, and my question, specific question is, uh, in your view, is Nord Stream 2 a unique example of strategic corruption in Europe? Please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Good evening, the distinguished audience. It's a big pleasure and a big honor to speak about this issue of uh, uh, corruption and the issues of uh, um, which are threatening the implementation of the Green Deal, not only in Europe, but also uh, in Ukraine, as Ukraine is also plans to uh, to uh, follow the goals of the Green Deal in in the nearest future. Uh, so I would like to, um, to mention some also interesting facts when uh, corrupted uh, Russian government uh, have been involved in uh, different kind of projects all around Europe, uh, thus uh, spreading uh, Russian type of corruption, uh, spreading uh, uh, illegal, uh, illegal and uh, unstable decisions, sp spreading uh, political crisis and also trying to destabilize the political situation in, in Europe. Europe as well. Um, so I would like to mention that uh, the um, Rus Russian Federation has been a long time um, trying to invest, uh, so-called to invest in different infrastructure projects and in different energy projects in Europe. Um, and the big issue where the Russia is, is still very active is the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear energy and construction of nuclear power plants and further um, and further uh, dealing with the uh, nuclear waste. So here, uh, Russian Federation has uh, some uh, big uh, supporters and few states that support uh, its its plans and its uh, um, uh, its um, generous uh, loans to to construct different uh, different uh, uh, types of nuclear power plants in Europe. So there are a couple of examples like Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, um, the plans to construct nuclear power plants there are associated with the also corruption on uh, on a high level mm, uh, the there, are, uh, there is a strong uh, opposition from uh, different political uh, parties, from uh, NGOs, from public society to to these plans. But these countries are really very favorable to uh, to to Russia, especially in times when the, the heads of those countries are traveling to Moscow for some private meetings with the uh, with the president of Russia or some head head officials in in Russian government. So uh, uh, and usually um, Russia is uh, uh, providing those countries uh, with the very generous loans in order to construct power power plants and to operate those power plants so uh, this uh, kind of generous gifts uh, those countries cannot cannot resist so the issue is for instance with uh, with Hungary uh, with Hungary with construction of uh, nuclear power plant in Paks to as well um, as Bul in Bulgaria as um, uh, Bulgaria was uh, uh, a captive market uh, for uh, Russian nuclear industry, and also Bulga Bulgaria was called the Russian Trojan horse in the European Union because of their um, long-standing tradition of supporting uh, uh, Russia, supporting Rosatom, and uh, uh, other, um, uh, and supporting all of the. Um, uh, project where the Russia is standing uh, behind. So in, in this case, uh, uh, those countries like um, Hungary, like uh, Bulgaria, they are very much under the influence of, of Russia. And the, this influence is also because Russia generously gave them a big loans for the construction of the nuclear power plants, like in, in Hungary, uh, Russia uh, made a loan uh, 10 billion of euros, a big loan to Hungary, and Hungary uh, is now only due to, to pay uh, 2 million um, to, uh, to continue construction continue construction of uh, a Pax uh, 2. Um, also in, in Czech Republic, there, are, uh, there, there was also a, a debate whether to, to include or exclude Russia in the tender process for planned 6 billion um, um, project in Dukovani nuclear power plant. And then the main issue whether to, to allow Russia and China to participate in this tender was the uh, security concerns issue. Uh, 
so Russia is also has very strong ties to to Czech Republic as well, and there are m many countries in the EU. It's a pity, but they are also uh, supporting uh, mm, a Nord Stream construction, like uh, Germany, like Austria, um, like a few other parties, a few other countries. Um, so back in, back to to the issue of the Nord Stream, uh, we we can state that uh, Nord Stream is a project that uh, will not allow uh, Europe to reach its uh, uh, Green uh, Deal goals uh, in the nearest future because uh, um, uh, no, because Green Deal says that Europe should cut its emission at least by 55 percent until 2030 and um, uh, Green Deals um, said that Europe Europe aims to become the world's first climate neutral continent. So with the uh, increased gas supply from Russia via Nord Stream, it will be very hard to uh, to achieve this goal. And even some top officials of uh, uh, in the EU are saying that uh, uh, Yes, can be the uh, can play a very small role in the uh, in the uh, energy uh, sector in those countries in the EU countries, but it cannot be uh, as crucial as as it is now. So, if the Europe will allow. Uh, to uh, to continue Nord Stream uh, Nord Stream to construction and to operate it by this uh, uh, Germany and other European countries which will buy Russian gas from Nord Stream one and Nord Stream two gas pipelines they will also uh, finance the the war that Russia initiated in the east of, of Europe and uh, also these uh, kind of activities will undermine the uh, the revenues to the Ukraine. Ukrainian budget uh, uh, that are coming from the transition of the gas uh, uh, via Ukraine and also this uh, the issue of the transition of the gas uh, via Ukraine via Poland it's a big issue for for those countries so it's a very critical project and it's a pity when the Russian gas prom and Russian state-run companies are behind of the economic project there, there is always lots of corruption uh, lots of pressure on on power public, uh, lots of fake uh, news in mass media, and uh, usually the public is the one who can resist who, uh, this, who can go to court, who can use uh, uh, legal mechanisms provided by the on the level of the European Union, uh, who can use uh, uh, legal tools and go to court in order to challenge the decision um, taken by those corrupted officials. Thank you, Olya. Um, about an hour ago, a bit more, I guess, uh, during uh, yet another panel here, uh, Senator uh, Whitehouse uh, mentioned that uh, basically there are no illusions about the real objectives and the real meaning of North Stream project. Um, I believe that uh, if the overwhelming major majority of decision makers uh, better sooner come to the same conclusion, then probably we could uh, ask uh, Dr. Schmidt, how can the U.S. play stronger or perhaps decisive role in Nord Stream 2? Please, the floor. Thank you. That's, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for the organizers for having me here today. And I'm really glad that there is a Nord Stream 2 specific panel at the Zero Corruption Conference, because it really is indicative of the much broader issues that we see across the um, uh, across the the uh, the national security space when we it comes to the transatlantic community. After all, when we talk about these issues, we see headlines all the time over the past several years uh, that are are describing national security threats or debates over national security threats associated with authoritarian infrastructure influence, meaning uh, investments in economic deals, quote unquote. Uh, investments in emerging technologies and investments in critical infrastructure, where authoritarian nations like Moscow and, and Beijing it, have come into the transatlantic community and and have basically inverted that idea of Vandal durch Handel that, that Yashik uh, mentioned earlier, where we've really seen that this uh, proliferation of the Schroederization of Europe has led to an inversion of that, where it's been all handle or all trade and no vandal uh, or, or, or no change, at least change towards a, um, you know, open liberal democratic 
uh, well-regulated uh, 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 action in, in, the, uh, in the economic space by these authoritarian nations. So when it comes to uh, looking at the, the kind of the latest on Nord Stream 2, I'll, I'll quote uh, 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 a, 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 an American football coach who, who said, they are who we thought they were. Dennis Green said, they are who we thought they were. And, and this is exactly what we saw at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum uh, last week when Vladimir Putin announced that the first of two strings of Nord Stream 2 is nearly complete. And because of that progress, immediately, even before the project is complete, Putin immediately came out and said it will be up to uh, Kyiv to show goodwill in order to continue gas transit uh, through Ukraine. And, and that shows exactly what the transatlantic community has been so concerned about with this project since 2015. We're in the seventh year of this debate, and there's really no debate left. When, when it comes to these sort of uh, strategic uh, uh, corruption projects, these, these, these malign influence projects, which Nord Stream 2 certainly is, the United States, uh, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, have been resolute in pointing out opposition to the project. And, and for these exact reasons, because it undermines not only the energy security, uh, not to mention green energy goals and, and everything that's been said, all, all, uh, it's been said in much uh, greater depth uh, uh, already. So I will, I will skip over that, aside from to say that, yes, the European Space Agency has shown that the, um, the infrastructure from which Nord Stream 2 gas would come from does have significant methane emissions. Uh, from European Space Agency uh, open source uh, data uh, sets from satellites that they've they put in orbit. And Greta Thunberg has called out herself uh, this project as running counter to not only uh, uh, the the green and, uh, and, and, and rightful climate change uh, goals that, that we um, collectively are, are fighting, but also, you know, strategic corruption and, and all of the sort of things that are, are anti-democratic. And so this is why it is, um, you know, I was I was in some ways surprised to see the Biden administration come out and announce uh, that uh, whereas it would take some sanctions actions against technology calibrated uh, um, sanctions on uh, Russian vessels, Russian entities, et cetera, uh, aimed at stopping the project, it would at the same time name Nord Stream 2 AG and its CEO, Matthias Varnig, as, as engaging in sanctionable behavior, but then waiving those sanctions. And, and this is concerning on a broader strategic level, because when we look at Varnig himself, Varnig is not only an ex-Stasi officer and longtime Putin crony who sits on the boards of, of multiple Kremlin-controlled state-owned enterprises and banks. He was also named earlier this year in Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's widely circulated anti-corruption video as a key figure in Putin's orbit of strategic corruption. So unless that particular move is subsequently reversed or clarified, it really will undermine, I think, the, uh, the Biden administration's excellent goals to, to fight kleptocracy worldwide that they announced last week, to, to band together with other democracies to do so. Um, and, and the problem is that if that, uh, that particular decision is not reversed, I fear that the lesson that authoritarian nations like Russia and China will take is that their recent strategy of targeting current and former Western officials and nations allied with the United States for elite capture is a sound one. Because both nations already use this strategy, whether via Russia's energy or China's critical infrastructure deals in Europe, to undermine policies that would limit the spread of authoritarian national security threats, uh, you know, officials coming out and, and, and pushing against efforts to stop Nord Stream 2, for example, and to take that step to list and then waive sanctions on a character as emblematic of Putin's crony capitalism as Varning will only encourage their campaign uh, to continue unabated. So I really think that that needs to be uh, reversed and reversed quickly. And I think that we've seen that in the United States, although that action was taken, there has been resolute and, um, and, and bipartisan criticism of that decision uh, from both Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill, and many calls for further legislation to ensure Nord Stream 2 is not uh, brought into operation. Secretary Blinken maybe rightfully said that the, uh, the project is uh, a fait accompli when it comes to physical construction. It is close to being done to physical, uh, in terms of physical construction. I believe that full implementation of sanctions now could stop that construction. But what I will clarify um, is that what he didn't say was that the project is a fait accompli to come into operation. And I hope that this is the, me the message that 
the Biden administration and Capitol Hill will take home uh, today and into the future of the next several weeks, that there are many stages of this project that are still targeted under existing sanctions or could be targeted under future legislation for the pre, uh, uh, um, pre-certification, the, the testing, uh, the insurance, and all of these other steps that brings it to operation. And already we saw the main certification firm, uh, the firm DNVGL in Norway, drop out of the project earlier this year uh, because of, of those exact threats and the, uh, the threats of sanctions. And because of that, uh, you see uh, uh, statements already from the Kremlin saying that, well, the next step is going to be potentially a bumpy one because of those sanctions. How is it going to actually come into operation, uh, number one? And number two, the political dynamics in Germany very well may change. As we saw the, um, the, the you know, leading in the polls, there are, are the Green Party right now. They have vowed to not allow the finalization of Nord Stream 2. And there are EU tools at their disposal that could allow that. Um, should um, should they uh, you know the political dynamics change and so so those are things to keep in mind and I'll also just end on this by saying that uh, one thing that has been really overlooked uh, over the past several weeks is that uh, Anna Lindem Baerbach, the German Green Party leader, uh, came out and said this German government quote is completely against all other Europeans with this pipeline project and pointed out that if uh, she was elected she would stop the project. Fine, that's up for the German voters to decide. However, the Kremlin. Uh, came out and pushed back uh, by uh, by this report that came out that uh, that the uh, the the Russians led a cyber attack on Baerbach herself, ret- reportedly in retaliation for this very stance on Nord Stream two. So this really undercuts the idea that this is quote just a commercial deal. I believe it is not just a commercial deal, as I often say. And the German government, on this particular note, currently needs to step up its efforts to make clear to the Kremlin that no pipeline project is more important than limiting Russia's ability to meddle in the German democratic process itself and the democratic process of the transatlantic community writ large. Thank you. Uh, Alexei, uh, thank you for your patience. (laughs) Uh, And uh, in this uh, this long list of speakers, and uh, of course the issue is uh, really high on the agenda and uh, a lot uh, uh, has been already uh, mentioned here uh, with regard to, to both developments, but uh, specifically since we are sitting in Kiev and we are transmitting this, this message uh, uh, to the whole world, how discouraging in your view Nord Stream 2 can be for Ukraine's aspiration to follow the European Green Deal? Yes, thank you very much. I feel myself like I'm a dessert, you know, the, the very last to speak and people are here. Like all the technicians are already look, looking hungry for me, so I'll, I will be like trying to be very, very quick. But it's like, uh, like it's, it's been very interesting panel, I would say, because like I'm in for 15 years in climate change affairs. For five years I was doing like uh, being a member of parliament with the Nord Stream with a distinguished colleague who are like uh, who are next to me uh, in this video screen. For a couple of years I'm doing the Green Deal. Uh, but it's the first time when you know the Nord Stream and the Green Deal are highly divided. So it was like v- one of the most you know interesting solution and sophisticated solution for the conference of crisis. So just a quick words like like Ukraine is definitely share the aspiration of the European Union. We said like lots of times that we are aligning our policies with the Green Deal one. Like we have a special dialogue on the level of our Prime Minister. So our Prime Minister Denis Miguel has a special dialogue with his counterpart, which is Executive uh, Vice, Pre- Vice President Timmermans. They already met several times and discussed, you know, the uh, the uh, the top agenda and the, the champions agendas like for the energy efficiency, for the uh, just transition of a coal mine region for the building or rebuilding of the climate governance architecture and the hydrogen, which are the flagship initiative of Ukrainian government. Uh, also, we have a really great dialogue and a task force from uh, different ministries from that is led by the Olga Stefanishina, Vice Prime Minister <coughs> on the European <coughs> Integration from the Ukrainian side, Katarina Maternova, who was on the pre- previously on the panel yesterday from the European side. We have an extensive you know, dialogue, how to internalize this Green Deal dialogue, how to do an ambitious NDCs, how to, you know, how to, how to explore all the opportunities that Green Deal has, I don't know, in innovation and immobility in like many spheres and of course to tackle the challenges uh, I don't know CBAM and many other stuff and then comes the the, the North Stream because it's at a lot of uncertainty to our plans to decarbonize uh, Ukraine we already have the economic strategy where we said like we will try 
to do our best to decarbonize up to the 2060, but like we will try to do maybe uh, maybe even uh, even earlier if if it's possible. But like it's not only about the money. I will say about the the money, the funds needed for the decarbonization. It's also about the intellectual capital, about the efforts of us of, of of a government. So we are now doing the third energy package. So we are building markets, which our colleagues in Eastern Europe built I don't know 20 years ago. Now we are trying to think about the fourth energy package, which is about decarbonization, about the prosumers, about you know the role of renewables, and like bearing in mind the fifth energy package, which is a green deal, which goes about the emission reduction. It's it's like in, incredibly difficult, and like when we have, for example, our like economic forum in in Berlin with Angela Merkel, who is the prime minister of Ukraine. The, and the Germans said, like, yeah, we see that Ukraine could be a champion on a green hydrogen in Europe, that you could ship a lot of hydrogen because you have a lot of, a lot of land, you have a lot of renewable potential, you have a lot of water. And we say, yeah, but like, how, could we sh how could we ship this hydrogen if you have the Nord Stream 2? If we will not have such amount of gas flow to you, we need to, you know, to invest a lot in, in this kind of stuff. And, and like uh, nobody will invest in Ukraine because we like we have an uncertainty. We have uncertainty with the gas uh, transit from 2024, and we will start raising this concern in in, in the European Commission. Said, ah, let, let let's see because there is a Nord Stream. Nord Stream, there is a, a lot of uncertainty. So like, wait a second. So hydrogen investment, which are the uh, one of the bases of the Green Deal, requires huge amount of certainty and huge amount of of, of uh, prohibitivity. And like we see our national champion Naftagas, who is thinking about uh, hydrogen very seriously, we s we know that our gas TSO is also testing, you know, the capacity of the pipe. We are looking for the for the for the possibility to do this, but like with the with the with the Nord Stream, it comes a huge question mark. And I will just say a few words about the price of the decarbonization <coughs> that we already know that we will do. Just like a f like a seven figures. So first, like our GDP in Ukraine in 2019 was 137 billion euros. Also, we could say that we receive loans from the EU from 2030 to 2080. So for five years, we receive four billions as a macro financial assistance from the European Union. We calculated the CBAM, the imposure of CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that we are like negotiating that. Like it's possibly be from 2.7 uh, billions up to 7 billion. So from roughly from 3 to 7 billions up to 2030. So this money could go out of Ukrainian budget, of Ukrainian GDP, and goes to, I don't know, somewhere. Or like we could lose the export potential. And this is, uh, this is without the calculation of the emission trading system that will be built in Ukraine and that we are trying to do. And on like what we need to pay for the decarbonization. Our NDC, and it's like a first time Ukraine is trying to plan an ambitious NDC, so 65%, which is like for the first time is a proper reduction of, a, of our NDC. Uh, and it will cost us 100 billion euros up to 2030. 100 billion euros. So we need to spend to decarbonize and to lower our emission. We need to spend on energy efficiency, on renewables, on immobility, or on agriculture, etc., etc. It's like a huge amount of money. Bearing in mind the sea bomb, bearing in mind the Nord Stream, I will mention it. We already, because I, as I said, like we are like, like failing in a bit to deliver the proper uh, markets and decarbonization, we already have debt to our renewable investors. For the pe previous year, it's like 1 billion euro. Like, it's a debt, and we need either to raise the price for the, for the household or for the industry, which is also politically very not really great. Till, till, till 2030, we need to pay approximately 30 to 40 billion euros for the renewable production, for the feeding tariff. We are not speaking about the auction which we are launching. Also, we need to install filters on our coal production, which we need to have yet, and it's about like 4 billion euros. And if speaking about the Nord Stream, the calculation of the Razumkov Center, they said that like up to like we will lose up to two billion dollars per year when the Nord Stream will be implemented of losing the, the transit, and we need to spend up to 10 billion uh, dollars for the for the dismantling and for the reassembling the pipeline. So like it's a huge amount of money we need to pay, we need to spend, we need to we need to put 
uh, on paper and uh, for us it's a it, it's a proper uh, answer a proper question whether like the Nord Stream is not only the threat for our security it's not only threat for our economic development it's not only threat for our transit but it's also a threat for our Green Deal for the Green Deal Ukraine and although our business is declaring the carbon neutrality and paying like huge attention to the climate obligation and we are like really like taking it seriously I think that like a lot of people will start speaking about the reciprocal approach while we are implementing the third energy package and we hear the a lot of uh, you know a, a lot of efforts to you know to waive Nord Stream 2 uh, from the third energy package like while we are doing the Green Deal, we are like very climate ambitious to all our, you know, possibilities. And Russia is not climate ambitious at all. They don't have carbon pricing. They are not planning the emission trading system. So they neglect all the climate ambitions. And I'm the for five years COP negotiator. I know how Russia behave in, 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 in COP. And like they are, like they are receive their Nord Stream pipe, which it will be locked in. Uh, in infrastructure and my last remark like like during Obama's administration for him like the ratification of the Paris climate agreement was like his legacy and I'm very proud that myself including Hannah Hopko who is a co-organizer of this event and like a, a lot of other MPs our parliament becomes served in the world to ratify Pari Paris climate agreement and we work closely with uh, with the team of, of, of Kerry and it was Obama legacy and I de definitely does not want that the Biden legacy will be the building of Nord Stream 2 I met with Biden be, being myself uh, members of parliament and I found him uh, like a very honest and like one of the best politicians I ever met so definitely I don't want Nord Stream 2 become the Obama legacy thank you thank you very much I would uh, like Biden to legacy sorry. Biden. Uh, um, I, I would like uh, to uh, ask the speakers to be as concise as possible we actually have uh, even less than one minute per speaker and uh, my question to all of you would be what is the future of Nord Stream and the European Green Deal and will the EU and the US show Ukraine good practice of fighting strategic corruption and resisting Russia's pressure with respect to Nord Stream 2. And uh, the first one to reflect on that would be Minister Zarishvolsky. Well, I have uh, bad news. I think that Nord Stream will happen. The climate uh, concerns will not be taken into account. The geopolitical bad intentions will prevail. It will produce long-term dependence on Russia erosion of uh, fundamental values of the West, uh, polity and politics, uh, appeasement uh, of Russia because it, Nord Stream is trying to, it, it is an attempt to, to work with the dictator and aggressor, it will produce a result as it did in 1930s end of uh, with appeasing Hitler. As Churchill said, you, you wanted to avoid war and you chose dishonor. Uh, now uh, we wanted, uh, or some wanted, to avoid confrontation and chose disgrace. Uh, confrontation with Russia will come because money from Nord Stream will give them much more uh, powerful army and the price will be high in geopolitical, military and security uh, terms. Uh, it will undermine all the green goals, so forget it. It will strengthen and embolden Russia's aggressive policy and blackmailing, which already happens uh, uh, two days ago, Putin blackmailed Ukraine with Nord Stream not yet finished. It will paralyze EU-Russia policy and it will degrade the uh, EU as a political uh, entity. Thank you. Thank you. Even more concise if possible. Uh, Mr. Manuel Saradzin, please, your reflection. Yeah, so um, if Nord Stream 2 happens and the probability is not 100%, but it is not so low, I think for Ukraine it's clear that its path to carbon neutrality and the own way out of gas uh, for Ukraine and into renewables is important. As well for internal issues to be not so depending on Russian gas pressure like in 2007, for example, but also like last week done by Putin, uh, but also finding new ways of being integrated into the European Union energy market uh, with other um, options than gas transit. So investing in renewables uh, in hydrogen, but also in other renewables and trying to integrate as far as possible um, with energy interest of us to make our businesses being more exploited to Ukraine. So if the next Russian try to tackle other energy 
um, projects in Ukraine uh, would be also uh, uh, non-beneficial for German companies. Second is, I'm not 100% sure what will happen with Nord Stream. If we come to government, we'll, we'll have, of course, a difficult situation because the allowances are all given. So it would be only at a high cost um, if we take them back by a substitutive money, which would have to be given by the German government. But sometimes you, you never know why Putin is saying what he's saying. And I was quite surprised that they already were saying so clearly, he was saying so clearly this, um, this open words of pressure towards Ukraine, although the pipe is not really finished. And sometimes perhaps you have to be really clear on uh, something if you don't want anybody to believe that perhaps you have more problems with the pipeline to finish it um, than everybody thinks. Yeah, um, The timetable for finishing the pipeline is far behind already. And uh, I'm, I cannot pro do any forecast when it will be operational or not and to what extent, but it can be only if Putin showed his real face uh, quite early. The other possibility is that he tried to make the strong statement to neglect um, possible problems coming up uh, with the building of the pipe. I don't know that, but uh, I think that there's two options on the table. Thank you very much. Mikhailo, uh, one minute, even 45 yes, seconds. Yes. Uh, please, uh, my last slide uh, from my presentation with very concrete three points. As I see, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 uh, versus Green Deal means that Russian gazocracy... Uh, last slide, please. Uh, Russian gazocracy plus European democracy means permission for additional... Uh, emission, uh, CH4 and uh, CO2. Uh, next slide, please. Next. So, an American-European joint green initiative to ban the development of fossil resources, coal, oil and gas, uh, in the Arctic regions is needed. Next. American-European uh, so-called operation to force Russia to abandon the development of Arctic hydrocarbon deposits is needed. And Nord Stream 2 project should be stopped as a matter of priority. Uh, in the case when uh, this pipeline will complete it, we will receive new windows of opportunity to eliminate this project. Thank you. Thank you. Ola. 30 seconds, um, even. <laughs> the 30 seconds. Um, uh, I would like to mention what Franz Timmermans uh, from EU um, uh, told recently about uh, Green Deal and about the gas project. He said that if you will continue uh, building infrastructure for carrying fossil gas, uh, um, our children will be fighting wars over water and over food. I think it's a very, uh, very strong uh, statement. So uh, now with the, with the continuation of the Nord Stream 2, the EU and US can show us the, the example uh, how they can fight with, uh, with Russian uh, um, aggressive pol politics, because if they allow uh, Russia to continue with this project, this project first will uh, uh, generate more corruption and they will not fight their own corruption within the EU and also with more money um, uh, from from the gas uh, they will receive from Europe, Russia will continue also aggressive uh, uh, behavior and hostile action and war in the in the east of Ukraine. So for Ukraine, uh, we really need to put pressure on our partners, EU and, and US to help us to, uh, to resist this uh, project from uh, being uh, carried out. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, 20 sec hey, seconds. 20 okay. seconds. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is not just a commercial deal. It needs to be stopped. It is not too late for it to be stopped. The uh, mitigation mechanisms that have been described today and, and, and elsewhere of investing in Ukrainian green energy infrastructure, that's all great. It does not in any way uh, address the national security's concerns with the project, and therefore the project still needs to be stopped, nor do uh, the extended gas transit contract ideas and um, and the uh, the shutoff mechanism that had been floated in the press have any credibility because if Nord Stream, if uh, Ukraine was cut off of gas, there is uh, very little chance that Europe would cut off Nord Stream 2 in retaliation because it would create a 
continent-wide gas prices. Thank so yeah. that, that's, that's it. Everyone needs to be involved in this. This can't be about us without us. That includes Ukraine, Poland, and, and NATO's eastern flank. Um, and uh, Washington and Brussels should use the leverage of Nord Stream 2 to call on real, verifiable changes in behavior from the Russian Federation. Thank you very much. And uh, Alexei. Yeah, I see a, a huge amount of hungry eyes looking at me because I'm the last one, so I will be super quick. So, like, uh, definitely, uh, like, uh, there will be a lot of discussion over the future of the Nord Stream 2, and I truly believe that our president, our uh, government, our members of parliament will do their best, you know, to, to confront Nord Stream and to, to, uh, to do a huge amount of efforts, as well as our professional team in Naftagas, which I truly believe they all, like, doing the, the job they have. But, like, Let's speak about also Ukraine, like what needs to do. We need to invest huge in, in the gas extraction to extract a lot of gas that we have, to spend a huge amount of investment on the energy efficiency, to develop the biogas, to develop the hydrogen agenda, to develop a huge amount of the green transformation of our country, uh, like without thinking about like Nord Stream and, and some other stuff. Like it's for us, it's for Ukrainian and for Ukrainian economy, and like definitely the, the Green Deal is our big future, but like with the Nord Stream 2 in place, it will become much more difficult to to, to build this green and uh, green Ukrainian future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all speakers. And to wrap up, I would just say that probably there is no more time for illusion. It's time to act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Forum, Democratia of the first international forum, Democracy in Action, Zero Corruption Conference is now finishing. And you know, I'm among those people who leaves cinema after end credits because they understand what kind of powerful work is behind the preparation of such high-profile discussions. It was possible thanks to the united effort of Ukrainian civil society, Center for Fighting Corruption, Network of Nation, uh, National Interest Protection, New Europe Center, among partners, uh, uh, engage USAID uh, program New Justice, National Front to Support Democracy, consult uh, EUAM on reforming the civil security sector, Prague Center of Civil Society, Western News and the Price Fund, Anti-Corruption Initiative of the EU in Ukraine. It is thanks to them that this conference is oligarch-free, and also our media partners, European Pravda, Kyiv Post, Espresso, Novavrima, uh, uh, public broadcast of Ukraine Radio 20, Channel 24 deal. Within these two days, we worked in the regime of a marathon. This is about 24 hours of air time. We uh, had over 80 speakers from this studio, from abroad. I thank to the huge team that actually made this stream possible and helped us to see each other. I thank our fantastic interpreters who helped us to hear and understand each other and also find the common language. On the website of the conference, there is going to be all panel discussions available. If you can come back to them, you can write out the statements for those who can re-watch something that you haven't managed to see during the conference because the marathon is over. But the search for efficient solutions, how to fight hybrid threats for democracy is not over yet. And that is why I wish all those who fight corruption in different countries of the world to be strong because this is the way that you have chosen. It is not easy, but it already yields its fruit. And our common effort is going to help us win. As they say in Ukraine, since childhood we shall learn it, fight and you will win. And I say goodbye, and the stories of actors that you are going to see after the end of the conference only prove that there are many people who support each other and are convinced that democracy in action is going to make this world much better. See you next time. Obviously, the difficulty we all have fighting corruption is that corrupt people can move their money and themselves and their children and whatever between countries, but we tend to be stuck in any one country. So what do we need to do? We need to work together as, as, as easily 
as the corrupt can work together. We need to, to work as seamlessly as a, as a corrupt official in Ukraine can work with his lawyer in London and his banker in, in the Caribbean. So, um, you know, we need to, to, to make friends. And I'm just sorry I'm not there at the conference in person because it would be a good, good place and a good time to do it. It would be very much more easier to share ideas if we had a platform or initiative that is devoted to technical aspects of rallies and protests. A single resource uh, that monitors all latest tricks and perks of contemporary activism. It's important to have a system of exchanging information about persons suspected of corruption, to impose sanctions that would make it impossible for them to operate in different countries. Agents of change from various countries uh, should first of all unite their efforts to jointly tackle corruption. One of the reasons why organized crime is strong is because it is well organized and uh, it operates across borders. Uh, now organized crime is uh, one of the major drivers of various types of corruption uh, in most countries of the world. Uh, so why don't we corruption fighters organize too? We should not limit our work only to one specific country. We should become uh, stronger, more efficient by cooperating with each other. We should know about each other's fights and struggles. We should know about each other's uh, achievements and celebrate those achievements. And more importantly, we should take time to collaboratively, to collectively commit to fighting corruption transnationally, because this is a transnational phenomenon. Мне кажется, общей такой вакцины единой против этого нет. Но можно вовлечь как можно больше людей в этот процесс, заинтересовать какими-то простыми шагами. И мы это делаем в нашем проекте про Тенге, где рассказываем максимально доступно через социальные сети, как можно повлиять на решение каких-то маленьких проблем. И через решение этих маленьких проблем мы надеемся, что можно будет перейти к решению каких-то более глобальных проблем. The best vaccine against corruption is uh, the investment into education. It is a long-term investment, but it is the most efficient one. People who know many languages, who are professionals in their areas of expertise, have more chances to find a stable source of income, as simple as that. The desire to live in honest, just and prosperous country is the most effective vaccine that will defeat any virus of corruption if majority of nationality are vaccinated with it. The standard idea is that the best vaccine against corruption is inevitability of punishment, which means effective and independent law enforcement and judicial agencies. Being from Ukraine, I unfortunately lack empirical knowledge to support this claim. However, what I do know is that the fight against corruption starts with the determined group of people. Once you have that, the rest is only a matter of time. There are many vaccines against the coronavirus and there are many vaccines against corruption. We need to use them all. We need to have transparency. We need to know who owns what. We need our police agencies to prosecute not just corrupt people, but also you know, the many, many enablers who help them be corrupt, the lawyers and the accountants in places like London or the US. Um, this takes understanding. So the most important thing is to understand what's happening, to really know what corruption is, how it works, and how it works between countries to rot democracy everywhere. So my most important vaccine is just know what corruption is and spread the message so other people know too manifestation of corruption is a dictatorship. We have to eradicate dictatorships. We have to eradicate authoritarianism. When you do that, then you have governments where there is some integrity. There is integrity in the leadership. There is systems of education that seek to educate youth and people uh, with some basic understandings of integrity and accountability. That's critical to fighting corruption. When every citizen does not only aware of his right to control any action of the authorities, but consider it as a duty. That's what the journalists do every day, as we know that corrupt politicians fear publicity the most. What I see as a possible solution, or as you call it, vaccination, uh, it is the cooperation between investigative journalists and civil society. We as a journalist, we can only expose corruption, describe it and name it. You, as a civil society, as a strong civil society, you must be able to stand up to corruption and to defend not only us, but also the basic human rights and actually the civil society itself.
My friend, a devout civil activist, Katya Hanzuk, was murdered in 2018 for fighting corruption in her home city, Kherson. From that time on, I struggled to bring justice in the case of her horrible murder. I view corruption as an erosion of state functions, particularly law enforcement and judicial institutions. Also, the system of corruption is a perfect ecosystem for the feudal criminal clans that leech of regions in Ukraine. Both previous and current national leadership seem to ignore the problem. People who raise the question find themselves vulnerable and unprotected. Ukrainian civil society in its fight against corruption has no one to turn except themselves for protection against harassment in media, threats and physical attacks. Hello, my name is Katerina and I'm an activist of Ukrainian organization After Maidan. Behind me is Metagira, the residence of ex-president Yutriana Kovic. The area of this complex is 140 hectares. There are lakes, marina, golf course and even a zoo. A high of the walls behind which Yanukovych hid it when he was a president is 5 meters. But today people can walk here without any problems and see how this corruption looks like. When you have powerful authoritarian men typically running in a context of rule of laws, you are going to have rampant corruption. This is what embodies corruption for me. Coal combustion plants owned by oligarchs destroy our environment, damage our nation's health and pump the money out of our national budget. Kazakhstan is a beautiful country with rich natural and human resources. But unfortunately, because of corruption, we don't get the results in the economy at the level of our lives that we would like to see. Hello, my name is Pavla Holtsova and I'm founder of Czech Center for Investigative Journalism or Investigacja.cz. I'm also regional editor for OCCRP, ORC, which stands for Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And I'm going to talk about corruption. For us journalists, corruption is probably one of the most difficult issues to, to write about and to prove. We can see it, we can describe it, we can red flag it, but hardly ever we are able to prove it. Hardly ever we have the smoking gun evidence that actually is showing the corruption at this whole scheme or whole uh, context. This is mostly due to the fact that both sides that are givers and receivers of the bribe, they just don't want to talk about it because they both sides profit from it. I'm from Kyrgyzstan, a small landlocked country in Central Asia. Most people in my country are extremely poor. And by saying extremely poor, I mean people living not just in poverty, but well below the poverty line. There are people in my country who exploit the extreme poverty of the population to corrupt Kyrgyzstan even more. For example, uh, most of the elections that took place in Kyrgyzstan during last years were marred by massive vote buying. This would not happen to such an extent if people were not so poor. At the same time, uh, people would not be that poor if there was a systemic fight against corruption in, in the society. This creates this vicious cycle and breaking it is so hard and this is what embodies corruption for me. There is a sad meme in Belarus about the blue fingers. It comes from the words of Alexander Lukashenko. I will not hold on to power with the blue fingers, he said, but he's holding on. The blue fingers of a man who has been staying in power for 27 years by violence and blood. This embodies corruption for me. Hello, I'm Oliver Bullo. I'm a journalist and author from the UK. This is my latest book, Moneyland. Um, and what is corruption for me? Corruption is when the powerful, whoever they are, in government, in business, whoever, use their wealth and their power to abuse the rest of us, to deprive us of the privileges and the rights that they enjoy. We co-founded Safe Dnipro and Safe EcoBot project to make the air we breathe cleaner. And one of our goals is to link big political corruption to environmental problems. Raise awareness of Ukrainians so that they clearly understood that corruption kills us. Literally. 
My goal is to ensure a future where civil society in Ukraine is an effective and safe stronghold that fights corruption and expedites reforms. I want to ensure that no more lives are lost among people who simply want to live in a better Ukraine. On researching how corruption in any part of the globe affects almost every one of us living on Earth. For example, when we investigated the cross-border uh, smuggling mafia in Central Asia, we were amazed to find out that not only had they earned hundreds of millions of US dollars, but they had spent a significant chunk of their illegal income in countries like the US, the UK, Germany and the United Arab Emirates. Maybe this is why renting an apartment is so insanely expensive in London nowadays. My personal goal in fighting corruption is to try and stop just one person from abusing their position uh, and using it to, to harm the rest of us. If I can just stop one person from doing that, I think that that would count as a win. Obviously, it would be great if we could end corruption altogether. But, you know, let's start small. And then, you know, if we stop one person, two people, maybe, you know, we'll turn around and realise that we've ended corruption altogether. But first of all, let's just stop one person. We strive to build a society in Equatorial Guinea, my home country, where people can live to the fullest of their capacity, of their potential, where people can live with human dignity. In 2017, we exposed the illegal voters' management system at the presidential elections. There is a high probability that it was used to coordinate the vote buying. Because we knew that such a phenomenon exists, three years later we and the civil society paid even more attention to vote buying at the parliament elections. As a result, uh, so many cases were reported or filmed all around the country that it caused huge protests and those elections were annulled by the Central Elections Commission. We've made a significant progress in the case of Katya Hanzou, a group that carried out the assault is already behind the bars. Another the person who ordered the attack and uh, the other who served as a middleman are in custody and on trial. Both were very influential in Kherson and uh, the one that ordered the attack was a dear regional politician. Probably he was the most influential in Kherson region. This is the first time in Ukraine that a person of such power is facing sentence for political murder. And this is not only an example of our fight but also an example of our ability to win. This is the Tak Pridniprovska test belonging to a major Ukrainian oligarch, Renat Akhmetov. Recently, under the pressure of civil society, they built a new filter on one of its energy blocks, investing an unprecedented amount of a quarter billion Ukrainian hryvnias. I'd like to think I've exposed corruption, um, some pretty egregious scams in, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, have I stopped them? I'd be lying if I said I had. Uh, to be honest, it turns out that you can expose scams um, and no one does anything about them. But I think I've helped ordinary people to understand a bit more about you know, what's really happening, what the world is really like. And um, that's something I'm proud of. Uh, the next step, obviously, would be for governments to do something about it. But, you know, that's not happening yet, just yet. There is a growing um, awareness there is a, an increasing willingness and commitment by the youth, but also by generally members of our society to become more engaged, to become part of the fight, to hold accountable those that through their corrupt crimes have deprived an entire society for four decades now of fundamental development, basic rights, and freedom, basic freedoms. There is one example when we were able to actually expose corruption and describe what was happening. It's in Slovakia and the project we called Kochner's Library. Kochner, Marian Kochner, is a businessman of Slovak origin and the lead suspect in murder case of assassination of our colleague Jan Kuciak and his fiancée Martina Kuchnirova. Uh, during the murder investigation, the police collected almost 70 terabytes of data and we as a journalist, we got hold of this data and it included a cell phone of the lead suspect, Marian Kochner. Uh, 
the cell phone contained encrypted communication between him and Slovak judges. This was the case when we were actually able to expose the corruption within the judiciary system in Slovakia and probably the most detailed case I ever worked on that was dealing with corruption. Obviously, the difficulty we all have fighting corruption is that corrupt people can move their money and themselves and their children and whatever between countries, but we tend to be stuck in any one country. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to work together as, as, as easily as the corrupt can work together. We need to, to work as seamlessly as a, as a corrupt official in Ukraine can work with his lawyer in London and his banker in, in the Caribbean. So, um, you know, we need to, to, to make friends. And I'm just sorry I'm not there at the conference in person because it would be a good, good place and a good time to do it. It would be very much more easier to share ideas if we had a platform or initiative that is devoted to technical aspects of rallies and protests. A single resource uh, that monitors all latest tricks and perks of contemporary activism. It's important to have a system of exchanging information about persons suspected of corruption. To impose sanctions that would make it impossible for them to operate in different countries. Agents of change from various countries uh, should first of all unite their efforts to jointly tackle corruption. One of the reasons why organized crime is strong is because it is well organized and uh, it operates across borders. Uh, now, organized crime is uh, one of the major drivers of various types of corruption uh, in most countries of the world. Uh, so why don't we, corruption fighters, organize too? We should not limit our work only to one specific country. We should become uh, stronger, and more efficient by cooperating with each other. We should know about each other's fights and struggles. We should know about each other's uh, achievements and celebrate those achievements. And more importantly, we should take time to collaboratively, to collectively commit to fighting corruption transnationally, because this is a transnational phenomenon. Мне кажется, общей такой вакцины единой против этого нет. Но можно вовлечь как можно больше людей в этот процесс, заинтересовать какими-то простыми шагами. И мы это делаем в нашем проекте про тенге, где рассказываем максимально доступно через социальные сети, как можно повлиять на решение каких-то маленьких проблем. И через решение этих маленьких проблем мы надеемся, что можно будет перейти к решению каких-то более глобальных проблем. The best vaccine against corruption is uh, the investment into education. It is a long-term investment, but it is the most efficient one. People who know many languages, who are professionals in their areas of expertise, have more chances to find a stable source of income. As simple as that. The desire to live in honest, just and prosperous country is the most effective vaccine that will defeat any virus of corruption if majority of nationality are vaccinated with it. The standard idea is that the best vaccine against corruption is inevitability of punishment, which means effective and independent law enforcement and judicial agencies. 